morning, and thanks for joining us here live at Direwolf Digital. I'm Andrew Beckstrom, Patrick Sullivan here, ready to bring you another exciting Eternal Tournament. This weekend, we've got the Hour of Glass 5K thrown open, and what that means is there's $5,000 in the line. It's an open event. Anybody could join up and play, and the format this weekend is thrown. Well, often when we talk about open events, we're talking about formats that are pretty well established. Sometimes there's a new set that can be disruptive. But by and large, it's a bunch of n sort of known commodities duking it out. Occasionally, we see some surprises. But by and large, the top five or six decks are things that we're expecting. This is about as clean of a slate as I can recall for Throne pretty much ever. In the aftermath of the live balance changes that went live about 10 days ago, um, I really don't know what to expect. I have some guesses. <laughs> I know that a lot of community members have been pretty passionate in their speculation about what's going to be good and, and what's going to be different now. Uh, but with a live balance patch that disruptive, uh, taking on some of the more defining parts of the previous format, uh, this should be a really exciting tournament to watch. A lot of new stuff. And um, whatever comes out on top here, that's really going to define what the metagame will look like, at least in the short term. Yep, absolutely. And so the big deck uh, looks like coming out of the qualifying rounds. So on Friday and Saturday, we had tw uh, 28 games for the players who signed up to play. They could play them at their leisure on Friday and Saturday. That's how all of our open events work. The players with the 64 best records, they're back this morning with us to run out a 64-person single elimination bracket. And over the course of a couple hours, we're going to get a champion. The biggest deck among those 64 players is Stone Scar. Now, the thing that we're going to be watching out for with Stone Scar is that, yes, there's a good amount of it in the field, but there's some variety. We have some people whose curves are taking them all the way up to Zhou, and they're playing much more of a mid-range game, and they're using sort of the, the powerful shadow and fire removal effects in order to trade with their opponent a bunch and then pl throw down a giant dragon, get value from Tazbu, all of those sorts of things. But we also have some decks in the field which are much more in the sort of aggressive space. And so that'll be an interesting battle to see even within the Stone Scar decks that we're going to see because we can expect to see some amount of mirrors. But then beyond that, of course, we got Feln, Yetis, Combray Relics, uh, Harukira. There's going to be a lot to check out and see exactly how our deck's best positioned. And now for all of the players at home, it's like, okay, maybe, you know, we got a lot, as you mentioned, we got a lot of predictions in our stream that we did the other day and in the Discord about what was going to be the best. Coming out of this weekend, we might have a real idea about what sort of was the best this weekend, and now everyone at home will be able to go home and figure out, okay, what do I do to beat these people? How do I make my deck better against what might have emerged this weekend? And before Skycrack kind of had that uh, position, I think Stone Star was sort of the game's original. Well, when you say Stone Scar, what does that really mean? It has a history uh, of, uh, you know, assembly line plus Bandit Queen strategies. Um, control decks like Joe, as you mentioned before, uh, decks that are just kind of mid-rangey, high-quality threats and removal. Even uh, some sort of combo recursion uh, engines with cards like Smuggler Stash, the old uh, Haunted Highway deck. So Stone Scar has a really deep pool of cards um, that are awfully flexible too. Something like Vicious Highwayman plays really well top end of your aggressive deck, just a value card in your um, sort of mid-rangey to more controlling style deck. If you're trying to do some sort of combo recursive thing, fits in great there too. So when we say Stone Scar, that can mean a lot of different things. And I'm sure we're going to see a variety of blends of, of those sort of strategies over the course of this tournament. Yep. And so the way that this is going to work is that we're going to be, you know, we're doing a little bit of talking here, getting everybody up to speed. The way each of these rounds are going to work is we're going to start off with a featured match for round number one. We're going to be watching our number one seated player, Daverick, up against Lord Perth. That's a battle of Huru versus Feln. And then once their match has been concluded, it's going to be a best of three match. We will jump into any match that is going on at the same time that maybe have not finished up for the round. We'll keep on doing that, and so we're just going to be going from game to game to game. Once all 64 players in the round have finished their match, we'll come back here, take just a minute or two to wrap up, and then we'll be moving on to the next round. And we're going to keep on doing that all the way down into a winner today. Who's going to win that big share of the $5,000 prize pool? And I don't think we've actually mentioned it yet today, but in addition, they're going to be going to the World Championships. And... So a lot on the line, and for these players, you know, they came into this weekend with a great record, but it's all on the line in terms of any match that they're playing means if they lose it, they're done. It's over. And I'm really interested to see sort of what the nature of the reactive decks are going to look like, as you mentioned Felon and some of these Stone Scar decks. Uh, I expect the, the transpose nerf to be the most impactful one. There's sort of the first order thing, which is, 
the card was really powerful and ubiquitous and now it's no longer there. But there's the second order consequence of, well, that sort of represented a lot of player ages sort of ambiently floating around in games. With that no longer part of the picture, are disruptive cards that are really weak against player ages, do they have a place? And for a deck like Feln, which is historically a deck that's been about some level of removal and disruption, um, they're very sensitive to what reactive cards are going to be playing, and a whole laundry list of things, I would say particularly uh, discard spells in, in, in Shadow, but some other things as well, are really hampered when uh, that level of player ages is just sort of floating around in the games. And so how do you build a control deck now with some options available to you that two or three weeks ago would have just been non-starters? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Certainly, you know, it's a, it's definitely a mix of old and new in terms of we're going to see some decks this weekend that maybe in the face of some things that got pulled back, like Sling of the Chi is a great example. I it's not a, it's not a shock to me at least that I guess that maybe a deck like Stone Scar with a bunch of solid units maybe wasn't the most interested in getting slinged game after game after game. Now there is a few sling decks in the field, so we'll see. Maybe they'll be able to take advantage this weekend, but um, there's going to be a lot to shake out, of course, over the next couple of hours. But right now, the players are getting settled, and as soon as our feature match is ready, we'll be heading down to join the action. Um, one thing to note, though, of course, is that we are on uh, a, just a short, a brief delay, and that's to ensure that the players who are playing on the feature match, that their opponent doesn't try to get an advantage by maybe peeking at the stream. Yeah, so we're not live live, but we're on a little bit of a delay, and it's just to maintain the integrity of the tournament. So if you say something about us in Twitch chat, it will get back to us, and we will know, and we will know who you are. We will know who you are. <laughs> All right, so Patrick, uh, th for this weekend, um, I think uh, if I had to choose a deck, I would have been interested in looking at the Combray Relics deck, just because that deck is with Equalize can just do so many brutal things where it's wiping out your board and discarding your hand. Did you have a deck to that you were excited to see that you, that maybe you would have brought if you had a tournament this weekend? I, it would have been really hard for me to turn down Stone Scar. I mean, that's just uh, that, that 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 play pattern, that level of flexibility, the you know, you have game going short, you have game going long is very appealing to me. Um, I, I don't have a, I, I guess from like a metagame perspective of like guessing where people are going to be yeah. out and trying to out level them. I, I don't really approach the problem that way. Um, and I think there's a lot to be said for familiarity and just like playing well. Like we often see not the best deck win tournaments, but it's really rare that we see someone not playing well win the event. So what are you doing to optimize your chances? And if, if it's something you're just familiar with that's at least decent, there you go. All right, so we're off and running here. So Daverick on the bottom of our screen playing a hero, uh, Huru Kira deck. <laughs> I called it a hero deck there, I guess, for a moment. But they got Styre's Eyes. They got that lovely alternate art, Hojan. And then at the top of your screen, we've got Lord Perth. They're on a Feln take this weekend. It looks like they're going to be going for some value here as they've got a bunch of petitions. It'll be interesting to see which power cards have made them so interested in incorporating uh, Petition into just a two-faction deck. It's a brave new world. Yeah. Because <laughs> this isn't a Silex faction. It's it's much more common when we're talking about a faction pairing that has a Silex that you see Petition show up. But obviously, Cobalt Waystone is one of the first ones that comes to mind in terms of a power card which offers you some additional utility that you might want a card like Petition to help search up. And after going on and on about the absence of player ages in the new metagame, Round, round one, game one. Both players have it, really, because <laughs> those bubble shields, if you do have um, extra primal influence to unlock that second ability, you do gain an Aegis. And we see a Levitate being played on that Hojan, procking its Renown, getting that Justice Sigil. But yeah, things seem to be moving pretty smoothly for Daverick, um, just in terms of they've got a couple of threats and they got a couple of bubble shields. Now the fun will begin. We see a Defile on the Hojin. Daverick chooses not to protect the Hojin with the Bubble Shield. What do you make of that? Uh, that the Hojin is probably pretty modest going forward. And if uh, your opponent there had an opportunity to play it in response to the Levitate and didn't, they are trying to probably set up some bigger reactive play. It just signals too much strength, I think, from Lord Perth to try to pick that fight. So I think we see one of the reasons why Lord, Lord Perth elected for these petitions at any cost three and four shadow pips for a spell that is deal three damage and it has decay and lifesteal the big thing going long is that if you have 12 shadow pips it deals uh it deals 12 damage instead and since petition can get that uh shadow symbol giving you two shadow influence 
Uh, that helps you really get there as we see at any cost get fired off on the Kira, and now we're seeing the battles over some bubble shields. It's drawing Daverick some extra cards, but I'm not seeing any good ones coming off the top. But uh, I, Daverick there, I mean, you know, a little bit too much power here, but uh, very good sense of the moment there. Uh, to go back to the previous turn of not trying to cover the Hojin, I think Lord Perth sort of set up there represented too much strength. Daverick kind of sniffed out that there was a bigger fight coming and uh, got rewarded for that discipline. Really great play. And look at that. I mean, just like Lord Perth uh, sort of had to pack it up there. Both players really had just sort of flooded out. And I'm, I'm guessing, at least on Daverick's side, that might have been a little bit of a surprise there that the game just sort of ended with Lord Perth having five cards in hand. But, you know, that's one of the things when you're when maybe one of your spells is all it's doing is searching up a power. You might, you know, we oftentimes talk about how many power cards are in your deck. Now, a card like Petition in the deck builder won't be listed as a power card. It does mean, though, that your power base is just a little bit bigger than others, or maybe a little bit more susceptible to drawing too many. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, from Lord Purse's position there, one big play probably stabilizes it, but, you know, drew a little bit too much power, and that's part of it. And, uh, again, Davrick really rewarded for that, uh, not picking a fight over the Hojin there, uh, sort of being able to detect there that uh, Lord Purse was showing too much strength for that kind of fight, and... Uh, was able to protect a much more important threat instead. All right, here we are for game number two. We're going to have Lord Perth at the top of the screen kicking things off for us. They got a little bit of fate action going on as they've got a Jotun Hurler. No doubt Daverick will be aware that that's probably the card for the players this weekend. They do get a copy of all deck lists of players in the top 64, and that's just one more thing that we do to ensure that there's no disadvantage to showing up and playing on stream where now you get to know what's in maybe in someone's deck list where otherwise you wouldn't without those known deck lists. Very aggressive there of Lord Perth to, to bottom that <laughs> uh, that power there. I mean, I, I, I guess the... Uh, the logic here being that the hand's already a little unwieldy and getting uh, undepleted power is a big priority, but with Wisdom of the Elders in hand, that would, that's really hard for me to turn down there. Yeah, I think they were just counting on this exploit working and getting that plunder, and you know, you turn that Yon Hurler into a Primal Sigil, you fire off the Wisdom of Elders, and now we're in a much more maybe reasonable place. We see Daverick just completely loaded up with Rhyme Conclave Smugglers now, uh, picking up a Hojin, uh, unfortunately, on the following turn. They'll go into the market. They're not going to have Aegis, and it's a 3-1 now, that Rhyme Conclave Smuggler, so going to be vulnerable. This is a, a recent balance change. It used to be a 3-2, but now we're going to see it get picked off by a Snowball. Yeah, and I, I do like going into the market here for a Palace. I think Daverick has to kind of resign themselves at this point that these units are not really going to be effective and uh, that they need to make the game about something else. Palace is the best bet of doing that. For the exploit, it's going to take away that Koryavat Palace. Lord Perth, everything's going along quite smoothly. All right, interesting. They knew about the Hojin, and so they elected rather than to uh, snowball down the Rhyme Conclave Smuggler, they permafrosted uh, this one instead. And that's a really big show of strength there, uh, additionally from, from Lord Perth. And I mean, Daverick doesn't really have a choice but to play the Hojin here, but they got a sense that um, a snowball is coming here based on the earlier... Uh, fate animation. All right, for Lord Perth, there's going to be a snowball on the Hojin, taking it down, unless, oh, we're going to get Bubble Shield instead. And so for Daverick, this is a this is a pretty nice exchange. You get that Justice Sigil, you stop the Hojin from dying. Now, thanks to the, uh, the Hojin attack, maybe the Rhyme Conclave Smuggler is good, but we're going to see Valkyrie Enforcer. Always love this play against Permafrost. Silence the Smuggler removing that text of keep the unit stunned and now it just gets to attack yep i mean this is a uh I, you know the, with lord perth at 20 this is a tough way to do it but i think this is uh the best that daverick can make with this situation i love that decision by daverick they decided not to wait on the smuggler for the following turn instead it's like what happens if something like a hailstorm all of my units get swept away let's get the ages now while i have the onslaught proc and let's get some pressure going here I don't really want to play a long game. I've already lost access to my Koryavat Palace. Let's see if I could just go wide and hopefully maybe you don't have a sweeper. Yeah, the odds that, you know, next turn you're able, you draw something bad, you go into the market for something useful, and then that's better than just having the extra uh, three strength Aegis attacker seems so low. Again, not an intuitive play, but I think it's what the situation calls for. All right, Forbidden Research, draw three, discard two, and then you're going to pick up either some Shadow or Justice Influence. 
I am pretty sure Lord Perth is going to be going Shadow Influence every time, trying to power up those at any cost. Lord Perth's deck definitely has a lot of condiments. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little short on the meat and the potatoes, but a lot of Ooh, condiments. All right, they picked up Vara's Authority. That gets around Aegis quite nicely, but for now, they're going to take a big old hit this turn. Looking like 12 coming across, and we're going to see even a Silverblade Intrusion to first proc the Kira and draw a card. See if they can get a little extra action coming. Oh, they even get the Valkyrie Denouncer, sure, because they've got enough Justice Influence. Dropping them down to three. And look at this play. By getting the Valkyrie Enforcer now, I think that might be the difference. Oh, I, It looks close. I, I actually, I think Lord Perth can survive. We bar his authority, the three units on the left. We dazzle one thing and defile another thing, and then that would get us through into our next turn alive as, as it stands. Opportunity to draw and discard some more petitions or whatever. The <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> It's not like we're it's not like we're out of the woods. We're just through phase one, and then from there, it's uh, work left to do. Well, you always should start your turn with "Can you win the game this turn?" That's a great place to start, right? Mm -hmm. Lord Perth can. So then maybe it's the way you start the turn is "Can I at least survive till next turn?" And I think they have a route, and we're gonna see them go through it here. I think they're just trying to figure out does it make more sense to do this now or on later. I think because of the Hojins and power, you have to do the authority now. Right. It's you would just not kill the Hojin otherwise. Oh, all right. Oh, well, the thing is, you also shrink the Denouncer here. This is actually, this is an interesting play. And so it, it gets the Denouncer down to a 1-1. One, one. So a risky play. They're still going to go for the stun, though. No, because I guess you still have the out of. Yeah. Of, of dazzling and surviving the turn. And you're maybe you're happy enough if power is drawn that turn that it's worth the that extra flexibility. <laughs> they went back and got another Rhyme Conclave Smuggler that they had stashed in the market earlier in the game. And that goes and gets a Bring to Justice. <laughs> three card draw. All right, Lord Perth, you got a really good one? Because you're at three. Both these units are lethal. Uh, they're going to – I think it's just mm. short here. Because they could – They yeah, I mean, the Permafrost, there was an Aegis Endurance. That doesn't do it. So – Daverick took that one down, and I got to be honest, a lot of things were going really well for Lord Perth in that yeah. game, um, but it just turns out that at a certain point, the, the Hurukira deck's ability just like, all right, here's one more unit that you kind of have to deal with. And they weren't, they never really did anything humongous in that game. It was always just like, I'm always going to have like a three strength unit to attack you with. Can you stop it? And the answer eventually was like, well, no, I, eventually I get down to zero. Yeah, and I think from the, the, the cadence that the, a control player prefers in that sort of spot, is the uh, draw some cards and with my leftover power interact with the board somehow. And I think Lord Perth there just had way too many turns of all my power spent drawing cards, and now I have to spend my entire term just swimming upstream playing catch up there. That just sort of it, it had all the makings of a game that's good for control. I'm mean, drawing cards, you sort of fed it off the early stuff, you were able to exploit a market target. That all looks really good, but. Uh, just th those sort of smooth turns of pull a little bit ahead on cards and interact with the board just didn't manifest in the way that y you'd hope from that position. Yeah, it's, y what you're looking to do with a control deck, right, is that element of pull ahead at some point. And it can be cards, and that can be fine, but it does mean you have to have the board completely locked down. One thing that you can do is, as a control player is say, okay, maybe I'll find a way to pull ahead on board. And what we saw from Lord Perth in that game was, there wasn't anything like that. They mm -hmm. never drew anything like that, and that's something they needed. And whether whatever that form might take, you at some point in the game need to be ahead on board, otherwise you're always just losing on board. I mean, literally any plausible unit would have been good enough probably to stabilize there. Just like, just a, you know, even, I mean, honestly, just a Yoten Hurler. <laughs> just put a Yoten Hurler down, yep. you'd have had the biggest thing and would have been able to stabilize, but um, was never able to convert all the extra cards into substantive material for the table and just got barely run down. All right, so we're going to be checking out this next match. We're heading into game two with Drossela down a game up against Watchwolf92. All right. Watch this Wolf. sounds like game one Sorry, yeah, just wrapped up, and we'll be checking out game two as soon as they're ready for it. So Watchwolf92 already qualified for the World Championships this year. Uh, also a uh, longtime friend and associate of mine. We grew mm. up in the same area together. He was a player at my uh, LGS back in the – 
late 90s and early 2000s. Um, and so someone I'm very familiar with, very sharp card player, and uh, like them running up the score here too. Not enough to already be qualified for Worlds. Got to keep banging on these tournaments. It's great. So it's funny. We're going to get to see another Fountain deck in the hands of Drossa, and it's going to be up against Xenon in the hands of Watchwolf. And drossa has got quite a different take on Fountain. So if one, if the first deck we saw was trying to take advantage of at any cost, this next deck is trying to take advantage of Waxing Moon. Mm. And not the ability that draws cards, the ability that gives all your units deadly. And what they do with that is they've got a lot of units in Felon. We're talking Black Sky Harbingers and the like that are going to ping everything. And since the unit's now deadly, they're gone. Yeah, a lot of the engagement with, uh, with Moon is, you know, you're, you're drawing some extra cards. And if you happen to make a little bit of hay with the deadly side, great. But that's very rarely the thing that's getting optimized for. Very different take this time around where uh, the deadly half of, might actually be the more significant of the two for the way that Watch Wolf's deck is constructed. Absolutely. And uh, for Watch Wolf 92, they're going to be up a game. So that means they were able to overcome it in game one. But, you know, if you're up against a deck like a Xenon deck, I, this is... I'm going to be curious to see for Watch Wolf because we traditionally, this is like a, not a matchup I would want to be on on the Xenon side. When I think about the strengths of Xenon, it's like I get to play with great shadow interaction that can kill things, but maybe that doesn't do it if they've already come down and done their effect. And then on the other side, I get great time units, but those can really be swept up easily by deadly pings. And we see uh, the combo sort of already in hand for Drossa. I imagine this is going to be a keep here with a strategize also to keep things smoothed out, but yeah. Black Sky Harbinger ping everything, and then Waxing Moon uh, that can sometimes be all your units have deadly. Yeah, it's an interesting uh, matchup because both of these uh, faction pairings gravitate towards more controlling sort of card advantage oriented uh, sort of styles. Found much more about just drawing cards uh, and winning with just bulk rate card advantage. And Zen in much more on the contextual side. Uh, units that are worth two or more cards from the opponent. Um, some sites that can generate extra stuff. Typically, historically, in that kind of matchup, you want to be the one just drawing a bunch of extra uh, context-free cards. But uh, maybe a little bit of an upset here as Watch Wolf is already up the game. So we see uh, one of the synergies that Watch Wolf 92 has in their deck. They're playing with some bows that discard power, and then that procs the Dark Water Vines to discard some cards from both players' deck. And then down the road, we see Katra the first seal. That'll let them play some power from their void and sort of some powerful mid-range strategies they're going to try to be unlocking. It's going to be a lot harder, too, if they miss their third power. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, Drossless Hand is already pre-rolled up here. Uh, a lot of card advantage, a lot of utility, and Watch Wolf here really struggling. Not very much pressure. Can't really play the card advantage game. Just in a lot of trouble. The Marius Mandrake making its face shown here, but going to get quickly defiled and taken over to Drossless Void. Drossa's is now the time. We're going to drop down the Waxing Moon and Waning Moon. And the way, if you haven't seen this card before, the way that this relic works is that when it comes down, all your units have deadly. Now, every turn cycle, it's going to flip over to its other side, Waning Moon. And with Waning Moon, you get to draw an extra card and take one damage each turn. So half the time we're drawing an extra card, half the time we have deadly for all of our units. Now, Wasteland Broker, this is an even deck. We see it paired up with Even Handed Golem. They're going to get to go into their market, find a card, and then put four copies of that card into the top 20 cards of their deck. But could be anywhere, so we could see it soon, or it could take a while. Watch Wolf 92 finally hits power number three. They're playing catch up at this point. That's not the kind of thing I necessarily want to do against the whole Waxing Moon, Waning Moon setup. We see Black Sky Harmager now maybe going to take everything out. And I, I'll be curious, does Watch Wolf 92 feel like they need to banish the Broker, or can they afford to banish the Waxing Moon? And they go for the Broker. Well, the Moon got taken care of a while ago. Oh, I missed the, it, uh, yeah. <laughs> but not really the core thing going on here as... Uh, You're right, they hit it with Send an Agent earlier, yeah. didn't they? Yeah. Exploit now for Watch Wolf 92. A great pickup. It's going to be able to take a key piece from Drossla as well as Plunder to get us to power number four. Unfortunately for Watch Wolf 92, that Black Sky Harbinger is in a real sweet spot of being sort of unkillable. It's not mo a single faction, so Send an Agent can't kill it, and it's cost six, so Banish can't kill it either. Yep, and also just sort of the aftermath of the, the Broker is looming on this game too. So, I mean, Watch Wolf basically down on every axis you can evaluate a game. 
presence on the table, card advantage, sort of implied <laughs> long-term sustainability of their position, Ooh. all of it. All right, there's there's another moon, but Dross is going to go for the Defile. They didn't want to let Watch Wolf 92 ultimate that Mandrake and kill the Black Sky Harbinger, and so they're going to try to ride this dragon for a while now, putting a priority on that before getting down another copy of the moon. The one axis the Watch Wolf 92 was up on was power cards and void, but having that Kotra <laughs> taken away, yeah. you really can't make much hay of it anymore. Look, it's not the most traditional resource in the game of Eternal, but Kotra makes good advantage of it. <laughs> so the deadly uh, moon is going to get send an agent once again, but that's going to get dazzled this time, so... Things really coming together now well for Drossa. The deadly on the even-handed golems means the Marius Mandrake can't block. And yeah, that's going to be it for game number two here. But not for the match as Drossa ties this one up at one game apiece. Yeah, and that's a, a, a lot. I, we didn't see game one, of course, but that's, you know, from my position sort of emblematic of how I expect the matchup to play out. It's really hard for Watch Wolf to thread that the needle there because the burden's on them to be the aggressor in the matchup, especially once even handed golem is part of the equation. Uh, a long game, you're so likely to get outdrawn. Your card advantage is going to be contextual. It's not hard to break that up with removal. And if you don't get off to a first, a fast start and also miss those early power drops, they're, they're going to bury you on every front. Uh, especially with that film build with Black Sky Harbinger being a little bit better at sort of just playing to the table, having presence inside of combat than the w list we saw previous that was just all card drawing. Yeah, and the thing that I really liked about what Watch Wolf 92 has going for them is they are playing with some removal that is have some upside against attachments and relics. And it's like, can you imagine how impossible this matchup would be if they didn't have tools like Banish and Send an Agent? And so if you are looking for a mid-range deck, which does work well when your opponent has relics, uh, Xena does seem like a solid place to be because you have that added layer of interaction. Right, and all, all that stuff I think would be just awesome for Watch Wolf in the matchup, and it's still going to be good plenty of the time, but the, the larger issue here is just um, even-handed Golem. Mm. If that is part of the equation, then playing the removal game just doesn't work. Absolutely. We're going to see an exploit here, and yeah, does not line up well against the old Golem, but it could certainly take it before it comes down. Is that where they're going to want to go? It, it seems to me like it would. I Nothing else looks particularly it, important in Dross's hand. It's really a fungible, it's a handful of fungible stuff, and that's just the most bulk rate card drawing. It's really one of the reasons why when players have asked me, like, what do I want do if I want to get better? I'd be like, well, if you can, try out a variety of decks or watch streamers play a variety of decks. When you're playing an exploit, one of the things you're oftentimes trying to do is be like, if I was them and I had this hand, what would I really not want to be taken? Exactly. Brutal there for Watch Wolf as, as Drossla with an even-handed golem off the top there. Fortunately, uh, from Watch Wolf's position, unknown to them. Uh, Drossla's hand, no additional power, so it's a little unwieldy. Maybe he strategize to smooth it out, but that, that draw step was not good for Watch Wolf. Now Drossla does pick up power number three. They're going to go for an Annihilate on the Vine Grafter before that one can ultimate and go into the market. Even-handed Golem crashes in for a point, and for Watch Wolf now... I think you've got to try to figure out what your plan is because it feels like we're in a situation where we're just kind of behind in a lot of ways once again. And so what can you do that's going to be hard for Drossla to deal with and really put pressure on them? I, I mean, uh, you know, abstractly, it's find a threat they can't answer. That's going to be Watch Wolf's plan here is some contextual card advantage because they're not going to be able to hang in sort of just like the bulk rate who's just drawing more cards, seeing more stuff. Felon's going to get the better of that nine times out of ten. All right, the exploit now going after Drossla. And we see it take Strategize. These these one-for-one -one exchanges just fundamentally favor the even player more, and so it's really nice if you can be applying pressure on some way. You know, it, it's harder when you just have all even cards and you can't spend on increments of power, and that's oftentimes what you're trying to do when you're trying to beat an even deck. And I like taking the strategize there. I think from from Watchful's position, it's what what's your shot in this game, and it's uh, Drossla's hand continues to be a little bit lopsided or not have the right answers to your threats. Any bit of card drawing gives them a very good chance of smoothing that out. Uh, and also the hands full of kind of re fungible, replaceable cards in the first place. So 
you know, it's a little rough there. Maybe you'd like to take something with a text box, but I think from a strategic standpoint, uh, that's the correct approach. All right, how hungry we feel in Watch Wolf? They throw down the ambitious Mandevilla, and they say not hungry at all, as they do not choose to eat the even-handed golem with the Mandevilla. If they did, it would have taken minus one, minus one. They've said, you know what? You can have one more 1-1, one, one, but I'm going to have a 5-5 five, five lifesteal rather than a 4-4 four, four lifesteal. Yeah, I mean, if there's a binary between um, uh, the 5-5 five, five versus the 4-4 the four, four minus the 1-1 one, one being the same there, um, yeah, I'd rather just keep the 5-5, five, five, gain a little bit extra. Wow, what a draw off the top for Watch Wolf. Another send an agent. Here's the, are they going to attack, and if so, what kind of blocks will we see from Drossla? We could see a double block from two Damaras, and now if you're Watch Wolf, it feels like you've got to blow this up with the Sendin Agent. For sure, yeah. I mean, you, th this is sort of as a, a, a flow to the game. This is the best that Watch Wolf can do. It's like, you're ahead Oof. for now. <laughs> Golem number three of the game, and there we go. There's going to be... Cobalt Waystone. We're going to maybe shift out this Tamaris. She'll deal one to each enemy without flying. And for Watch Wolf, with just a Xenon banner off the top, they're they're pulling a hat on health. They're putting some pressure. But that VAR is going to be an issue if Watch Wolf doesn't have an answer well, here. I think the bigger issue is, is the Oedipal, honestly. Yeah. Because it, now that we've kind of gotten to parity, how Drosla pulls ahead here is just one more big push of cards. Mm. And the Xenon Banner is not going to do much here for Watch Wolf 92. They're going to hit in once again with the Mandevilla. Play a Xenon Banner. And now here we go for Drossa. Pay five. Stun the Yetapult and draw three cards. We picked up another, a couple more power. Another Yetapult. And now a Dark Water Vines. It's definitely, you know, it felt like there was a moment here where Watch Wolf 92 had really had the game in the balance, had gotten into it a pretty even state. And then you need to find something impactful off the top. And the last couple of draw steps really haven't delivered for them with just this power. And now this very anemic looking dark water vines. Yeah, there, I mean, there's this, you know, uh, ostensibly ahead on the board and definitely drawing heavy. I mean, a lot of things to, to really cement their position. But the burden was on Watch Wolf to find something because eventually Drossel is just going to gas up more cards, find an answer to the 5 5, and then beat you with the leftovers. And those two high leverage draw steps there, Watch Wolf only found power and now. Now we're here. Tamaris emerges from her shift, enters our dimension, and now we've oh we went into the market and we grabbed a Zindo revealed. Boy, did with we. that the Mara Def Saboteur. Whew, that's uh that's a lot. Yeah, that's um it's gonna be not a small amount to get through. No, no. <laughs> yeah, Xenon not you know, I, I think of Xenon because they oftentimes feels like they have, like, the best, like, unit removal. They have so many big, huge, like, shadow and time units. They're, they're so good at getting a head on board in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. But then when you get up against something, like, a board that you're behind on, it feels a little bit harder to catch up. And we're really going to feel that now where it's it's not that it's this is an impossible board for any player to catch up in the game. It's just, like... Does, did Watch Wolf play maybe the very specific Xenon card or two that could catch them up in a spot like this? Yeah. Yeah, and just a Zeno revealed doing its thing. Watch Wolf 92 is 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 trying to find a way to the through. You know, they've gotten them down to 15. A 5 5 Life Stealer is nice, but it's. Unless this Vine Grafter has something amazing. And the thing is, is like. If it was actually that amazing, mm -hmm. the Damara from Drossa would have stolen it probably. <laughs> so, yeah. Like, a Zindel revealed was the thing that they were hoping to draw into. Yeah. Get a market card, get a Zindel. Yeah, start actually kind of rolling the thing over a little bit. But All right, welcome instead. back to the booth. So that was our second match sort of of round one. We're going to be still on the lookout for any remaining matches of the rounds before we wrap it up and get this down to a tight 32-person field for the second round of the day. But uh, great stuff early on there. Um, a variety of strategies there. Uh, two different, very different takes on Feln. Uh, one very, very controlling and card drawing oriented. And then that one we saw picking up the win against Watch Wolf. Uh, a lot more contextual card advantage, a lot more just units in general. Um, and using even-handed golem as sort of the tool to, uh, you know, because when you're play building a deck like that, you had to hit all your power drops. Sometimes your units are going to be good, but like not the right thing for the puzzle. So how do you just have enough material to work with to hit all your power drops and 
still leverage your units even if they aren't ideal for the matchup. And even handing Golem there was was so bad for Watch Wolf. I mm. mean, the blocking, the card advantage, the the burden to put them under to uh, play a faster game that they're not really equipped to play. Uh, they did win game number one there, but the other two were not particularly competitive. All right, here we are now for this game number two between Killer King and Gilead. We got Killer King, our first Stone Scar player of the day, up against an Argentport take here, and looks like another game that's pretty tight in the balance here with reasonable health totals. Both players have one unit on board, and then a, an, a little bit of action in each player's hand with a end of the line up at the top of the screen, or sorry, end of the story, and then a Senway Smuggler and open contract for Killer King. They've probably been thinking about what they're going to go into the market for, and the answer is D'Angelo's Might. Six cost, draw cards equal to the highest strength among your units. And with open deck lists, I'm interested to see if this is enough for Gilead to pull the trigger. It seems like the most mm. likely thing that... Because, yeah, Killer, Killer King, King also pulled. didn't play whatever they got. Right. Very interesting spot here, and Gilead sniffs it out. Going to completely neutralize, for the moment anyway, this D'Angelo Might, and whoo! A hot draw for Killer King. Now, they, they drew a bigger unit than they had before in this Akanta Ascending. This elf and her dragon, she, she rides the dragon to glory, and that's what Killer King's going to be looking to do with it, is we've already grown her up into her second form here as a 4-3 flyer. Now a Stone's Guard Signia. We're going to see, I imagine, this D'Angelo might get played. But Killer King's being cautious here. It is a huge blowout, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> if Akanta that's... Ascending gets killed, I imagine if I'm Killer King, I do the attack first here, see how that goes, see if there's like a pause, anything like that, and then that would give me maybe the confidence to fire off the D'Angelo might. But we'll see where they want to go. Yeah, I, I think you got to do it post-combat. It's just too, too big of a blowout. Just clarify the game state. And also, if you get another unit for your trouble, even if they're sandbagging something, you you draw two at least. Great point. All right, so what are those four cards going to be? A pair of Annihilates. Now there's a Tazbo on top, a Champion of Chaos, and a Crest of Chaos. That is some good, 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 good stuff if you're Killer King. And for Gilead, it felt like they had managed to use their cards in a really clever way by firing off that that sort of harsh rule-like effect at a time when maybe Killer King wasn't expecting it. But since then, everything has gone Killer King's way. Well, I mean, you know, they, they had to play the the sweeper on their own turn. And if you're looking who's favored just in a top deck mode, person going first already having a draw four or a person with nothing, uh, not surprising that Killer King's gotten the better of it. All right, so some good things happening now for Gilead. There is an end of the story on top of the the deck they drew an ambitious mandevilla they chose not to play it interestingly knowing that they have a, uh, a, a sort of a harsh rule effect coming queued up for next turn so I, I think that's some real clever patience on the part of gilead to not just make a really good play this turn but recognizing the needs of the long term well also you know your opponent just drew four cards uh you're going to need to get more out of um that that sweeper than just one or two cards to kind of catch back up in the game. This is so awkward. That Tazbu means they're going to draw four once again here as, yeah, we're going to see end of the story, wipe all the units out, but Tazbu says whenever I die or any of your units die, you get to draw a card and take a damage. Four of them died. And yeah, that, that looks like that's going to be the sort of the key to victory here for Killer King. They're going to get to exploit the last card out of the way. A pair of Sills are really great. Uh, Sills a great card. Two cost five, one decay. And when with summon plunder and when one of your units with five strength or more dies, you get to play a one, one vampire bat with flying and lifesteal. They work so well together. If one of them dies now, both of them will sort of see that one die and they'll get two vampire bats. Yeah. Now you're seeing just a lot of plundering to smooth out here. And uh, you know, Gilead again, uh, Pretty fortuitous warp right there, but it's just, there's so many cards to grind through here. Yeah, this is basically the best the turn could have gone. They drew something in the form of Argentport Blueprints, and they got to play a warp card off the top of the deck. And because both of them died at the same time, it's two times two. So it's four, four Vampire Bats now to work through. 
And yeah, that's that's gonna be tricky. Now there's a Vara coming. And at this point, it's just what's insurance against things going wrong here. The attack from the vampire bats will knock Gilead down to three, and then even a removal spell, the bats are so lethal. So is Vara actually changing anything about the equation here? Yep. I mean, to me, it seems better to just take a card that I know is a threat than not. But if I knew I had Vine Grafter underneath it, I definitely would bottom it. So that way, maybe I could play the Vine Grafter, ultimate it, and, and sort of go into the market. Uh, oh, Shadow Etchings. Yeah, that's that's good. It just seems very unlikely that to me that Vara is part of a game you're winning that you would have otherwise lost. And it's additional exposure to another sweeper off the top. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Is if you knew, if you looked at the deck list and you saw like Gilead was playing with a bunch of devastating setbacks or Vara's authorities, you knew those would kill all the vampire bats, but wouldn't kill the Vara. And seeing that kind of card in their list makes it much more attractive to get the Vara. Right. And or like an Aramot's Designs is exactly that kind of a thing, right? Like if it had been Aramot's Designs off the top, if you had played Vara here you would actually just have lethal this turn. Now, Killer King's spot is fantastic. There's even a Sadidi warped off the top. I still really like their chances, but I think if they had gone for the VAR line, um, they would have straight just won the game here because of the presence of a card like Aramoth's Designs. And I that's mean, the fun thing about yeah. this. You don't know which way it's gonna go. You gotta make your best predictions and then you'll find out. All right, so we see Annihilate, take out the Sadidi. Killer King's gonna go into the market. Gonna grab Crawl, take six, but you get to play something that costs six or less from your void. Hey, there's a Tazbu. So now, even if once again Gilead could manage to work through this board, it's like Killer King is just, you know, they're not like trying to draw a million cards. That's not what their game plan is about. It's about continuing to apply pressure. And if you want to sit around and try to do nothing but kill my units, I'm going to get a little bit of value each time. I, I really like the way that Killer King is playing this game. I know we, we disagree on that, that, yes. that Vara scout or whatever. But there's a real mindfulness of like, all right, I'm 95% plus to win this game. What does the 5% look like? The games that I lose, what is the shape of it? What are the cards involved? And I think Killer King, even if they're making some unorthodox plays, even if maybe they're giving Gilead an extra draw step, draw step or two that wasn't necessary, is doing just a wonderful job of protecting themselves from uh, that 5% that downside risk. Yeah, I mean, even if you are... All right, so we're going to see Argent, or Argent Port Blueprints get cracked here. What can Gilead get by going into their void and getting some units? I mean, I guess I didn't think they had something quite cheap enough here that they'd be able to play at the same turn rather than play the Vara. I mean, it got to be something multi-faction. That's the starting point here. But they just only have one power. How could right. they have something cheap enough to play? Yeah. So I guess we'll see. Maybe Gilead's got a plan we're not aware of. Yeah, I mean, the reality is is uh, Killer Kings, we are still talking about this this play earlier because it was such an interesting play and decision. Oh, they have a one-cost Valken Forcer which I guess can silence one thing and then chump another, but... Oh, it has Aegis, right, of course. The Argentport Blueprints gives Aegis. So, you know what? Actually, Gilead did find a way, I believe, unless there's something specific that we can get in the market, which helps us here. We will get another turn. But if there's any removal in the market that works in this spot, um, we're just we're toast. And I imagine Killer King playing a Shadow deck uh, has something that will work in this spot. But let's see, Sunway Smuggler, what do you got for us? Maybe throw Crow back, get its fate a second time. Pick up an Edict of Makar, that sure does the job. An enemy unit of your choice can't block. If it's Justice, kill it. But all they need is can't block, because Tazboo and the Vine Grafter are enough to get Killer King on to the round of 32 here. So that was our first taste of Stone Scar. And uh, I, I think, you know, oftentimes in the past, when and that players, when they see Stone Scar, it's like, oh man, I'm just going to get beaten up by Bandit Queen. That is not this Stone Scar deck. That's not what everybody's playing this weekend. No, I think, and it's reasonable to kind of anticipate, I think, um, just a lot of sweepers and removal as a response to the live balance changes. And so if you are going to play a deck with units, like, what does that look like? And and that Stone Scar deck is so well set up between the Plundering and Tazbu, um, you know, being able to smooth out draws to the market of not being that leveraged against sweepers. And we saw multiple ones get played, and that Stone Scar deck just never ran out of gas. 
No, a uh, super impressive job by Killer King, and we're going to be seeing more of them and more of that deck as it is one of the more popular decks in the field this weekend. That is going to do it for the round of 64 here. All of the players have finished their matches. We're going to take a just a brief few-minute break, and we'll be back with the round of 32 here at the Hour of Glass 5K thrown open. Welcome. This morning, I am joined by Sean, a.k.a. The Overmaster. Sean, you recently won the draft open and will be competing at this year's Eternal World Championships. Thanks so much for joining us today. And today we're going to get a chance to get a little bit to learn a little bit more about you and about how you managed to become one of our world championship competitors. So first of all, why don't you tell people at home sort of who you are, where you're coming from and what you'd like people to know about you? I'm Sean. Most of the community knows me as Theo. Uh, it's the first four letters of my uh, my tag, uh, the Overmaster. Um, I'm from Newfoundland originally, uh, which is crazy because, of course, Carnage from uh, the previous Open is also from Newfoundland. But I'm I'm uh, I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia now, just outside of Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I I'm an Unemployed electrical engineer, let's say. <laughs> I have the degree, but I haven't yet uh, got a job for it. Well, yeah, like you mentioned, yeah, Carnage, a Canadian. So Canada going to have a strong preference, uh, strong presence at the upcoming World Championships. Uh, and so let's talk about a little bit about you and your journey starting to play Eternal. So do you remember when you first started playing and what was the first card that you encountered that really jumped out to you? Um... I believe it was August of uh, 2016. I got the beta and then didn't really do anything with it for a few months. It was like May um, that I got in the beta. And then I got the second invite uh, uh, for a friend. And that's when I uh, got into it. Um, the first card that stuck out to me was probably um, either Crown of Possibilities or Clock Roaches. Uh, I, got, I guess they go hand in hand, right? Um, uh, I remember Sunnyvale had made a list uh, called Dark Roaches, where uh, you splash for a uh, dark return in, in a normal Clock Roaches deck and add, add, to add more recursion, and that really kind of got me hooked on the game. Um, yeah. Very cool. And so let's let's dive in and talk about the draft open. First of all, what was it what was it like for you preparing for that event? Did you have high expectations going in? I I mean I didn't really have high expectations going in because uh, I'm normally not really a draft player. I didn't really have high expectations for this one. I prepared as I would prepare for any other tournament, you know, getting together with my team. So what were some of your, what was your team's sort of takeaways as you were getting ready for the format? What things were you really hoping to be able to do when it came time to draft your decks for both the qualifying rounds and then the top 64? My, my team, uh, the Barbarian camp, I forgot to mention that. Um, we, um, yeah, well, we mostly kind of zeroed in on time and and justice as the uh, the main two factions with a little little nod to primal because of the buffs, the recent buffs to uh, the observer and um, and uh, gnashing displacer, I believe. Time with uh, open way supplier and um, and uh, populist controller and telekinetic shackles. Those are the three uh, commons. That it was definitely. Uh, far and away the best what was really annoying in preparation for this event was, was kind of that uh, um, we kind of figured out very very early on that time was very very good, strong but it kept on coming it kept on coming so I had to uh, eventually what I had to do was uh, I had to stop drafting time for a little bit um, even though I knew that it was open so that I could you know get a feel for the other colors do any of the decks that you drafted in the qualifying round stand out to you were any of them particularly juicy um, if you re recall, that was the, uh, the time, um, when I, um, <laughs> when I messed up, you know, uh, when, when I, when I messed up, uh, maybe I don't want to go too yeah, we far. Could, no, we could tell that story. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, so, you know, as one of the things as a designer on the game is that sometimes I'm, you know, and as somebody who's heavily involved in our organized play systems, I'm sometimes called in to look into like, hey, we got a report, maybe something's going off here. And uh, Sean, you you reported that, hey, 
I, I was able to get out of the draft in the event and then get back in and get a new set of packs. And we're like, oh, that sounds really bad if that's going on, because then you could maybe just keep rolling until you get a pack that you really like. Yep. And But uh, do, do you want to tell, what was the, what, what actually happened there? I uh, actually joined a regular draft. Um, I, I thought I honestly thought I had uh, joined a, 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 a uh, the the event, and uh, I just saw a different set of pack, a uh, different set of picks, and I was, and at that point, like, you know, you you can start doing stuff with the client and stuff, but like, what if you mess it up re really qu quite a bit further, right? Um, so I, I just contacted, um, I just contacted support and, uh, yeah, um, eventually we figured out that I'm, you know, uh, yeah, anyway, it's well, kind of we... weird that I won the event <laughs> afterwards. It's so funny. It is so funny, but, um, yeah, I'm glad we got to talk about it. Well, I think you got some good karma because what happened, because the thing that you, the bug that you thought you encountered was a potential exploit. Right. Um, but rather right. than try to just take advantage of the exploit, you're like, well, I want this to be like a, a, a tournament with Fair. integrity. You let us know about it. And uh, turns out there was no bug the whole time. It was just a little simple mix up. These things happen. But Karma had your back the rest of the weekend, it seems like. For sure. All right, welcome back to the Throne Open. Andrew Beckstrom, Patrick Sullivan here for another round of this event. We've got the round of 32 queued up here. We're going to be finding out who will be making up our top 16 this weekend. On uh, the first round, we got a chance to check out some Stone Scar, Feln, Xenon, a couple different shadow strategies. We saw Huru getting into the mix. This round, we're going to be checking out Sky Craig. And uh, that's a deck that I've had on my radar that I've been interested to see what it looks like in the new metagame, of course. Losing access to one cost Blazing Salvo, but still with the bevy of really strong aggressive units and lots of great tempo removal like Torch and Permafrost. There's a lot of great reasons to still want to queue up with Sky Craig this weekend. Definitely. I mean, uh, we, we talked about this on the sort of our, you know, live designer stream or whatever. Uh, not worried about Sky Craig being unplayable. Let's say that. <laughs> they had a little bit of room to give. So uh, in, in spite of probably getting the worst of it of any of the two faction pairs as far as uh, nurse versus buffs go. Uh, not surprising to see it in the tournament and now into the round of 32. So let's say you were trying to beat up on these like exploit decks and you started like going a bit bigger and you're playing with like Talutes or Zindel Revealed, like all of these cards which emerge in longer games. And then next thing you know, you queue up for the next match and in your opening hand, you got one of these bomb expensive cards that just crushes these mid-range decks. And then old Champion of Fury shows up. How's that going to go for you? Yeah, and you know, your turn two is like an exploit or something <laughs> and you're just like already at s like 16 somehow. Yeah, yeah. It's always it's it's the check against getting too out of control, trying to try try to out mid range one another for sure. All right, so our match is queued up, and we're going to be checking out Portage here at the top of your screen. They're bringing Stone Scar. This is one of the more aggressive takes we see. League Explorer, Milos, Champion of Chaos. So not going to be grinding things out, and they're going to be up against the sort of deck to beat of aggressive decks for I would say the at least this year. Sky Craig Aggro. We see. A very lovely promo set of Oni Ronins on the right, and then that Champion of Fury in the middle of the screen, always a headliner for any Sky Craig aggressive strategy. 
now for Blasted or man, they're going to start things off with that Oni Ronin after getting shook down. And uh, a turn two for Portage, they could go for Torch and they could go for League Explorer. They could sit back, they could attack. Lots of decisions early and it's really an, a, an important moment for Portage to define what they think this game will be about. I think if you uh, eschewed taking the Permafrost there, you can't play a controlling game. Mm. That card's just going to be too good against you if you try to sit on your heels. So I understand if, if you're playing against Skycrag and um, your opponent's got a bunch of Oni Ronins, you're going to take some lumps here, but I think uh, Portish is kind of priced into pursuing this route uh, by taking Champion of Fury over Permafrost. But for the record, the same play I would have made. That's not a criticism. It's just you got to, we're here now. This is what you got to do. <laughs> All right, so for Blasted or Man, they Permafrost the League Explorer, they get down an Oni Patrol, and we just see, once again for Skycrag, just the absolute best selection of one-cost cards in the format. If you want to try to do a lot and do it fast, Skycrag is the way to go. And we've seen, you know, they were on the draw this game. They went second. It certainly doesn't feel that way with how much they've been able to do to the board already. And this is going to be ultimately, I think, a battle of quality versus efficiency. I think Portish has the, you know, the better cards that they're able to stick. But the downside there is uh, these three cost plays being fended off for one or two while you're already uh, a little bit under the gun from their early starts. And we see that emblem of Shavka decimated to get that 3-2 elemental. They lose a power, but in exchange, they get that 3-2 in hand. And, you know, they're just continuing to make more and more plays to the board and interact. Now they've run out of removal. And so now can port stabilize. They're going to play this Milos. They've got a 3-3. And for the first time this game, Oni Ronin doesn't have a clean attack. This is the uh, this is the turning point right here. Oh, oh. aggressive! We see Oni Ronin just going straight in, and now Portage is rethinking this. And they, first, I think they expected maybe a trick, a ping effect to figure out the Milos, but I think they've just decided. No, I think this is just you on are just trying to like be as aggressive as possible. Well, you you don't have to be right that often for that block to yield a lot of fruit. So even if there's uncertainty. Some amount of the time, the Blasted Earth Man is going to have nothing there, and then you really get paid out for that block. All right, next up for Portage, they draw a Senway Smuggler. Do they have? This is another play which could um, get something good to get from the market against aggressive strategies. Do they have a one-cost card here? They have a Boar, and wow, they're going to set mm. up a huge turn next turn as Boar is going to be able to take out both Permafrost. Blasted Earth Man has drawn a giant League Explorer once again, all aggressive all the time. And we see a depth charge played from the League Explorer. That relic will pop and deal two damage once Blasted or Man gets down to no cards in hand. And for Portage, is are they they pick up a Black Hole War Leader? Is this the moment when we unlock both of our units? We could you can also use the board to kill a depth charge. Yeah, I think you want to get it all here. I mean, you're at it, this is going to be your. Uh, turn regardless well, you can only kill two the war keeps getting more expensive with each copy drawn uh and so they were only they did not take out the depth charge and we see with the torch in hand that's another three points to the face so a lot to consider here now for blasted or man where do you use the do you go face do you try to unlock another attack you could just go in with the, the League Explorer, except the attack's going to be horrible. But they're going to kill the Milos. Attack with everything. I mean, it's not that bad. You're getting in for six effectively here because you have two depth charges plus the two points you're getting in for. And that will knock your opponent down to three, and then you're drawing to uh, Torch. You have a lot of War Cry triggers. It's possible something like Champion of Fury gets the job done. So, And you're at 20. I mean, you got a lot of looks at it too, so... One of the big advantages that Blasted Arm Man's going to enjoy for the rest of the game is by being so aggressive. It's going to make it harder for Portage to try to turn the corner. And there's Milos. And I think Blasted Arm Man has managed to top deck their way into a game one victory. I mean, just a real masterful display of using your cards being cheaper to leverage your opponent's cards being maybe really just better, I would say. Yeah, and, and also just drew a lot of extra power, more than you would want for a deck um, 
uh, with that many one cost cards, but was able to use Decimate to smooth it out. Had just enough action to get over the line there. Yeah, they, a real nice use of those emblems. That uh, that cycle of Decimate power gives aggressive strategies a way to have some power that can turn into more threats when they draw too many. And those were just important pieces during the game. The 3-2 Shavka Elemental, the Ice Elemental that they got with 2-1 Aegis. Um, just ensuring that even though they maybe drew realistically, it seemed like maybe two or three more power than they wanted, they didn't feel it as much because they had a way to use it in a different way. Yeah, and it not only w did it manage some of that, that flood, the, both the times that the Decimate power got played, uh, uh, they had two power left over. So it also filled up gaps in the curve on top of uh, giving them enough action to play with. Those were, those were critical there. Can't, can't get over the finish line without them. Yeah, when you're playing with these these very low curve decks, it's it's really about ca how much do you get out of each turn. Wasting a power here and there just means your turn's not as good as it could be. Mm -hmm. And you're going to get overpowered eventually. So the burden's on you to get on top of the game there. We almost saw it there. I mean, uh, at, at that point, Zone's car had turned the thing around. More cards to hand, more power. It was just an issue of how quickly can you like pivot and get the game over with. And because they had to play on the back foot, by the time they stabilized, uh, Skycrag was at 20. Just like all the time in the world there, you had to play a really defensive game. And then um, you, you're drawing to a million different cards to finish off there, as we saw. All right, so heading into game number two of this match, Portage is going to be on the play. You love that if you're, you know, in one of these fire mirrors of sorts. And, you know, we like to say that in general, you want to be a little bit bigger in these. I, it, is that as true when both decks are just aggressive? Because it seemed like the fact that Portage could do a little bit of blocking but wasn't as cheap seemed to be a more of a disadvantage than an advantage. Being a little bit bigger and a little bit slower is typically the way that you want to address unit-based matchups. Uh permafrost really throws a wrench in that mm. because part of the reason that you that, that philosophy exists is when i play my four four all your three threes are locked out and now you it requires two cards or you attack me for six but you lose an attacker those are the exchanges where the bigger slightly slower deck pulls ahead when your opponent goes threat would charge permafrost the thing you just played it totally blows up that paradigm so Typically true, and that can still manifest in this matchup. It's not like that's gonna happen. It's not gonna happen every single time. But the two permafrosts meant that getting to the table faster was really the important part of that game, and not playing the biggest thing. Yeah, and I, I think it also matters. Sort of, are the units more attack oriented, or are they more flexible? Champion of Chaos has a lot of dope attacking abilities, but it, you know, it's it's a five five, and it's got deadly, and those work well on defense too. And then you look at a card like Milos. What are the things that make Milos good? It's like. Well, it's got charge and overwhelm, and when it hits the enemy player, it puts firebombs in their deck. Now, the moment you just play it and you're sitting there with it, it's not doing all of the things it normally does. Yeah, I, I, another way to think about it is the Skycrag deck, that really fast, aggressive deck, already has to be built with control in mind. So when the Stone Scar deck has to position themselves as a control deck in the context of the matchup. They're the one playing defense or the one having to block. They're doing it with typically tools that are worse than the control deck, the Skycrag deck already has to factor in when they're building their deck. Now it's a little bit different because, you know, three cost five fives are not something you see in control decks. And that will have those will have moments of being good against Skycrag. If Permafrost is in the equ equation, you're back to, well now it's two cards. Now it's absorbing attacks, whatever. But uh, it, it is asking the Stone Scar deck to play a game it's typically not oriented around with with tools that are, are worse than the ones the Skycrag deck usually has to plow through I I against decks that are trying to play defense. Yeah, the, the my favorite cards whenever I'm playing like that sort of aggro deck are always those, the Varas. Like Var Vengeance Seeker to me is such a great example of the kind of card I love to play with because being a 5-5 five five for 4... It's already applying a ton of pressure on the control decks. It's disrupting their ages. It's doing so much for me. But then, you know, I queue up against a, a Skycrag deck, and it's like having a 5-5 five five or a 3-3 three three Lifestealer against them is a huge deal in a way that it isn't necessarily against a control deck. Right, and I, I, what you're kind of speaking to, I think, is also the, the burden of the fail state from the Skycrag side. If you play a Champion of Chaos and I don't have a Crumberfrost, okay, that's bad. But maybe it's two cards. Maybe I'm in a holding pattern. We saw some Trump attacks. Right. Maybe I'm in a holding pattern for a turn or two. When it's Vara, it's like the game is, is like pass fail on the spot. If you can't kill it, it's going to uh, completely turn the game around uh, in a turn. Um, Trump attacking into a Vara yeah. to try to get some damage through doesn't work too well. 
All right, so for Blasted or Man, they're going to kick things off this game with an Oni Ronin, that 2-1 War Cry. Just doing great work as always. And a 2-3 Black Horror War Leader on the other side. 2-3 is a big set of stats for an Oni Ronin. Yeah, this is a great start for Portish. Um, it, you know, this is not going to work every single time, but part of the range, again, is uh, they can't attack or it's two cards. And you need to start generating these uh, exchanges early on in the game to be able to start leveraging your more expensive but ostensibly more powerful cards. All right, so there we go. Auto Tread, pay one, discard a card, and deal one to get plus one, plus one on the Auto Tread. It's, uh, that's the cost of doing business right there. Yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, just two, three blank there. Really great. <laughs> I, I don't know if I feel ahead after that for, if I'm Blasted or Man, but it, I, I would say they made the appropriate play. Yeah, it's, it's again, it's what else you do. Your cards are the – you're playing with the cards you're playing with. It, <laughs> that's the best you can do under your circumstances. Yep. You can wish you had a torch in your hand all you want, but wishing doesn't make it so. Next up for Blasted or Man, they draw D'Angelo Houndmaster, and that's going to be a big thing to watch out for as that one can apply a ton of pressure to the board really fast. For now, though, this is going to be a setup turn. We're going to get out on a Prowling Amaruk. Oh, and the D'Angelo Houndmaster. So risking a removal, stopping the Houndmaster from ever getting in there, but just, you know, it's a 3-2 quick draw thanks to the Warcry and with Valor. They really like the things that it could do for them. I think Portage, though, is not going to want to see any business of that Houndmaster proccing, and we're going to see Annihilate just snap it off. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's the risk of that line right there is, uh, you know, the, the Houndmaster is potentially a way to accrue the card that you essentially lost on the, the earlier exchange. Um, and now your leftovers are, you know, you're down on cards, you're down on the table. It just it has the, the tone of a game that's not going well. All right, now for the Oni Patrol and the Oni Ronin and Blasted or Man, that represents the, the, the remaining gas in the tank. Portage, you know, that was, a, that was a, not an easy call there about whether to attack with the League Explorer, but I, I think it's really critical that even when you're saying I'm more the control side of a matchup like this, getting in attacks is good, and it makes it harder for Blasted or Man to know how safe they are once yeah. you've gotten them down low. All other things being equal, you know, you still have to cut draw steps out of the game. You don't mm. want to You don't want to leave uh, the Blasted or Man in a spot where drawing to Champion Fury or drawing to Torch, and if Blasted or Man blocks and trades your League Explorer, fantastic, that's great. And if it keeps hitting, it's like, okay, well, eventually I'm going to run out of cards in my hand. There's a whole lot of points here. Now, we might get to the point where it's time to slow down, but... Big draw. Another D'Angelo Houndmaster. So, recent change on this one. No longer puts out 4-4 four, four Hounds. It puts out 4 ones. Makes it a little bit easier to manage the Hounds. But it doesn't make it trivial. And we see that double attack. Kick off with the Houndmaster. Pr powering up the Amaruks. I'm surprised we attack with both Amaruks and not put something like the Oni Patrol instead. It yeah, it, I mean, if... if, uh, if Portish is priced into a double block, most likely. Anyway, you want to be attacking with the most fungible things that generate the double block. Yeah, you'd rather just... Essentially, they might lose a 3-2 here. Which Aegis, one? When they could just lose right. a 3-2 non-Aegis. But, you know, it's tough. Portage might... It looks like they might just be blocking the 4-1. It's not like that thing goes away at the end of the turn. Yeah, I mean, there's a question of... Just generally speaking, what do you care more about the 3 2 or the 4 1? Because the card's not going anywhere. Well, the, and the Amherst are going to keep growing. So I think in reality, they are basically as big of a threat. So now it's a matter of can Portage manage to stabilize? They're, they're going to be. This is going to be a good turn. We're going to annihilate the Houndmaster. We're going to get down this 3 2 deadly. We'll probably trade off with the 4 1. Pyro Knight shows up now, too. And then it's going to be all on Jack the Bounty Hunter. Can he be the hero that Portage needs to come back in this game? And I, I could I could imagine it. Jack's going to have a huge impact on this board in a moment here. Yeah, something like Vicious Highwaymen would also be fantastic. There's definitely some, some draws. So here we go. Jack, Mercenary Hunter, pay one and discard a card from your hand. Deal two to two enemies. Now we've got a 2-3. Our depth charge went off. We've got blockers for the two ones and... An incredible comeback, really, for Portage, because with that fire sigil off the top, I now feel like um, like Blaster or, or Portage is ahead. And at and now 13 falling to 11. Not all, uh, it, not all in the world to work with, but a much more stable position than we saw last game. 
when Portis was able to get things stabilized at 20 to 3. Uh, 16 to 11, you got to feel a lot more comfortable about it. There we go. Jack Mercenary Hunter drawing a treasure trove. Cashing it in. What do we got? A Seed of Chaos and a Skullbreaker now. Fire Sigil. Okay. And I, I, you got to let the invasive. Sp you could trade here. It's you're gonna go to nine, but I, I like not. Yeah, I mean, it, if you if you block there, I know you like to play defense, but you're almost in the spot where you, you're now giving them so many draw steps because your pressure's so so minimal. A lot of power flowing off the top for Portage. Can Blaster Derm take advantage? They get an emblem of Linrai. It's not exactly what they needed, but it you know it's certainly better than just a power without this decimate ability. Oh, they didn't even use it, and well, we see a vicious Hyreman off the top, and um, I, that smells like the end of this game as Portage is going to tie up this match. It's not you know what I mean. It's not often we ever saw somebody lose a game where they fired off the D'Angelo Houndmaster, and Portage sort of they they did almost the impossible. They came back from that moment. Yeah, I mean uh, you know they uh, I, I was actually very skeptical there of. Porsche's ability to stabilize that game because it just felt like there wasn't a, a piece to settle the game down, that they were just swimming upstream the whole time. But um, uh, Jack certainly turned that around and then some. It seems like the real key decision that Blasterderm Man had that maybe they would have gone the other way if they had known how things were going to play out was that first Houndmaster coming down, not proccing Ging and Annihilated first. And I think that's always something you got to consider with it is like, if you play it, it was a really good attacker. It was a 3-2 quick draw because of the war cry. But at the same time, it's almost like there was a hound they could have had, but that doggy never showed up. Yeah, I, well, there's a, you know, it's like always asking yourself, especially as like an aggressive player, your cards aren't that powerful. It's like, what does the game look like when I lose? And that sort of exchange there, you know, because you, you had the choice between the 3-2 D'Angelo or playing an Oni Ronin. It wasn't like a choice between D'Angelo and nothing. Yeah. There was a powerful insurance policy there where it's not really that much worse to attack with a, a two-strength unit and get a war tr cry trigger versus attacking with the 3-2. But the upside of the 4-1's money in the bank, it's locked up, um, I think is th that that really shifts the burden. Now, I you know, you cut it the other way. It's like, well, your opponent's got Nightfall in their deck. Like, who knows? Maybe maybe it's actually safer on the table than in your hand. It's not a straightforward thing, but the way that it broke down there uh, definitely looked bad. An extra 4-1 would have probably been enough to get the game over the line. Yeah, and I, and the thing is, is too, is, like, we you can't undersell, like, how good of an attacker that body was of the Houndmaster. 3-2, right. quick draw Valor versus 2-1 Oni Ronin with none of those abilities. If something with any amount of health shows up on the other side, with the Houndmaster, it just attacks through it. With the Oni Ronin, that's a chump attack, and that's what that's how it one way where it goes badly to not play the Houndmaster. Right. Like, what if your opponent only has a three three? Let's say, okay, well now you just run your two one into a brick wall, and your D'Angelo is still exposed to the same removal it was in the previous turn. So, yep. it's one of those things where we can see the hand, and that poisons it to some extent. It's like impossible. No, no, don't don't tell them that. Then it doesn't make us look as smart. It's. Uh, you know, breaking the fourth wall here a oh, little okay. bit. It, when, you, when the commentators can see the hands, even if you're mindful of it, it is going to poison your response to these things to some extent. Like, oh, yeah, of course, Annihilate. What a bad play, right? But that, that spot's really complicated because there's a mixture of how much you care about Shakedown versus how much you care about Annihilate versus how much you just care about um, – uh, champion of of chaos making combat worse the other way etc cetera, etc cetera. it's just all um there's a lot of different risks and rewards there and happy to capture the downside of it there and it looks bad when it's on camera but that doesn't necessarily mean the play was bad all right so that was a really fun game i'm really excited that we're going to get to see uh, a third game of this set and you know it's going to be this is going to be the tough game for portage like, let's be real. Anytime you have a match where you have to, where you're going to beat Sky Craig, one of the things you know you might need to do is like, I'm going to need to beat them one time when they get to go first. Oh, and this is the, uh, this is an important thing here before we get down to the match. You can't keep, if you are in the Stone Scar spot, you cannot keep your 50th percentile hands. You need to mulligan for the cream of the crop. A hand that's just fine, you have, I, I, I mean, uh, not to be too hyperbolic here, but I think you have to have something on the first turn. Yep. And any any hand, even a ostensibly decent-looking one that doesn't have a turn one play, you just got to go back, even if it means going down to six. Uh, I think that's something uh, – a common thing that I see Eternal players do, even very good ones, uh, where I disagree with sort of the philosophy, is not being aggressive enough mulliganing on the draw. 
you just got to find you got to find premium hands that's the easiest way to pick up i think le win rate that's left on the table by even very good eternal players is looking at a hand going second that's like fine and just being like yeah okay it's like no you got to you got to you got to get something good it's and not you, enough to be fine and you got to know your deck yes right like that's the thing is if the reality of your deck is, you know, if a fifty, if you're just playing with like a million ions and Sabretooth pride leaders, and you know suffocates and things like that, well, maybe you don't need to redraw for your absolute best hands yeah. against aggressive strategies because your hands are generally good against aggressive strategies. Let's just make sure we don't have a disaster. But when you're in the spot where you're playing something which wants to be aggressive, like the Stone Scar deck with its Meloses and Skullbreakers and the like. It's a lot better if you have a Black Hole War Leader as a 2-3. It doesn't die to all as much of the removal, but it eats a bunch of the attackers as opposed to even something like the Skullbreaker as a 3-2. All of the Oni Ronins, all of the Pyro Knights, they all just attack into it and at least trade with it. And that's why it's so interesting here because the Stone Scar deck is exactly the kind of deck that has a... Uh, uh, the 50th percentile in the matchup looks fine, but actually isn't in my opinion. No one cost plays for Portage on the draw, but I do love seeing Vicious Highwayman. I love seeing Black Hole War Leader. We know we've got a smooth power deployment. And for Blaster Man, the biggest weakness of this hand, they've got a two ones and a Champion of Fury. They don't have any dual faction powers, so that Champion of Fury can come down on turn two, but it's not going to be powered up. Uh, yeah, I mean, Porsche's hand, having already mulliganed, is uh, basically, I think this is about the bottom end of the range. It's a very, very, very strong hand going second. Other than the fact that it has nothing to do on turn one, I don't. I don't mind this keep having already mulled. So there we see Black Hole War Leader and a Milos Rebel Bomber, War Cry four four off the top. <laughs> Once again, Blaster Man throwing caution to the wind. Let's go. And uh, yeah, you know. Portage is going to pick up an essentially card advantage and board advantage with this block, but Blaster Man is happy because they're getting ahead on the health total race. They're putting a firebomb in. A lot of good things. Massive draw right there. Um, that is that that annihilate is a great way to bridge the gap, uh, and and potentially pivot to vicious highwaymen turning the game around. So we see annihilate straight take out the Milos before maybe any sort of negate effect could stop it. Torch is going to kill the Black Hole War Leader. Champion of Fury is going to show up. And once again, it's going to be on Portage with one of these great four drops to catch up in the game. And this time it's going to be Vicious Highwayman whose job it is. Will they get it done? I mean, this, this is right on the line here. This Vicious Highwayman is great for swinging the game around, but um, there's still work to be done. There we go. Pick up some quick draw. Pick up some lifesteal, Vicious Highwayman. You got it. And now a Pyronite. These war cries, they're real. But yeah, Vicious Highwayman pulled it up. And if, if Portage can find one more removal effect, yeah, it another. feels like that's what it's going to take. There's a Torch. That's a big one. Yeah. I mean, with a hand of just units, that high, Vicious Highwayman was good. But uh, the Blaster Man had kind of gotten through the worst of it. Now it's going to be another hit. Now it's going to be another four. So where's the Torch going to go? It could be on the Auto Tread. I could see it on the Oni Ronin. You'd need to do it first. That way your Vicious Highwayman picks up Lifesteal and Quick Draw for this attack. Well, I mean, you could hope that you get a, the Pyronite to block. You can just but then you don't get the Lifesteal. It, it only has the Lifesteal if, if a unit's died this turn, though. That's the thing. Yeah, but I... Uh, okay. I, this is... It just seems I know like you want, yeah, it's, it's so good. much upside to compel the block here. Maybe it doesn't happen to draw. Yeah, this is just, I guess this is safer. Yeah, I mean, Blaster Man's only at four power. That that exchange might be there again in the future. Um, but for now, it really did buffer Portage's health total yeah, a lot. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. I think that's right. Just, it's, I don't know. These are hard games. It's, everything is, like, so close. I, the the <laughs> auto tread attack, to me, just feels a little too wasteful. Yeah. That's just too easy of a block. It's only for one point of damage. Auto trade can be good for one damage in the future on a future turn. Well, it's also just the downside risk of now it, your worst draws, you're just exposed. Yeah. If you have the auto trade, you draw a power, you can still do a little bit with that 
And now if you draw a power, it's going to be very hard to win, I yeah, think. Yeah, and Porridge is thinking this through. It's like, wait, is there more going on here than I think? But I think they're right. I think this is a, a, a very good play to just take advantage and eat this 1-1, get this auto trade, this source of extra damage in the long games out of the way. But obviously, you want to double check. This is a moment when you could double block down the Pyro Knight. Do you want to take advantage? And they're not, but I think that's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's a different equ equation if, if uh, the Blaster Green ends up five power. We see Depth Charge go off. And this is real. We are on a razor's well. edge now because the Pyro Knight is almost enough with its overwhelm. Yeah. Vicious Hireman has basically lost lifesteal now. We no longer can kill an enemy unit. And I mean, and that's the upside of the Blaster Man's attack. You can say it's a little bit too aggressive um, with the auto tread there, but uh, getting Portish down to three, now you're drawing a torch. Um, that, that, that might be worth it. On top of just the Pyro Knights now, like, yeah. You got to do something about it now. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, Houndmaster. Mm. And uh, I think that is going to be it because I think it, you can't stop the overwhelm here of the Pyro Knight. Powered up by Warcry. We can block everything, but it's exactly three points of overwhelm. So every play Blastoder made, anytime you win with Exaxes, it's a perfect game. <laughs> for an yep. aggressive strategy, you, you're getting the applause from the master himself, Mr. Patrick Sullivan. We're going to get back to the booth here now, but um, a fantastic match. It's going to be hard to top oh. that match for a match of the day. That, that was really great, and I, I you know, um, uh, credit to the Blaster, man. That was, I mean, you, that, that Vicious Highwayman got two, two clean shots that game on top of killing a, it, it was a 4-1 champion of Fury. <laughs> like, you can't do any better than that. Um, and just manage resources perfectly there. That, that was a that was a great game. It was great. All right, vicious Harryman, um Because of that game, and it was so much fun. It means no matter what happens in the future, buffing that card back to four cost four two was a perfect decision. Way to go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, all other things <laughs> being all other things being equal, or where it's confusion, it's like yeah, we got one really sweet game out of it. And if it was a 5-3, it either wouldn't have been in someone's deck or it wouldn't have been good enough to catch him back up there, you know? So so we're paid out. There we go. Paid either, get paid either way. <laughs> All right. So we're going to be checking out one more match going on this round before things get wrapped up here. We're going to be checking out Mail's match. Let's see what they're working with this weekend. Looks like we got a Stone Scar player. And, Tom, who was the other one we're going to be seeing? Oh, we got Gurgi APM. What do they got cooked up for us? They're on Stone Scar too, so we're gonna see a mirror. But as you know, as we mentioned, we've we've gotten to see sort of um, both sides of the coin, the variety within that faction pairing. We've seen the aggressive side. We've seen sort of the mid range Tazbu Zo go deep into the market, try to grind out the game. And uh, not sure exactly which takes these players are on yet, but we'll be seeing it once we check out their matches. We're going to be seeing game three of it. Uh, it sounds like they're getting ready for that right now. Yeah, a lot of different ways to go about building Stone Scar decks. No shortage of good cards to select from. So a lot of that is just, you know, how do you want to orient yourself in the metagame? What are you trying to fight? Is it removal? Is it other fast decks? Is it, um, you know, stuff like combo Relics that are sitting around not doing very much? You know, there's just a... Uh, a deep card pool and a lot of room to sort of toggle back and forth depending on what matchup you're trying to address. All right. Yeah, for Gurge PM, obviously, you know, one of our most accomplished tournament players, male, we get to see them a lot. And so for both of these players, that you know, we know that both of these players is going to mean a lot to them if they can get to the World Championships. And so winning this match right here gets them one step closer. So it looks like Gurge PM looks like I'm seeing a little bit more of an aggressive take, whereas in the top side of the screen, you know, Exploit, it feels like it's an auto-include in all of the Shadow decks, but it's not something that you'll see in every Stone Scar deck, and it's oftentimes a way to define the differences. Is What is your turn two about? Is it about trying to disrupt the enemy plan every time, and just, or is it trying to do something to the board, whether it's removal or playing a threat? Yeah, League Explorer is kind of one of the better ways to do it in terms of uh, um, punishing Exploit. Oh, yeah. Uh, one, because you want to have that tempo advantage. And then two, well, your hand's getting empty. Makes it a little bit easier to fire off. Yeah, I mean, League Explorer is just not the biggest in the world. It doesn't have, you know, any ongoing battle skills once you get past that that uh, sort of charge turn. But, man, the damage really stacks up. I mean, Ooh. it just is like, oh, yeah. This is going to be a lot for male to come back from. Yeah, I was going to say, this is kind of rolled up pretty nicely there for Mail because you have Exploit for the 3 drop on 2 and then Exploit for the 4 drop on 3. But League Explorer off the top, I mean, you just don't mm. have the time to spend 
uh, your power breaking up hands. What an amazing draw for mail. So first of all, they're going to get to exploit a good card, and then that Sinister Rumors. I imagine we're going to see this get played here for that kill an exhausted unit with three strength or less, and it's going to do quite a nice job of giving mail a big tempo boost here. If they chose, to, if they choose to go that way, and I, yeah, I see, we I see mean, that they are. Have to. You got to slow this game down a little bit. And now with Jack picked up by Gurge PM. It's tempting. You could just fire it off right now and sort of discard the open contract and you know get a treasure trove, or you could wait and see if you can pick something more off. Yeah, I think the I, I think I would wait a turn on the open contract. There's just a chance that that's going to be just a. Also, a if you draw another fourth power, you can discard the sigil, and now your deck will get double damage. Yeah, I just um, I, it seems a little too a little too early for my for my liking to just fire that off. All right, so for Gurge PM, just this is just a classic hard decision. You know, they know Mail's decklist. They know Mail has units like Sill. They just don't know if one's about to show up and if it's going to reward them to sort of hold back a threat to try to kill it. They know that Mail wants to play a longer game, and so by sitting back on a threat, there's definitely some real risk that they're being exposed to. For sure. Yeah, none of this is easy. And now Mail's going to fire off their treasure trove, picking up a Stone Scar painting, Seed of Chaos. Here we will see... Still, I imagine, show up the Cabal strong arm herself in the service of Dizo, as always. And now for Gerga APM, it's going to be pretty easy here. We're going to play the fourth power, I imagine, and we're going to ditch eight open contract, get down that jack, kill the Sill, deal two damage, pick up a treasure trove. A vampire bat will show up thanks to a five strength unit dying. And League Explorer will put on depth charge number five. So I know mail looks like they're 15, but as soon as Gurg APM gets empty, this is going to get intense. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gurg is in this great uh, good short, good long position where ahead on the table and applying pressure and killing stuff, that's all well and good. But a treasure trove and an open contract to keep running downhill and also a ton of burden on mail to stabilize this ASAP and kill that League Explorer because uh, th those relics popping off is, is looming. All right, Mail finds another sill. They could even go into the market with it with shadow etchings, but that that is the real cost of the, sh the etching cycle. Is that when you use them as your market tool? Wow, they didn't even. So that means they're not going to the market, which is you know a fine play. It just means they're really saying I need sill and I can't exhaust her. And this is going to be very tricky now for, for Mail. Just so much depth charge action has yep. happened on the other side. The League Explorer going deep, setting those bombs. And sooner or later, they are going to go off. All right, there we go. League Explorer and Jack are both just going to attack in. I'm a little surprised we're not going to see the open contract fired off here on Sill, but one thing that this does is it means the Vampire Bat doesn't get the chump. And as a life stealer, that could be important. Well, also, just the, the, the power might all be rolled up this turn to another stuff. True. We could see the Black Hole Warrior Leader show up, or we could go for open contract now, plus... The shakedown, the nightfall damage will add up. You stop a lifesteal um, unit from ever getting into combat. So uh, a, a difficult decision here, I would say, for Gurg APM. It's, it's, you know, normally you'd rather get down the unit first and then sort of play out your spells, but this isn't obvious by any means. No, and it's also a little awkward because, like, uh, you have your treasure trove, you have your, your shakedown that's going to trigger nightfall. Are, are your tools here such that you're at risk of actually not being able to get your hand empty in time? Um, it's all not, it's all well and good to have these like sources of card advantage and interaction, but um, Gerga APM would also like to get their hand empty kind of in short order here because Ooh. what you don't want to have happen is mail is just overpowering you and you can't get your hand empty. All right, so we picked up a silver blade menace that three three drains equal to the number of spells in Gerga APM's void, and it's only two. So it only did a little bit of lifting here. Right now, I'm seeing Mail at a virtual 5. And with Vicious Highwayman, 
dealing one to the face. I think Gurga APM can win the game here with an all. Oh no, I'm sorry. They yeah, can't have the depth right. charges. They don't just yeah, get yeah. to choose when they go off. Yeah, you yeah. actually have to get empty first. It's not a it's not a it's not a virtual whatever. I mean right. again, this is the downside risk of this line from Gurga APM is like your hand is getting jammed up and now you're getting overpowered. Uh, and now there's no promise that you're going to be able to get your hand empty in time. So interesting, just attacking with the Vicious Highwayman. If you're male, it does feel like you might need to just let that through so you can not fall too far behind on the board. Now we'll see a Treasure Trove. Pick up a Sinister Rumors. Ooh, the Vicious Highwayman, it's just too big. It can only kill exhausted enemies three strength or less. That means it can't kill anything on the board. But it does have this mode of draw a unit from your void. We could go back and pick up Sill again. We could pick up the Vampire Bat. Instead, it's going to be Champion of Chaos for now. And now Gurgan PM finds the Stone Scar Insignia. Feels like maybe a spot where we start off with the Treasure Trove. The a second power means we are not going to get down to empty this turn. <laughs> yeah, I Every mean, time Jack gets through, we're just getting a treasure trove. We're <laughs> just stopping our depth <laughs> charges from going off. It's a little awkward. All right. Open contract takes out the Champion of Chaos, powering up our Vicious Harriman once again. And now everything's coming in. <laughs> it's going to be great if Mail lets the Jack through. <laughs> well, what's what this the the what's going on with this attack here? If you only send vicious highwaymen, um, Mail has the option to chump block and stay at um, yes. thirteen with an implied twelve. <laughs> By sending in everything, yeah. What ha w one consequence is the death charges are legal lethal. You cannot, it, it is going to be too much damage. Whereas uh, Mail has a buyout if uh, you only attack with Vicious Highwaymen. I love it, Mail got there. They blocked the war leader, let the Jack through. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, this is, a, a, you know, the die is cast again. The, there's no there's no way out of this. <laughs> that involves the death charge firing off. So you just gotta hope that Gurga APM just can't get their hand empty and you play through <laughs> it somehow. Yeah, that's that, that's tricky when they're at 31. But oh yeah, I, no, I'm not. I'm not <laughs> saying this is uh, likely to work. I'm saying life's not fair, but we're here now. <laughs> this is the best we can do. All right, treasure mm. trove. Sh well, mm. if Gurga APM draws nothing but power for the rest of the game, <laughs> like, uh, well, I, you got to start I, again. Yeah. It's like when you're five percent to win. It's like, what does the five percent look like? And it's like, well, I can't really beat spells anyway, so I just gotta pretend like the top of the deck is nothing but power. All right, Gurg APM, if you could successfully not time out and play all of the cards in your hand, I believe you have won this game and the match. Let's see it in action. We're gonna see a torch go to the face. We're gonna see a seat of chaos get played. Mm. A Milos, mm. and now the depth charges time is here. Oh, we're not even gonna see him fire off. His mail's gonna scoop him up. But yep, <laughs> the Gurga PM completed the quest of the game. Yeah, to no cards in hand. That was that was uh, a. a Interesting set of incentives going on in that game. That was, a, that was cool. That was very yeah, cool. Yeah, I, I don't know that I've ever seen a game before where it was such a loud disadvantage yeah. for somebody to connect with their jack. Yes. But, I mean, it, it cuts both ways, right? Because, uh, you know, Gurga APM kind of needed all of the stuff to get over the finish line and then also was eventually able to get their hand empty anyway. So it's ambiguous, but there was an interesting spot of, like, well, if the top of – their deck has to be like eight power in a row anyway, because just beating action is going to be so hard from here. Uh, what does my winning path look like, assuming that's the way their deck looks? And it's like, yeah, draw all the cards you want. Yeah. So I already can't beat anything. <laughs> so like, we just if we got to assume it's blanks for the next five turns, then that's the way. That's what you'd want to do if their deck is blanks for the next five turns. So I, I think it's a really, really creative like identifying. Identifying the winning line, like that's your best shot, but uh, it's not the most common thing to see. Yeah, it's definitely ambiguous that getting to no cards in hand is a good thing. <laughs> it's very least. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But again. So you think like you, you want to make like a card that's just like one cost, like shadow, like discard your entire hand? 
I mean, you know, there's some uh, you can you can do that sort of thing, I guess, if you wanted to. I, I there's room for all types in the game. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think that's um, how I'd approach the problem necessarily <laughs> to the extent there is one. But yeah, we can, we can talk about it. Maybe you just make some cheap cards that people want to play. Yeah. Let's. Okay. Yeah. Let's maybe we'll do that for, instead. For that. All right. Uh, it sounds like we got one more match we could check out for this round. And it's uh, almost, we got on Five Faction Strangers. I was hoping we were going to get to see some of this today. And uh, it turns out we might get to see more or less, depending upon how this game goes. Is Killer King and Almost are deadlocked here in a game three. How are, how's this board looking to you? Uh, juicy. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> Grodov Stranger going to tussle with Champion of Chaos. And maybe the Tazmu is going to come through. And we will see that. And then Tazbu's probably going to draw Killer King a card here. It's going to be a Sill. And we'll get to see how good these Triumphant Strangers can be. The Five Faction Stranger gets plus one, plus one for each Stranger. And at the end of your turn, you create and play a random Stranger. So it's going to be a lot on the line here for almost this turn. They could also try, use, try to use Kilo here, of course, and uh, do something with that. But instead, we're going to see another Triumphant Stranger. It's Big moment. What do we got? Soaring Stranger and Chaos Stranger. Okay. <laughs> sure. So all your strangers have flying, and when you play a stranger, your units get plus one strength this turn for the Chaos Stranger. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, this is lethal next turn, so you got <laughs> to do something. Uh, open Contract's going to be great, though. Uh, some of those strangers had their costs reduced thanks to earlier Open Contracts, and so the bounty's going to come due here in a moment, I imagine on one of them. Yeah, I mean, there's a question here. If you just, you know, if you don't take out Soaring Stranger, are you just dead on the crackback? Or do you need to, like, but if you don't, if you don't kill I mean, one of the generators, yes. it's, it's like, what's your long-term plan, you know? Yeah. Tricky, tricky, tricky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to see open contract fired off on a Triumphant Stranger, shrinking down the other one. Everything's going to attack. Uh, almost is obligated to do a block, of course. Is that is a full 13 coming across. As long as they block one of the big ones, they will be alive. And it looks like I chump on Tazbu, and maybe we eat the Vine Grafter. That's my, I mean, that's my intuitive block here is, is chump. Yeah, chump the Tazbu put something in front of the Vine Grafter and let Sill through. I think if you do that, oh, wow. I think almost is going to, is one point. Sh oh no. I think almost has this. Right. Cause you, you they're, you know, assuming that the, the Vine Grafter uh, dies and generates a brick, they're also taking a point off the Tazbu trigger too. Right. They're taking a point there. And also, Playing the hair trigger stranger um, is going to proc the chaos stranger, and so we're going to get an AOE plus one strength for the turn here. Shadow etchings ain't going to do it. I almost wonder if you wanted to let the uh, the vine grafter through, so there wasn't another card drawn. But it's tricky. I mean, you're you're dead to uh, if you do that, you're dead to a torch. You're you know. Oh right, the exploit takes it here. So no, actually. Oh man, one almost is one point short here. It, do they have a way with either of these uh, merchants and smugglers to go and find one more point of damage? Well, four is very different from three. Here. Well, uh, this wow, sort of everything's coming in. This implies something's coming. <laughs> I hope it's Nightfall <laughs> related. Yes. <laughs> yeah, almost is rethinking this one here because it's like you don't have it. I don't think without knowing what's in their market. And things could really sw swing back the other way because once once Killer King gets through this turn, the Shadow Etchings is going to be online, and we might have something really good to get in our market. It's not like almost is very high. Yeah, I mean we got to start here. This is good. This is like step one to the. What do we get? Oh, I can't make out that card. Oh, it's it's uh it's freeze out. It's negate a spell. The enemy can't play spells for for the rest of the turn. So Pretty powerful insurance policy here. Yeah, that's not bad. And you kind of want to, you kind of want to do a two turner here, like get in a shot, turtle up. You have a negate ready to go, and you should be able to block out of this Ooh. turn. Strangers have double damage now. Well, Vine Grafter 
goes into the market without playing a spell. This is super close. I mean, obviously, it's not really that close if it gets back to almost his turn here. <laughs> but, I mean, almost is only at four. Yeah, but get, coming through for the last... Breaking through these defenses here is going to be so hard. And if you make an attack, then the the uh, merchant gets to block. You, pu you get pulled up to six. I guess that that really doesn't matter too much in the scheme of things because this is just a million damage coming on the way back. Yep. So all the units are going to come in. The nice thing here is that the Sill is like going to die, and that's going to get us a card and get us a Vampire Bat. I don't know. It doesn't. It might not be enough here, but the Vampire Bat's a big deal. Yeah, I mean... Oh, well, it, oh, this could be very clever. If you just block with the Hidden Road Smuggler, you don't need to kill Sill and get, give them the bat. Or the card. Because you're going to go up to six here. Thanks to the 2-2 two -two Lifesteal block. This yeah, is a very clever play. But Tazboo's six, right? Tazboo's six. The Hidden Road Smuggler's chumping Tazboo. Oh, yeah, Sill's yeah, gonna yeah. going to get through, yeah. bring him down to one... This yep. is a this is a great play by by almost here. Sorry, Assuming thought, there's no nightfall in the market here for Killer King. I thought you were <laughs> suggesting the uh, the other way around. The other way around. No, yeah. no, no. All right. So they go for the shadow etchings. There's the freeze out, and this should lock it up for almost. They let themselves get all the way down to a point, and now it's going to pass back to them. They're going to send all the strangers in, and the triumphant stranger lives up to his name, sending almost into our top 16. Whew. Strangers. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Five faction of them. Five. All of them. All of them. And some random ones, too. So that was the last game of the round. And so if you're at home and you're like, wow, that was really cool watching that five faction stranger deck. I have a feeling I know where we want to start next round. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get a little more stranger action going, I think. All right. Yeah. So that's going to do it for the round of 32. We're going to take a few minute break and we'll be back with the round of 16 here at the throne open. Stay tuned. We'll see you in a few. So you make it to the top 64 and uh, now it's like, oh, and so, you know, you mentioned maybe you're not the the heaviest draft player in the world that's maybe not your first format but now you're in the top 64 what's yeah. sort of your mindset like going coming out of saturday knowing the next day you're going to have a chance to play in a single elimination tournament where the end point is you win thousands of dollars and you can make it to the world championships well this is the first time i got to uh i got to draft um in an open in in the top 64 setting it's really fun like uh, you get to you you know you got to have if you have a second monitor, like uh, uh, I mean, uh, some people don't have second monitor. Some people uh, use a uh, use mobile and whatnot. But if you do have a second monitor, uh, having having uh, your your opponent's deck or at least their their pool, you you, you kind of figure it out beforehand. Like you have like five minutes or something to fi figure out what they did. Uh, but uh, you have it open on your screen, and you can figure out every single trick, every single every single stealth unit they have, and uh, that that that's something that. Um, Perhaps, I mean, I don't know how much of an advantage it is, but I do have a lot of experience in open, uh, open deck list formats. With stealth units, you know, the, the range of what they could have is definitely smaller when you know, you don't know their deck list, but you know the full, um, you know, the fullest of cards that they drafted once you get to that top 64 stage. And the reason why we did that, of course, is so that for the players who were playing on stream or were drafting on camera, uh, during the event that they weren't at a disadvantage where their opponents would know more about what they had than the other way around. When it comes to stealth units, did it make you want to try to draft like a lot of stealth units so they would have fewer idea of what was coming? Or did it make you maybe want to avoid it because you know you couldn't as much get the surprise? Um, I don't think it changed my ordering that much. I, I guess it kind of did because I didn't draft Primal, right? Primal it has the... Uh, uh, that's that's the the main focus of uh, of primal and and of course time right T the time t the time primal the elysian combination is mostly a, a stealth based combination and so i wasn't really looking to draft that but it definitely gave me a huge advantage like th there there's for example uh the mayblof botanist is certainly a lot easier if you, if you know that that's their only stealth unit or <laughs> it's it's one of their two stealth units or something like that you 
and you have a topple, for example, in hand. If you saw on on the broadcast, I did have a topple in hand, and my opponent had a had a Mavelof botanist, and I knew it was a Mavelof botanist because you can target with the topple, and you don't have to actually you don't have to actually use the topple. You just know you if you can't target it with the with the Mavelof botanist with the topple, then you know that it's less than your units, right? So uh, it it's a hundred percent a Mavelof botanist, and I was able to take a. a a, a, what would seem like a risky block, but no, it it, it was not ri risky at all, right? Did you have any close calls in those first three matches in the top 64 run? Obviously, you won all six on the day, but were there any nail biters? My round against a, a rank uh, 13, a teammate, um, uh, th those games were long and grindy. Um, those games were long and grindy, and their deck was very good. So I, it, it felt like I was in control for most of those games. Uh, but um, I think that was probably the the closest match of the uh, of the top 64. So you get through the first three rounds on Sunday. That means you're in the top eight. You you're going to be getting cash prizes, but certainly your run's not done there. Now you've got to draft another deck. What was it like for you in that next draft? Did it was it was it smooth sailing? And where did you end up? Oh my, <laughs> that was smooth sailing. I can tell you that. I, I opened up an Azrog and um, I didn't relent from there. And actually it wasn't, the, the deck was strong, especially with the Azrog uh, for, for the first three packs, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't quite what it became because then I opened up uh, two Orin Jailers and the Manacles. And um, that, that's when uh, I, I, knew, I knew that I would probably have the best deck in, in, in the field. I just had to, uh, I, had to, I had to use the deck and actually win with it, right? Do you remember what your reaction was like when you sort of realized you had it locked up in that finals? Um, I, I think I, I, I live in a, a, ba a basement in a residential area and I I think somebody may have heard my uh, yell <laughs> outside. <laughs> yeah, I, I was pretty happy about it. I mean, obviously, I knew I, I I didn't know I had locked it up until the end, but like I mean, it, it was looking pretty good. It was looking like there, uh, all I needed was a top deck sigil, right? And uh, I, I won that game. Anytime you're in that spot where it's like, well, if I draw a sigil, my turn's really good. But if I also draw a non sigil, I'm probably drawing something pretty good. That's uh, that's a pretty nice spot you've gotten yourself into. All right, here we are, back for another round, round of 16. This to me is like the first like truly high stakes round of the day just because once you get to the top eight, we are playing a cash tournament 
and it out. and that's where the five thousand dollar cash prize pool starts kicking in is once you're in that top eight and mm -hmm. that's what the players are going to be playing for this round uh for this round we're going to be checking out almost and their innovative take on five faction strangers they've got a lot of different pieces going on a lot of what's built around it are these triumphant strangers these five faction strangers that go and get more create more ones from their deck they got reunites and traverse farms to help find them but then it's all the other like pieces. What are they doing with the market? What are they doing with the kilos? All of these things that we're going to be watching over the course of this next match. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just ready to get in. Uh, we gotta get in. We gotta get in. We gotta get in. It's the money round. Yeah. It's gonna be a lot of uh, maybe some some pretty uh, random spikes going on. <laughs> just some salivating. We gotta get down. We gotta get yeah, down. Yeah, and I mean. You know, the, the thing that we always like to talk about with the random stuff is, you know, obviously people, want, when they play a game like this, is they want to feel like their decisions are mattering and the choices that they do actually affect the outcome of the game. And so and when you see a card that's like make a random stranger and that's what's going on, it could feel, wait, this is just what's determining it. But as we saw in that last game and as we'll see coming up, there's a lot of strangers. They give you a lot of abilities. And you don't know if you get the flying stranger. All of a sudden, that becomes your game plan. You no longer need to worry about the aspect of how am I going to get my strangers through while I have this one. But now I need to start thinking about how do I keep myself alive? Because now I have inevitability. Um, I'm a big believer in that. Um, n this is not to defend every execution of randomness. I think some are better than others. Whatever, of course. Yeah. Uh, skill is not memorizing a list. <laughs> there is a lot of skill in being uh, uh, encountered with novel decisions of to win this game, I need to hit Stranger X. How can I maintain my board such that I give myself that 1 in 30 shot of spiking it? Like that's actually like 3% win equity picking up in those spots is huge, adds up over time. So yeah, there's some, there's some spikes, there's some moments of it being like. But also, uh, you got to pay a pretty – Big cost to get <laughs> to give this situation to a bird in the oh, first yeah. place. It's not like uh, we're just giving you that on the house either. So yeah, five yeah. factions. They're gonna be working for it. We'll see. They're gonna be up against Gurge PM. They're playing Stone Scar. It'll be mm. fun. We got to see a lot of them so far. But yeah, if improv improvisation wasn't a skill, they wouldn't have had Wayne Brady on whose line is it anyway each week. They would have just invited someone random up from the audience to do it instead. Hi, M missed one hundred percent of that reference. <laughs> 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 Improv comedy, it's fun. Catch it out sometimes. Okay. You, you're pretty good at it, so you might enjoy seeing some other people do it. As for this match, we got Gerg APM versus Almost here. And, uh, yep, we got Almost <laughs> at the bottom of the screen. Uh, they got cards. Uh, you you got to hand it to them. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Someone has um, has done some crafting. <laughs> <laughs> this is so true. They, they played through the campaign, The Tale of Horace Traver, right, on yeah. sale in the store. <laughs> if you want some of the cards that they're yeah. playing with. Uh, at top of the screen, Gerg APM, Stone Scar, as a logistics expert, kicks things off. Plus one max power, no influence. You've really got to work for it in a five faction deck to be playing with a logistics expert. Open contract. <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> Just getting started. <laughs> All right. So we're going to see maybe Horace Traver himself selecting a like, one cost, one, one summon, gain an influence of your choice. And uh, yeah, they're pretty close to having all the factions. The Argentport banners three. Mm -hmm. The common cause is a fourth. Yeah. And then the Horace Traver gets in the fifth, but it's just a matter of which order we're going to do. And all these we things. have a, and we have a reduced triumph and stranger for our trouble too. So any, uh, undepleted power off the top if we're just rolling downhill. That's the big disadvantage with open contract. You fire that one off early, it could really hurt that you uh, cost reduce the rest of their deck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one's not that is not free by any stretch. Yeah, no, it costs it costs one. Especially if snapping it off on their one drop. Oh yeah. Whatever you play, dead on sight. <laughs> it could cost a unit that costs four, but you could also kill one drops. Yeah, a few more. All right, League Explorer now setting a depth charge, and we will be. Cracking in for two. Or almost next turn. Mm. Picking up another common cause. So that's power number four. We're all rolled up. Yeah. Is this Genev Merchant even get anything? It feels like you want to play it, but I think this might be a no-go on the summon. I, I don't know if that's necessarily true, because you can cash in your five that's not rolled up. Yeah, but the, I want two Triumphant Strangers, not just one. Uh, yeah, but the Merchant's also a, a hedge against the downside risk of bricking. Mm. I don't know. 
Yeah, I mean, ah, this is the thing close. you're talking about. Where it's like, do you want to win more or do you want to win? Right. It might be right to cash in Triumphant Stranger number two, but if you want to, and you don't know where the line is. No, I know where the line is. I'll tell you where, where the line is. Line is person I played this morning that was spamming emotes. I made sure to win more on them. <laughs> But, uh, you know, normally, as just a matter of course of trying to win the game, um, mm. yeah, I, I just try to win. <laughs> Edict of Makar, good against a unit with five factions. Why? Because it's definitely a justice or time unit. <laughs> <laughs> Next up, we got a Searing Strike here. Deal to silence the unit, and if you kill it, you get the power right back on the house. Triumphant Stranger. Gonna make a random one at end of turn. Who is it? It's a Legion Stranger. Sure. Get another time influence. <laughs> get another primal influence. You got a 2 2, free 2 2. That'll play. Nothing wrong with that. Trades with the League Explorer. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. It's all it's all house money. <laughs> all right, so now Gurge PM could have a big turn here with that Jack Mercenary Hunter, wiping out the Triumphant Stranger and maybe another unit. Could go face to get a treasure trove. Or we could use Edict of Makar. I think it's kind of baked in that this turn is going to involve killing Triumph and Stranger. It's really just a matter of how and with which cards. Yeah, I guess that there's the question of what's the value of your Blackhawk, war, your war leader here, because the major incentive to play um, the Edict is having the power left over to play that. I'm guessing the value of the war leader is low enough at that point at this point that it's better to do to ignore that and maybe even play on discarding that to Jack. If I may be so bold, I think it's going to be Jack. Like, definitely. Yeah. The thing that's going on right now is that is the Jack's second deal for going to be at the Elysian Stranger, or is it going to be at the face? Because if you go at face, you proc Jack's ability to give you a treasure trove when it hits the enemy player. Now, Gurg APM starting to run out of time on the turn, and it's going to be Jack. It's going to be the Fire Sigil, and it's going to be face. And so valuing the treasure trove higher than killing a 2-2. Two -two. Yeah, I think at this point, just the... Um the, the value of a replacement of any of Almost's units is so low that killing the second best thing is not as powerful as just having another card. So there we go with our friend Kilo, the Innovator, getting another Triumphant Stranger. Kilo searches for a unit with the same cost as the unit you sacrifice, plus one for each of its skills. And so by sacrificing the three cost Aegis Genev Merchant, we can search for a four cost unit, and now at home you're like, wait, isn't Triumphant Stranger a five cost unit normally? No. Well, normally yes. Yes, normally yes. Normally but. yes. The answer to my question is true, but you are right in that no, it's not a five cost unit. Open contract played earlier. Gurga APM did this to themselves in a sense. Yes. The, eventually the bill comes due. <laughs> you, can, you can push it back a little bit sometimes. All right, now the Edict of Makar is going to take out the second Triumphant Stranger, and Open Contract is going to kill Kilo. And now I would describe Olmest as uh, working with the scraps. Yeah, drawing heavy. A lot of really, a lot of potentially very good draws here, but um, yeah, now on empty. And uh, Kirk APM's leftovers here are not shabby. No, Bhutan is going to be a good one here at some point. A Felon Banner off the top for Olmost. And with an initiative sands in hand, I mean, I, I, I like the consistency that almost is able to do a very weird thing quickly in the game and follow up on it. But I, this does not feel like a deck that was built with um, the most staying power in mind. It, it, it's really going to, or at least it's not a very, um, it doesn't have a lot of medium draws. Yeah, you're really, pri I mean, you're really priced into drawing one of your card advantage engines. The yes. rest of this is just fluff and some amount of um, awkwardness with... Your uh, sigils ha is baked in, in my experience, playing with this sort of archetype. So you're really just leaning on uh, going off with some sort of card advantage. And then if your opponent's able to reliably break that up, it's really hard to go, just go pound for pound against a lot of these cards. All right, Bhutan imbuing the jack, absorbing its power and stats and killing something with less strength. In this case, that's the initiative of the sands. And now it's going to come in for five for almost... It's like it's tempting to double block and trade with the Bhutan, but when what that will mean is now the Jack won't be imbued and it'll start attacking and drawing treasure troves. So I think there's a strong incentive here on almost to potentially let this through. There's only so many times you could do that with a 7-5, and th for them it's just like, 
I need to eventually draw an answer for the jack. It might as well be now. Let's not take seven. Uh, I, I think that I would have gone with a no block there because I think you're basically just drawing a triumphant stranger to catch back up in this game. And I would want to have the most architecture possible. Huh? Well, how about logistics expert? Never mind. Amplify four. Look at the four five on almost. Never, never mind. All right. And now a League Explorer? That doesn't attack through the 4-5? or five. And all of a sudden, one of those units that we were like is so puny, the normal 0-1 League Explo um, Logistics Expert has grown up to be something that's dominating the Stone Scar player's board. Yeah, that's that's my bad. I had not considered that. That's, that definitely, when you, when you ha now have draw steps 5 through 8 to reward the play, that makes it a lot more compelling. I, my thinking was, well, if you're drawing to Triumphant Stranger basically as the only thing, you want to keep as much architecture in play as possible to grow things and have the Stranger Synergies manifest. But no, yeah, a 4 or 5 and, here plays. And and almost has some soft ways to get to Triumphant Stranger between Traverse Farm and uh, and the Reunites they might be playing with. So we'll see. For Gurge APM, there's two cards in hand. Do you fire off the Shakedown? This is not a fun spot to let somebody draw two before you even get a single card here. And yeah, I'm pretty nervous about firing this off from Gurge APM. What could have possibly, what could possibly be in hand that wasn't played? Yeah, that that, that would be a tough one to to figure out. Hi, and the uh, yeah, and now we see. All right, and by holding it, we did a better job of setting up our jack. You could do a play here of like attacking with a jack into the logistics expert, and now the second jack would be able to finish off finish off the 4-5. Yeah, and I mean, uh, Gurga APM almost had a, a, a profitable attack last turn with what's going on. Assuming Jek is the thing that gets blocked here, it's like, okay, well, you get a depth charge, your your Black All War Leader connects. It's like, it was almost good enough to do last turn in my mind. Uh, certainly a Jek off the top and the ability to finish off after combat makes it um, the extremely appealing. Now, if almost can sniff out what's going on here, I think you chump the Jek and block the 4-5 onto the Black Hole War Leader. It's a tough play to make, but that's going to work out a lot better than what will happen here, uh, which is the Black Hole War Leader gets through, and now the Jack's going to kill the 4-5. I, I guess the problem with, with sniffing it out or whatever is yeah. Gurga APM, in my mind, almost has an attack that's ready to go as is. Right. So you uh, you had to put it as part of the range there. Um, Gurga APM has nothing. And what's your block look like if you assume that's part of it? I think it's what almost did. So. And that is what a high-level player does in that spot. The more the attack looks normal, the less likely you think there is that there's some sort of trick or extra damage loaded up in hand. Right. You can still play around it. It can still be part of the thing you're thinking about. But uh, Kirk APM's attack was almost, in my opinion, right on the line the last turn. So it, it could be a pretty innocuous card that would tip it over. Like, even just a follow-up unit makes you maybe yes. willing to throw away a jack in that spot. And in which case, just eat the biggest thing, right. which is what almost did. They did pick up a, f a Blight Pass Smuggler, though. That's going to be a great pickup as a 1-4 that can also go into the market. This is like getting two pieces of action out of one card. It's going to get a hmm. Triumphant Stranger put back earlier in the game, and now Ooh. that gets a Strange Blacksmith. Looks like a Torch, though, could take out one of these Strangers. Dude, that Strange Blacksmith has got an amazing ability. It's I think it's pay 8 to deal 3 and gain 3 armor or anything. And so, yes, I know why Gurg APM is going to kill the Triumphant Stranger. But keep in mind that that Strange Blacksmith could turn on in a big way in the next few turns. Yep. And I mean, I, I think that Gurg APM kind of doesn't really have an attack here that looks good. The problem now is the uh, the Merchant there lines up so well with the War Leader that the, the remainder of the attack is just not that strong. And if you're Greg APM, you absolutely cannot fire off Shakedown because while that Strange Blacksmith is out, every draw for almost is good. Getting more power is going to be great and getting more action is going to be great. And I really don't want to make it night Nightfall until I can deal with that Strange Blacksmith. Yeah, I think it's 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 way too risky here to just give almost just two, two clean shots. All right, there's power number seven. If you're almost, it might hurt your ability to have a Smuggler or Merchant top deck next turn. But if you don't play this and you top deck another power, you won't have the strange blacksmith online. They're really thinking about it, though. It it it's gonna it and it's rough because if you play this out and then you top deck a merchant, now all of a sudden the shakedown can get something, assuming you don't just play it out and hold it. Right. 
So a lot of ways this game could go. There's also just the, if you if you think Gurkha APM's right on the line of being able to attack or can with one draw step, and in the event that happens, you have to chump block with the initiative of the Sands, now you're so far away. Um, that, I mean, it's a really, that plays super close for all the reasons you're mentioning. But I think that if you had um, just six power, just all from sigils, that's a different conversation than uh, initiative of the Sands is part of what's going on. Those are some draws. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the learned er er imitator we're still a little bit away from. Um, that's going to be a uh, five primal influence, and we're at three right now. Though the Felm banner gets us one closer, and meanwhile the Traverse Farm can reunite to find us a, a stranger, which I think we're going to need to do here. Could be something else. We'll see. Yep, so s <laughs> few options here. Unity within is one of the agenda modes on this. You would give one of your units plus one, plus one, and all the units that share a type that. We're just going to see a reunite, and all the open contracts have now paid off. Super cheap Triumphant Stranger. Gonna immediately get a Shavka Ooh! Stranger. Hoodle Alley. That's, uh, <laughs> that's a big one. And for Gurg APM, Nightfall um, went a little bit worse for them. They had a worse night. No, the, uh, the uh, a nightmare. <laughs> and uh, that, that's that. I mean, if Gurg APM could dig themselves out of that last turn cycle going that poorly, I will be amazed. Yeah, and uh, Gurg APM's not gonna have a whole lot of time here either. No, as part of this. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I don't even see any plays that look even medium to me. For you, them, I mean, other than just pass the turn. <laughs> yeah, it, it's you. You just got to get him into some sort of range where, um, like League Explorers and and torches can maybe finish the game out. But almost is going to be able to pivot into lethal really quickly. That's, That's part true. of what's going on here. Yeah, I guess the reality is is that the one decision that Gurg APM had was do I attack with League Explorer and set a depth charge and just throw this away for that relic. Yeah. Um, and they chose not to, but it certainly would have been reasonable now, is we're going to see that strange blacksmith picking up three armor, exhausting itself, and dealing three damage to an enemy. Shavka Stranger coming in. When uh, when Shavka Stranger attacks, we're going to gain some power for each of our strangers. Oh, I don't... Yeah, I can't. Yeah, I'm pretty sure now with, you know, pulling up to uh, Virtual 9 plus the League Explorers no, no longer able to be cashed in. This is just... Uh, we're in garbage time now. There we go, the Shopka Stranger powering us up to five power. Chumped by Jack. Now, still, we've gotten up to five primal influence now. Learned Dermitator is going to transform herself into Bereaved Stranger. That's the Lifesteal Stranger. A Ruthless Stranger off the top will deal three. Your gay PM has found the concede button, and uh, let's start that one. Let's start this Tap over out. with game number Tap two. Out. I'm on. Yeah, that's enough. I've, I've had enough. I mean, so let, let's kind of like recap that game for a moment. So mm -hmm. first, so here's act one of the game. Almost starts off the game and manages to get out a couple of triumphant strangers, and then they get killed. And now all of a sudden we're in the spot for almost where it's like their board is like a Legion Stranger, 1-1 one, one Horus Traver, and like a 2-3 Aegis up against some real premium Stone Scar units. A dog a dog to win a draft game. <laughs> like it, Big it dog. Just, yeah, big dog to beat like a 3-3 a, a three, three flyer. <laughs> but they manage to keep themselves alive. The Fountain Smuggler eventually sort of gets them back into it by getting the Triumphant Stranger, which now really starts to pull things ahead. And then once things start getting rolling for too many turns with Triumphant Stranger, you have to be playing with some really big cards. We're talking like the Harsh Rules, those sorts of things which can pull you back from the brink. And the Stone Scar deck is great in a lot of ways, but it's not about that kind of a game. What we saw there was almost very effectively basically a lot of ways to uh, loop or reestablish Triumphant Stranger. And then just a lot of Garbo mucking up the, the, the board to give time. And, I mean, once the, the cards are all, like, kind of funny and innocent, not necessarily that powerful, but um, 
if Triumphant Stranger goes unchecked for any amount of time, then it's it, it's the advantage is so likely to be overwhelming if you don't have any sort of sweeper. And, um, you know, uh, almost bought a lot of time, a little bit behind on the table, not dramatically so, but, you know, like double blocks and stuff like that just to buy time uh, until Triumphant Stranger could get reestablished. Shakedown's going to take away the Corendon Merchant, and for almost this game, this is going to be a, a sort of a test of their ability to play catch up as they have just no cheap plays. Gurge PM is on the play. They're going to throw out one threat here, and then we're going to get a bunch more in the next few turns. And almost is just going to be struggling to make plays to catch up in this game for a while now. Yeah, this is going to be really tough. And I mean, the, having the open contract ready to manage a big play rather than just snapping it off on the first turn on something that's that's ramping your power. Um, I mean, th this just has the, the, the lookings that Kirk APM's just individually good cards are going to be um, too fast uh, for almost to manifest their synergies. Yeah, and there's going to be a Milos attack, throwing in a Firebomb. Black Hole Warrior Leader is growing up big and strong. And so we're going to get to see almost make a play here in the form of Common Cause and to Blade Pass Smuggler. The question is... Do they have anything in the market that can get them out of this? Because you're going to need something pretty great. You're going to, I mean, you need to have a good play for turn four. I mean, you, the, 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 the problem is right now, that site doesn't get you anywhere. It just gets run down and doesn't impact the table whatsoever. If you find a credible play for turn four, you can block and take some hits here, but it's not necessarily the end of the world if, if Gurgi APM doesn't have a good follow up. And then, oh. um, ooh. Yeah. Last chance, okay. I mean, that yeah. that does something. Because here's another thing to watch out for for almost. Um, there's no guarantee the Triumphant Stranger is coming out on turn five. First of all, you might be dead. Not, I mean, maybe. But even if you aren't dead, those are banners. And I, I think we're going to see all the units go away. And so that power might not be undepleted. Yep. So once again, a big nightfall moment here for almost. Traverse Farms, Meditative Stranger. <laughs> All right, we're going to be going to game three here in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> you don't get to take off that many turns against Stone Scar Aggro and live to tell the tale, but you might get to play a third game, which almost we get to do since they took down game number one. Firebomb. Can we get a firebomb here? No. Traverse Farms could come down and <laughs> reunite for... A zero-cost stranger, which kills all enemy units, which has summon kill all enemy units, but card hasn't been made Not quite yet. yet. Yeah, We're, we got to wait for the next um, fan-submitted design <laughs> to be able to get that one in there. All right, so we're heading back <laughs> to the booth here. Um, that was um, that's what it looks like when the triumphant stranger strategy doesn't work out because it's a five-cost unit. You built your whole game plan yeah. around and maybe your opponent's trying to kill you before that happens yeah sometimes you just draw a lot of the cards that you chose to play with and that can be a good thing or a bad thing <laughs> and that time it was a bad thing <laughs> first game was a good thing they yeah. were great they were great those cards were great that game not so much yeah and i mean we saw the uh it's nice that they have a bunch of merchants and uh and cheap units that can sometimes turn on the banners you know playing a five faction deck it's there's no, it's not trivial that you're just going to get undepleted power when you choose basically to not play with sigils mm -hmm. and not stick to maybe two factions. How you manage that is sort of up to you. And in this case, it, it sort of means it's going bad in two directions. The power is depleted and you don't have any units. So what does a mulligan look like for this stranger deck? I guess if you, if you don't have five power, that's got, I'm uh, sorry, five uh, if you're tight on sigils and the pit distribution doesn't get you to all five, then I think you gotta go. That's gotta go back. Yeah, and this is um, this is not great. I would say for for almost. No, nah, this is. I mean, your your Horus Traver gets you to a time uh, influence, and then you can play your initiate, and then you have uh, the farm on turn three. Yes, the farm on turn three part is great. I was. It caught my eye, let's just say, that Learned Imitator is a little far away from being playable in this game. I'm just, uh, this, this, I'm sure the Stranger deck gets some ugly six card hands. <laughs> if there's like a plausible, okay, I, you know, I can kind of. You, you don't need to use all the cards you draw in the game to win. <laughs> <laughs> there's no rule. No, there's not a rule, but no, this, it's, this, it's easier. This looks like a good, this looks good to me. Yeah. 
No, yeah, the the, the Traverse Farm's gonna be good. And I and Gurg APM is not well set up to handle a Triumphant Stranger this game. They do not Ooh. have removal that deals with it. They don't have a market card which gets a card that deals with it directly. And so yeah, when the Traverse Farm just comes down and goes and finds Triumphant Stranger, it, it, as of right now it looks like it might stick. Um, but for the moment we're gonna be, you know, well we picked up a Winchest merchant that could use the learned imitator in the future, but for now it's let's keep it simple. Let's go to the deck and get triumphant stranger with that reunite <laughs> this is funny so normally open contract can't kill triumphant stranger and we've talked about this right five cost unit kills four or less the traverse farm makes your strangers yeah. cost one less and that sometimes is a good thing it's merge we call that emergent gameplay oh yeah um, oh yeah didn't plan on it but it happened so we're going to have three coming across just to the... F Ooh, Gurg APMs ignoring uh, the farm. I'm a little surprised. You, The farm at the end also spits out a Triumphant Stranger, funny enough. It doesn't feel like you can ignore that eventually, but maybe you can one-shot that with a Champion of Chaos, and I, that's the idea. I don't know. It makes me nervous when you have Overwhelm units of, like... It, it, it's not a binary, right? Like, the incremental points matter a lot when it's possible. It, yeah. The overwhelm will prevent almost from blocking to ser to save the farm. Uh, it was, it's, uh, well, if you send one thing this turn, maybe you don't kill it. But if you send two things next turn, maybe it's like a lock. And so that opens things up. You can't split your attacks between site and player. But regardless, we'll see how it plays out for almost... They've gotten down their mighty five faction triumphant stranger. They're going to pass the turn here in a moment and we'll see what he's got cooked up for us. It's going to be another strange burglar. And for Gurg APM, that one could be pretty great um, or pretty tough to beat, I should say, because it's got an ability to sack um, units to draw cards. And yeah, you might be able to find a way to sack that one one horse traver to draw cards. You might find the strength to do that. We're just going face here. Well, I mean, th th this is, uh, th you know, in poker terms, this is the C bet, right? Like, you already are kind of priced in from the line you took from the last turn. Yeah. Just blocking everything down now. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and Annihilate can break this up if you want. Yeah, but, yeah, that's fine from Almost's perspective. I mean, it's just an issue of, um, like, making Gurga APM have to generate these sort of like modest trades or whatever when you have this like just implied massive card advantage engine ready to go. Sure. All right. So for the Skullbreaker, it's going to be a double block. And some overwhelm damage is going to get through on all of these blocks, dropping almost down to 17. And another Champion of Chaos is the follow-up for almost now. They got nothing to do with their site, but here's the problem for Gurg APM. The, basically, all that almost has to do is fade one more attack, and the farm gets them the goods once ag again as it's completed its agenda. Yeah. And I guess it's not clear exactly what that would look like in terms of what almost needs to do with their market. By having Deadly and Overwhelm, it, it's not trivial to stop the Champion of Chaos next turn from killing the site. But if they've got a good market card, Collapse, yeah, you could do this. So Felon Val is going to come down, give them the power, and now discard to Collapse. Very versatile um, spell. Kills kills a lot of things at the cost of two and fast, and you have to discard a card. Yep. But, I mean, again, it's now uh, the balls in Gurga APM's court to do something like now, and it's just asking a ton to be able to, uh, to, to banish the site from the spot. And this is where, you know, sometimes you get a nice advantage if you're a player like almost and you bring maybe an unconventional deck. Now, Gurg APM seen all these cards before, a veteran of the game, but maybe not in this package. And maybe this is, you know, you might be the case where if we were to talk to him after the game, he might come to the conclusion, I wish I had done those earlier decks differently. Or maybe he had a game plan and he was happy with it, and this is just the cost of doing business. But um, certainly it's been an interesting one to watch as now another Triumphant Stranger gets us that Cult Stranger... We are not going to be able to kill it with Jack. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, and I mean, this is really... Um, uh, what we've seen out of the Stranger deck is uh, once Gurga APM is kind of swimming upstream, they're not they're not running downhill. Um, not only is 
Triumph and Strange are kind of this like pass fail test. If you if you yeah. can't kill it, the, the advantage is overwhelming. Um, there's so many ways for almost to to reestablish it. And so you know, at 17, it's like okay. Well, and, and the details really do matter because like right like. You know, spending your whole turn and playing, you know, a Traverse Farm reuniting and then the Traverse Farm just getting wiped off the map is one thing versus, like, literally top-decking another copy, and it means the next copy is happening very immediately. Right. So we're going to see both of those units wiped out thanks to the Jack. At this point, yeah, the farm's business is basically done. It does make all strangers cost one less, but you can probably live with that. And now we see a bereaved Ooh. stranger. 4-4, four, four, Life Stealer. See a passing of the turn, maybe a little attack. Nah. I, I, well, well, do you want to block? Yeah, I guess if you're never blocking. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I understand it's not a thing. No, no, no that, that's yeah. that's that's my life. That's you. Yeah. That's you. No blocks. No blocks. A unit that says it can't block doesn't have much. Doesn't. It's not like a drawback because I wasn't gonna. What am, what am I at? Is it any amount? No, nah, they're going to play it very safe. I kind of like the attack. You pick up some extra points. Man, Makar Stranger is um, a good a good one. <laughs> Steal the top card of the enemy deck when you play a stranger, and when you attack, kill a non-stranger. Now, that's probably just going to get dealt with by Jack. The Sigil was a big, 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 big pickup here, as it's going to maybe be able to wipe out both Triumphant Stranger and Makar Stranger. So, um, yeah, I mean, this is honestly for a couple turns now, Gurg APM's best draw has been Sigil, and they finally got it. Oh, okay. So they're actually just going to kill the other two because those are the two best blockers. I think yep. Gurg APM's play is 100% right. Yeah, I, you, uh, you can't just like play a bunch of turns from a neutral spot. You got to shut this, you got to shut this down before, uh, almost is able to reestablish, I think. Because, like, they don't have a block, and if they attack with Makar Stranger to kill one of your units, Oh, well. <laughs> like, right. Not like any of Gurg APM's individual units are that valuable. But the fact that there's four of them right now is re almost is really feeling it. All right. Treasure trove for Gurg APM. We're going to hold on to that Makar Stranger, and here's a big moment. Almost has found a smuggler. It's so one four, and almost has been sandbagging cards for a very long time uh, to position themselves to be able to make use of a smuggler or a, or a merchant. And so from previous game, we know that they have a last chance in the market, and so that could be the turn. It could be blade pass smuggler, last chance sigil, play the um, and play out the the triumphant stranger you draw from the void. But we'll see if they have a better path than that. It's going to be the last chance. Guess they're not getting the Triumphant Stranger. Wow, so they're gonna go for the Bereaved Stranger. And what this lets them do is if they get to put the Sigil back into the market, they get to steal another card. They get to attack with Makar Stranger with Lifesteal, kill the Jack. And I gotta say, you know, at the time, I really liked Gurg APM's play, but now it's starting to swing back the other way. Yeah. They picked up a Milos. The Milos is gonna be a huge complication for, uh, for almost. With uh, it's a five five already, and whenever the enemy player gains health, it gets plus one plus one. So watch out for that. I mean, all, uh, almost fortunately for them, I think the the open contract here is going to be a, a really huge help. If Gurg APM makes some uh, push attack here under the logic that the even if almost gets to swallow up and gain a little bit with the four four, then I'm at least getting a little bit of uh, size on the way back from my trouble. Um, that gets blown up pretty badly here by uh, just a removal spell on the way back. This game is uh, what we professional uh, game designers like to call close, very close. This is a uh, this is fairly close right now. Now Milos, the rebel bomber himself is going to be leading an attack of all but up oh, Jack's coming along too. And this is not going to be a trivial set of blocks for almost to navigate here. Yeah, I mean I can't imagine giving up the uh life steal stranger. I think yeah. they just got to go in front of um the 3-2 and 
You can yeah, you know what? Maybe Jack, you didn't want to attack with Jack. Jack's the only one it can eat. Yeah. So this that's an interesting factor here. If you don't attack with Jack, the only way the Brave Stranger can get in combat and gain four health is by actually trading with something. Yeah. But now this opens things up in a really, I think, good way for almost where I think they're going to find a path to survive this attack. And next turn, they're going to have another Makar Stranger lifesteal attack, and that's going to be very impactful. Yeah, I'm guessing from Gurg APM's perspective, the sending in Jack is motivated by, like, even if I offer up that block, mm. uh, you know, whatever, then I get a little, uh, a little size here, and that's really valuable the next turn, but not factoring in like the possibility of open contract because it's not like the stranger deck plays removal right it had to come off of your deck exactly for this, for this it's going to gonna be very unusual that this milos grew so large in some ways gurg apm was thinking leaving that 4-4 life serial around was almost a positive yeah well i guess the makar stranger always could kill it too so that is one thing there and now we see almost has gained a ton of health back they're going to get to open contract the black hole war leader we're down to a Skullbreaker. We find a League Explorer off the top. It's going to be a Treasure Trove that finds another League Explorer. But you, I think you're going to have to start leaving some stuff back. We can't allow the Makar Stranger attacks to keep happening, can we? Y yeah, you gotta you got to put a pin in it at some point. You can't. Like, how many units right. going to kill? It's already killed two. The third one's going to be a lot. <laughs> I guess the Skullbreaker is you hope that they don't draw removal, so you might as well get this attack in. The Skullbreaker notably has deadly, but only on your turn, only yep. as an attacker. So it doesn't actually like line up and let it trade with, say, the Breeze Stranger. But no, Gurg APM is uh, going to go. I guess I just don't see how this leads to victory. I'm not comfortable with either path, to be honest, so I can't say I'm loving either direction, but... Yep, we're going to see drop down, and then the depth charges will fire off, go down to five. But this turn's going to be really good for almost. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of one of those damned if you do, damned if you don't. I, I guess the play that Gurga made, APM made is, like, there's more likely to be a mistake for almost to make. Mm. There's a mistake or a misclick that at least can now be part of the range, whereas sitting, sitting back on D, it's you're just, like, you're just doomed. There's just no getting out. Yep. But, yeah. All roads probably lead to a loss, but I think that's the, I think that's the best you can do here. Brandon Merchant gets into the market, picks up Kilo Bold Innovator, but for now we're gonna see another Double Stranger attack. Not sure which of these units we'll see Makar Stranger pick off. I I think I'm imagining a League Explorer. It just seems like the one that's m more capable of pushing damage, and yeah, almost agrees. Yeah, unless there's some big pump spell in Gurg APM's deck, I don't, I don't think it's that close. All right, so some of the madness is going to come to an end here in the sense that Open Contract will be able to kill either of the strangers thanks to the cost reduction from Traverse Farm. The problem on the other side is Kilo is going to be a big issue, and it's going to do big things for almost in future turns. And, it, you, you know, sometimes you have the luxury of being like, well, I'll solve one problem today and then another problem tomorrow. The problem is Kilo kind of has a tendency to create a problem per turn. Well, also, Gurg APM is at um, is at five, and so if you if you uh, kill the four two, now the four four just has to be blocked every turn. It's almost like it's just becoming another copy of the thing you just killed. Yep, triumphant stranger off the top for almost, and not sure if we'll see a literal check mark this turn, but I think this is this is going to be the last turn that there was any hope for Gurg APM once we're through the end of it. Yeah, I mean, you send in everything. That that uh, knocks Kirk APM down to. If you assume, you know, you you shoot something and the remaining unit blocks the four two, then you go down to two. Triumphant Stranger is a unit. It generates another unit. What are you drawing to that's like worth enough to keep playing? <laughs> Shakedown off the top could uh, could allow the last point to come through. If we were to get Gurg APM down to one through a Nightfall kill, that one point of damage when they draw an extra card will uh, will do it. But for now, we're going to see Kilo sacrifice the Corendon Merchant, go and get Meditative Stranger. Doing a little bit of turtling up here, maybe with some Aegis, and can play it real nice and easy here. Makar Stranger is going to kill one, probably trade with the other. Triumphant Stranger will keep our board restocked. A Strange Rider now. 
Hopefully not finding any relics for us, but that's okay. Stone Scar Painting is going to do it here for Gurge APM. Is they're going to drop this in a very back and forth three game set here against almost with their five faction stranger deck. And I mean, Stone Scar definitely uh, a deck that we talked about as being a deck to beat this weekend, but I really liked the way that what I saw from almost in terms of how it matched up. Uh, I mean, you could abstractly like what, what's one of the worst things that you can have for a deck like strangers and it's like pressure plus removal, right? You're like on top of them, you're, you're just, you're sort of disrupting them. And even if they happen to sneak out, something meaningful then you have a removal spell for the thing and uh almost was able to slog through like some good draws i mean uh gregory apm's hand in game number three was like all action oh yeah like five power at the end of the game or something like that and just uh yeah uh, there's a lot of burden to get on top of the game as we saw the, the game that gregory apm won was like running downhill right away kill everything kill you super fast uh, but the games that got dragged out, even when Gurgur EPM had interaction, like had removal, had uh, units that were the biggest thing, or had activated powers that were able to kill things, um, just reestablishing Triumphant Stranger was enough to just, all right, here's another wave. You got you can only land that punch so many times before you get overwhelmed. And um, very close third game. That was that was great. But uh, the end, Strangers. Now into the money round. Yeah, they're all they're one of the. 16 remaining decks, or 8 remaining decks, I should mm -hmm. say, as this was the round of 16. Um, as you may have suspected, since we didn't jump right into another game, as we saw, you know, a, a little bit of a protracted back-and-forth three-game affair. That was actually the first match we saw this round, but it's also going to be the last one, as all of the other matches have already concluded. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be on our break here in just a moment, and we'll be back with the top eight here at the Throne Open. Um, and now we're going to start getting down to the, the nitty-gritty of figuring out sort of who's going to be just a few matches away at this point. It's just three more wins for any of our remaining players to be the champion of this Throne Open and book their seat at the World Championships. So a lot of action on the other side, and we'll be back in a few. All right, so let's let's take a step back now. So now you've you're qualified for worlds. Let's talk a little bit about how you got there. Do you sort of what what would you say was sort of your biggest level up moment? A moment when you realized you sort of had taken your game to another level because you know not every, nobody's born being a great player in anything. And so what sort of got you to this point? What was like a key moment for you along that journey? Sort of the 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 story I like to say is that uh. Um, Man US, who doesn't uh, doesn't stream the game anymore, but he used to. But if you recall, he was a he was a world competitor at some point, right? Um, mm -hmm. I I was you know memeing around and I was you know pl playing playing decks that weren't weren't necessarily great and wh whatnot, right? I I kind of knew that, but uh, Man US is the first one who's like, "You're good. Please play good decks. You know, please play good decks. Uh, you, you will you will definitely uh." uh you'll definitely get better at it. And uh, that's what, that's kind of what happened, right? You know, you, you start, you start putting more focus on competitive play in that way. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And you, if you, if all you're trying to do is, uh, is just have a good time, play, play whatever you want. But it, I had a similar wake up call in the past uh, <laughs> with a friend telling me, you know, like, aren't you trying to win this thing? Don't you want to win? And I was like, well, yeah. Then why don't you try playing the deck you think is actually the best? It's like, oh, it seems kind of obvious and fun, but it, you know, it, when you're just trying to enjoy yourself, it can be easy to talk yourself into playing the meme deck. Yeah, if if the deck isn't like, if the best deck, if you if you determine what the best deck is, and it's like, you know, let's say thirty percent of the field, that maybe you can take a counter to it as of that point. But if it's you know fifteen percent of the field, probably just play the best deck. You know, right. Because even if your cards that. really line up well against them, well, you don't play against the fifteen percent of the field that often. You play against it, I think, about fifteen percent of the time. No. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that 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 would be me be my advice. Of course, everybody's everybody's going to determine what a, in a, in a wide meta, everybody's going to have a have a different idea what the best deck is. But as long as you think you know what the best deck is, like take that deck. Like don't 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 mess around with a, you know. <laughs> Going, going crazy with a uh, other decks. Although, 
now that I'm qualified for Worlds, we might we might see some uh, spicy action. <laughs> we might see some spicy action. Yeah, there's a thrown open. Well, going on right now, it's possible you you could be in the top 64. What do we think? Are are you, how me are you going to play in the thrown open that we're currently watching? And how meme is your deck going to be? I mean, there may be some kilos involved. There may be some kilos involved. There may be some kimonis involved. We'll see. Um, I I will be playing. Uh, well, I mean. Uh, in this thrown open that we're you guys are watching right now, I will be playing in it, uh, barring you know strange circumstances. For people at home who are interested in sort of getting better at the game, um, obviously it sounds like you've had success by going on Discord and getting connect with other players. But as far as sort of playing the game, do you have any advice for people in terms of how they use the removal, how they choose opening hands, anything? that you've picked up over the years that you think can help take somebody from their game where they're enjoying their time on ladder, but they're trying to become a more successful tournament player. I mean, there's, there's so many different things, you know, what, um, it's a, it's a minor thing, but it does get you focused, uh, like, um, uh, hiding, hiding pauses, um, uh, like what, um, what, what I was doing in the, in the tournament, um, <laughs> it, uh, you, Go watch the vod. You can see, you know, I I play I, I play only fire search because I knew that the only uh, the, the only trick I really had that would be worth hiding is a uh, is a is a finest tower in my deck, right? So that that that's what I would always always do. Um, things like that are fairly minor, fairly fairly minor, I think, but they do get you more focused in terms of uh, mulligan decisions, like. This mulligan system is very, very forgiving. The fact that it's two, three, four, and thirty-three percent, thirty-three percent, thirty-three percent, in terms of power, means that your second hand is most likely going to be, on average, better than your first hand. If if you if you're looking for uh, for cards, mulligan your first hand, and then probably keep the seven if you if it's reasonable. If if you if you ever need to get, uh, I, I'm, you know. 90% of my day right now because I'm unemployed, whatever, uh, is, is hung up. I hang out in the WSG Discord. And uh, if, you, if you need to, you know, if you need to talk to me, you know, one on one or any of the uh, really good top players, uh, you know, we're, you know, hanging out, hanging out in there. We don't necessarily just play Eternal, too. Like, you know, we, we hang out, uh, you know, to do do other things as well. Well, definitely, it sounds like they should look out for you on on Discord and um, and I I found that people people really get like getting asked to to give advice, uh, especially if it's within the context of like, hey, you're really good at something. How do I be good at it too? People really enjoy that, and I think people will uh, worry too often that oh, you're going to like take up this person's time, but. Honestly, people like people like telling you like why they think they're good at things. And so it sounds like uh, you would be open to it if people wanted to reach out to you. And that's uh, yeah. I, that's great. All right, time for a top eight here at Direwolf Digital. We got a thrown open this weekend and eight players remaining. We're going to find out this round who's going to be in our top four. You know, we, we like when we get down to these last couple rounds, there's always something extra on the line with each round. Once we get down to the top eight, if you make it to the top four, 
first of all, win a bunch of extra money. So mm-hmm. go wild with that. You don't need to tell us what you do with it. We prefer it be legal. But you again, you don't even need to tell us. Just have fun. <laughs> but the second more important part is that if you get two top four finishes in Opens this year, automatically qualified for the World Championships. And that's uh, that's always something to look out for for these players. We want to make sure that, you know, Everybody gets a chance to prove their skill. If you make it to multiple top fours, yeah, we think you might be one of the best players in the world. Yeah, these events are not uh, easy to make the top four of. Besides having to acquit yourself well in a single elimination tournament with some of the game's best players, qualifying for the first place through the the heats in in Friday and Saturday, not trivial. It's not like – all of our best players necessarily even get out of that round and are able to participate in this in the in the first place. So uh, we want to be able to reward consistency as well as top finishes. And so two top fours get you there. And for this round, we're going to be starting off with one of those best players in the world, Sunnyvale, frequent tournament competitor. I believe they have the record for the most top 64s lifetime in on these events. And for them this weekend, they've got her control or sorry, not who control, who Kira. We're going to be seeing um, them up against the Blasted or Man. We saw them earlier there on Sky Craig. And so, you know, a classic battle between sort of value Huru units like Kira Ascending, Rhyme Conclave Smuggler and the like, Hojin up against Champion of Fury and friends. And we're going to get the match started here right now with Sunnyvale at the bottom of your screen. Got a Jotun Hurler for some early interaction. Look at that. Kodash Evangel getting back into the mix. 2-2 Lifesteal. Not the best against a lot of decks, but you sure do like it against Skycry Gagro. And with a Pyro Knight kicking things off on the other side for Blasted or Man, we've got some strong early pressure here. Yeah, and a lack of undefeated Primal there on turn one, really bad for Sunnyvale. Now going to be playing catch up here, a little off tempo here with that snowball that otherwise could have handled the Pyro Knight. And now for Blasted or Man, it's going to be another one-two punch here of Torch plus Champion of Fury. Cracking in for another eight. Two depth charges on the other side. Sunnyvale, you got a big turn on the other side because you're going to need one. And I, I, I like, I think, what Valkyrie Enforcer is going to do here a lot. We're going to shrink down that Champion of Fury down to a 2-1. That'll make quite a bit of difference. Auto Tread, though, is going to be a great pickup here for Blasted or Man in terms of their ability to finish off the Valken Forcer. Yeah, the, this, that's a really good turn three there from Sunnyvale, and it, it, it sort of sequ- sets up a turn four of another three cost play plus a snowball. But will it be enough? The depth charges have really stacked up this game. I think we're up to three now at this point. They're hiding behind Blasted or Man's hand. We're going to see Auto Tread show up. Pitch the Pyro Knight, finish off the Valkyrie Enforcer. Depth charges away. And I think you can survive a turn if you Valkyrie Enforcer the Auto Tread and silence it. And Sunnyvale's an expert player. They don't even need me to explain any of this before they're doing it. And now Snowball the Pyro Knight. We are going to be on the absolute edge of death, but not dead. And League Explorer is going to push us over the edge. Yeah, <laughs> is it... What, what, what was the draw step? Was it anything at all? Okay. I mean, Sunnyvale did a really good job of giving themselves a shot there. But, um, yeah, just, again, that undeplete, that depleted Sigil on turn one. I think there was an extra probably six points of damage that that meant in terms of the Pyro not net dying and everything. And uh, uh, an extra six there would have been, meant quite a bit, I think. <laughs> yeah, a lot of small stuff there. I mean, the, uh, the auto-tread draw from Blasted or Man was the difference between that Valkyrie Enforcer just being a consistent presence and continuing to eat units versus it came down, it blocked and ate something, but then just died. Right, exactly. Yeah, and, and Sunnyvale really needed that um, that that Valkyrie Enforcer basically to get a second block in to be have a shot of stabilizing that game. So the, uh, the auto tread there, not quite as good as a draw as something like Torch or Permafrost, but was good enough given the early advantages that had already been generated. I do like uh, what Sunnyvale did this weekend by tuning their deck. I mean, when we're talking about uh, the Hurukira archetype, no, obviously it does like getting more Justice Influence, and, and Kodash Evangel is great for that. But from what we've seen this weekend, you know, making your 2-2s more like 2-2 Life Stealers as opposed to long game units is a, a pretty great spot to be. So here in game number two, this is what it looks like for Hurukira. This is just a very strong, long game, resilient, value kind of draw. 
will it be enough to hold up against the pressure of Skycrag? Yeah, the, the big thing that you would like to do as a uh, as the Huru player here is set up a spot where you can kind of you can make the the table a little bit clunky, a little bit unwieldy, and then your one cost tricks can do a lot of work inside of combat. Uh, as long as the table stays empty and the Blaster Man leverages all the one mana, one power cards and all the cheap stuff, then it's it's very very hard to uh, leverage those cheap tricks. All right, Ryan Conclave Smuggler. What do we got in the way of an anti-aggro market card here for this Huru Merchant? And it's going to be a Stormhold Knife. So once Sunnyvale gets below 10 health, that six cost five five relic weapon will be free on the house. That's not gonna happen this turn, yo, but another big attack dropping Sunnyvale down to 16. Rhyme Conclave Smuggler number two shows up. Do we have a second good anti aggro card? And uh, Trick Shot Ruffian, if we can. You, wow, look at this, Sunnyvale. Normally you hold this for a moment, instead they're gonna use it to just pop an Aegis, and that's a pretty clever play. You really get, when you watch Sunnyvale play, it's like this person knows how to play a turtle, because they make unintuitive plays extremely quickly. Right, yeah, yeah, that was just instant. Like, yeah, what else would you do this turn? It's like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what, you mean you don't use Trickshot Ruffian to, on your enemy units, and then as a defensive one-two body in spots where you really value tempo? <laughs> it's like, uh, no, no, I didn't I think about all that. No. Oh man, there's that Houndmaster. A lot of pressure coming Sunnyvale's way. <laughs> Do we have a third anti aggro card in the market for Sunnyvale here? I mean, we got to be really straining after what we saw <laughs> previous turn. I mean, it might just be like a bring to justice here, but that's not going to do a ton of work. It's going to silence and stun something. And a rebuke effect is great, but it's not maybe as much as you could ever hope for in this spot. And yeah, it'll be that bring to justice. You imagine you're, we are going to see it, in fact, on the Houndmaster. And now on the other side, how careful is Blaster Room going to be about the present, the possibility of Stormhold Knife? Because sometimes people in this spot will only attack for a little. But no, we're going to go all in. Yeah, I think I, I think Sunny Vale is probably just drawing too heavy to get that cute. And also, with, if the if you know Sunny Vale doesn't have any units, then uh, it basically the Stormhold Knife is just. just killing one thing it's just not the end of the world and now we see invasive species show up depth charge is going to go off we're going to pick up a justice sigil that silver blade intrusion isn't doing anything and a pretty fast uh beating there for the blasted room man on to sunnyvale uh that's going to do it for this weekend for sunnyvale but obviously we can expect to see them in any sort of lcq that we have given the strong track record of performance we've seen this year and from them in the past and uh, a, real, a really great run for them once again this weekend, getting to our top eight, getting into the money, but no further for now. And as for the Blast Order, man, they are now in our top four. That's the first of our final four. And we're going to try to jump into another match here and see who's going to be joining them. And sometimes it's it's the Razor's Edge right there. I think Sunny Vales it, it would be able to have won uh, the first game there with just undepleted Primal on the first turn. But that little hiccup there, uh, the Pyro Knight getting in hit after hit after hit that would have been prevented. Uh, I think that was a difference in game number one. All right, so we're going to be checking out John Julio. And, Tom, did you say they're still in game number one? Yeah. All right, so we're going to get almost okay. a full set another match here. Not a shocker after how fast that one went down. And we've got Hurukira, looks like, once again, up at the top and Stone Scar at the bottom. Looks like this one's been a little bit more of a back-and-forth affair. Ooh, we've got Pale Rider's timepiece at the bottom of the screen. That's a fun one. Haven't seen that card yet today. Six cost, four, four, flying, deadly, killer, lifesteal weapon. And it also has a spellcraft to play the witching hour. I can't remember how much it costs. I think it's like another eight or something, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's been a, yeah, it's I, been a I, minute. I, I would assume. It doesn't come up most, most games, let's say. And there we go with Koryva Palace. Withstand on two. The Valkyrie announcer building up a very nice flying endurance revenge unit. Meanwhile, for Avion, grabbing a champion of chaos, and this is tricky. They don't have an attack, I believe, that will kill the palace. It will just get it down to one, which is not zero. Yeah, I mean, well, if you send in everything, also, you're. Uh you are just um, dead on the way back, too. Or I guess you're not dead. It's 
it does look like we're basically dead. No well, I guess as long as you don't attack with Silver Blade Menace, you can maybe not die. Though, yeah. Is that even true? I don't. You Things have to go well, I think, for Avion not to die here in a way that I can't necessarily predict. Because the thing that we're really talking about, but haven't said, there's a good chance we'll see Sack the City played on from the site next turn, and that's going to give all of uh, John Julio's units Berserk. Mm -hmm. And then that Berserk attack by both the Flyers should be enough to get over the finish line, assuming none of them are lost in this upcoming combat. And yeah, Avion is making the attack with the Decay unit because it would at least shrink the bigger 7-7. Seven, seven. And if John Julio wants to go for it, they could play it safe in Wisdom of Elders, but they're going to go for it here. It looks like Sack the City, A space plus a second space to confirm the Berserk attack. Mm -hmm. And that is going to do it here for game number one. John Julio takes it down with Coryabot Palace powering up a Valkyrie Denouncer. So you get sometimes the biggest threat of the game is not always the biggest unit you put into your deck. That Valkyrie Denouncer came off a Silverblade Intrusion. It's kind of an inefficient unit. It's only a five cost three, three flyer, but you put a withstand on it, you give it Aegis, you give it Berserk, and now all of a sudden it's just ending the game. Yeah, there's um, there are a lot of units out there that are only plus four, plus four Aegis and Berserk away from playable. <laughs> you put that on a lot of units, you're gonna they're, they're going to start making a difference in some games, as yeah. we saw right there. Yep. <laughs> All right, so that was game one. We're one in that matchup, of course, and we're going to get to see the remaining two games here in just a moment. Uh, uh, yeah, Stone Scar versus Huru seems like a real matchup where a lot of the particulars are going to matter in terms of what kind of Stone Scar deck are you playing with, because in reality, there's a couple of ways you could approach it on the Stone Scar side. You got a lot of cheap removal. It's going to do a great job of picking off the Huru Kira's ability to get synergies from spells in their units. Mm -hmm. The other side of that, though, is you just do some attacking, and we saw that earlier with the Skycrag deck. The Huru deck looks a lot less impressive on the back foot. Yeah, it, it is It is trying to play foot forward. It is not great at, at blocking. And a lot of the, the best tricks that Huru has access to uh, just sort of involve, um, like, Aegis and the assumption that that's going to be uh, how you're – how you're generating this tempo advantage. If you can just beat them with size or, or battle skills, they're, they're not always that well equipped to play that sort of game as we just saw. Yeah. And if you go wide around them, I mean, it's like, yeah, my silver blade intrusion prevents the damage on one of my units. And it's like, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> that that's cool. I hit you with seven with my other three units. And that, that now no longer is that card so impactful in the game. It's not all about winning any given combat. It's just, What's the totality of the board like? Exactly, yeah. I mean, when you see Hura is strongest, typically it's you, you just see these one-cost card for three-cost card exchanges. Yep. When that's happening, that, that's where um, Hura is at its strongest, and the other player almost doesn't matter what cards they're playing with. Um, they can't really play catch-up. But if you're just able to go punch for punch on the table just with size, they're not always – not all these builds are that well-equipped to play that sort of game. All right. Up at the top of your screen, John Julio's got – a very solid looking draw there with two, three, and four drops, but they didn't like exactly the mix. So we're going to see that go back in favor of a very different style of hand, much, much different with Jotun Hurler and Maveloft Huntress, much more interaction focused. Do they like that? They do. Meanwhile, for our Stone Scar player on the play, Avion, they've got a two drop, they've got a three drop, they've got a removal, really everything you'd hope to see in an opening. And Sinister Rumors is tricky. I'm not sure that any of the modes are exactly what you want right now for Avion, but it offers so much flexibility. Maybe you want to keep it. But no, they're going to put it away and hope for maybe something a little more impactful early. Yeah, I, I like I like bonding that. I think there's a there's a burden here to um, get running downhill here a little bit and anything that's sort of a fidgety piece. Even if you're able to cash it in somewhere down the line, um, there's no promise it's going to be worth a card. We see that Pale Rider's timepiece once again. That was the card that never emerged in game number one. And you always got to be mindful when you play those more expensive cards. They've got so much impact. I mean, if Pale Rider's timepiece shows up in a game, it's going to become one of the most important cards played in the game. It's just not always going to even get a chance to in time. <laughs> we see a second one now. And interestingly, Avion's been uh, sandbagging this Akanta Ascending uh, for a moment anyway. Well, I think that, you know, the, the cat's out of the bag there, that there's a snowball in hand, so. 
trying to get it to up to a 4-3 uh, a before we get it into play. That's going to take six Shadow Influence, so it's going to take a minute here, but it certainly makes sense in terms of uh, not wanting such a poor exchange between the two cards to ever occur. Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's just kind of off the table to have that exchange happen. Uh, I understand we, we might be really far away from um, being able to hedge, but also anything can be turned into uh, anything is valuable due to just merchants and, and plunder. Mm. So you can just kind of chill. Speaking of which, we've got an exploit being played here on John Julio. <sighs> Could be uh, Maveloft Huntress. Yeah, that's going to go away. And we're going to see one of the Tilt Riders timepieces be turned into a Shadow Sigil, getting us closer to being able to play the other one and getting us closer to that Akanta Ascending. Once we get to six Shadow Influence, we can't see its text box quite now on the screen. But when you have six shadow influence, it has an extra plus two, plus two in flying. Mean and it also just rolls you up really nicely here because you already have Taz, we're ready to go for next turn. And then you're in a spot where if you draw a sigil, that's great. And if you don't, then you drew action. And that's great too. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting because with, with Tazbu, it's like we didn't get to warp it. But the information about what our future turn was going to be like, a future card in our hand now... It's possible that makes Avion make a different exploit decision, a different plunder decision. So even though we didn't get the true warp value, it still was it could have been meaningful in this game. Really high leverage to know that that was your card because you're right on the line there of would I would I want to plunder away the ascendant or the the weapon and having that information makes it so much more appealing uh, to to turn the the weapon into one. All right, Valise Bear Rider. Off the top for John Julio, a great tandem attack payoff. That's the nickname we like to use for cards, which give you a bonus when you attack with exactly two units. For right now, though, John Julio's just got the one. Felice's tandem bonus is you get to draw a card, discard a card, and those units get plus one, plus one, and overwhelm for this turn. One tricky thing for John Julio right now is uh, they got this Justice Etchings. They've got four Justice Influence, and they got a unit. Let's go into the market, right? It's not a Justice unit, and that's what you got to exhaust if you want to turn on your Justice Etchings. And Felice ain't Justice either, so a little bit of trickiness. They'd love to go into the market and grab something like a Pristine Light right now, not on the table until you get a Justice unit. And we're sort of back into the, the thing we talked about before of just – um, yeah, you can, with Huru, it's pretty easy to set up a spot where you have some Aegis trick or some way uh, to blow someone out inside of combat if your units are of approximately the same size, but this is not uh, a game they are particularly well suited to play. So for Avion, it could be the time for a open contract that would remove the possibility of any double blocks on these units. We're going to see that on the Valise Bear Rider. And then are we going to see both come in? We are. We could cash in John Julio, that Silverblade Intrusion, to get a block and prevent, make the Maveloft Huntress invulnerable to damage. And then we prevent six damage here. So not the ideal use case for the Intrusion, but one cost gain six fast. Can't say it's the worst. No, and, and with uh, with the next turn already sort of priced into playing the five drop, if, if you don't play it now, you might not get to play it. So you're if it's one of those, well, no guarantee it gets any better than this, then uh, Yeah, that's you enough. might really need that upside, though. I know. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, if you draw an undepleted power, now it's like, oh, you actually might win exchange. and Yeah, like you kill Tazbu or kill Champion of Chaos. The, it also stops the overwhelm damage from Champion of Chaos, which is hard to do normally. So uh, not an easy spot by any means for John Julio. And turns out they would have drawn power, just not of the undepleted variety. Interestingly, Avion did not use Shadow Etchings that turn. I was kind of expecting to see that happen to set up the Pale Rider's timepiece. We're that close to victory. But, you know, they are preserving a lot of flexibility for the future, and they're winning. You can't hate that idea. Right. The, again, it might be one of those, well, um, if I'm drawing action for the whole game, then I'm fine anyway, so just hedge a little bit. And action it is in the form of Vara Vengeance Seeker. Going to make things even harder here for John Julio. Though I will say that if we ever do get to pristine light this board, things can really turn around for John Julio. 
The problem is, is that by losing the Sididi, we're not going to have a justice unit to exhaust. It's a very, it's very tricky to to be in this spot. Well, also the Tazbu just sort of implies that uh, even if the game is is staying at neutral, mm. the extra cards are going to be hard to overcome. Certainly, at least for now, it's only going to draw one as it dies, it trades, and hey, there's another Tazbu off the top of the deck. Will Avion just choose to warp that in? You could at this point, I think very plausibly, just cash in one Shadow Etchings. I, I think we're now getting to the point where, like, how much action do you need? Do you not want to try to set up a turn where you do two big things in a turn? Right. And getting a power now is going to start leading you down that path. And, yep, Avion is on board with that plan. They go and get that Shadow Sigil. They're going to warp the Tazbu. And now it's we're in a very tough spot for John Julio where it's like they've got a lot to manage on the board but they've also really are starting to feel how behind they are maybe in the card advantage race. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, Avion played that really great of holding one turn on the Shadow Etchings, but then cashing in uh, on that turn. I think that was the right way to do it. This was this had to be the best draw in the deck. A cheap Valkyrie Enforcer that I think is going to set up, if I may jump ahead to the future, a Justice Etchings for a Pristine Light. And since we silenced the Tazbu, we, they're not going to get to draw extra cards from any of these units dying. Looks like it's going to go that way. Yep, Pristine Light. Going to wipe out both of the big units. Kill all units with four strength or more. And now for Avion, they're going to need to rebuild. And they've done a good job of keeping things in hand. But, yeah, that Valkyrie Enforcer was really the, the way out. It allowed them to add to the board, stop the card advantage engine, and get a Justice Unit. It, I don't know, think there was any card in the deck that could have done what Valkyrie enforced. Yeah, that did. was that was that was the one right there. <laughs> we see a Kanta ascending now, powering up the shadow etchings. Gonna go into the market, grab a shadow card and exchange it with something. It's going to be a crawl. Look at this. Gonna get a champion of chaos. It's gonna come into play exhausted. Val uh, Var is now going to make things tricky. It's gonna be a Five five. The table is not good for uh, John, and the news about the hand is worse. <laughs> yeah, and I think Avion is going to be able to use the Pale Rider's timepiece to really good effect here on Champion of Chaos if they want to. The good news for John Julio is they won game one. Let's keep that in mind. We're talking. Uh, this is a real doom and gloom story. I think they're really on the verge here of losing this game, but this this match is not over yet. The Deadly Overwhelm works super well with the Killer plus Stats bonus here, and that's why I think we're going to see uh, the timepiece go on to the the Champion of Chaos. So you do have to watch out for uh, Silver Blade Intrusion, is that that would blow that plan up. But Avion's feeling confident, going to go for it, and we see all of the damage, minus one, Overwhelm over, and kill John Julio, as Avion has tied this up at one game apiece, a lot of uh, discipline there, yeah. a lot of patience on playing that game. Uh, and I think Avion did a really good job of sort of splitting the difference between um, the immediate sort of tactical needs of whatever was happening at um, at any point with also sort of a long-term, well, there's this ambient sense of my stuff could all die, the board could get reset, whatever, and do I have enough left in the tank if that happens uh, to overwhelm uh, John Julio's leftovers? So a really good job of threading that needle. Yeah, and it, it really goes to show you that the, the challenge that players have and why you want to be aware of not just what factions your opponents are playing, but what exactly is their game plan. Some of the decks we've seen earlier that were Stone Scar, it's like, yeah, if you kill a bunch of their units, they're just not going to necessarily be doing that much. But when you go up against the variety that has Tazbu, that has Sill, that is like a slog if you are trying to get out of this game with one-for-ones. Right. All right, Avion now going to be on the draw up against John Julio's Huru Kiradak. This is a pretty anemic one for John Julio. Styre's eyes, you love the flexibility. You love all of the things it can do. It's not clear that any of them are going to be highly impactful for this spot in this game, in this matchup. And I guess that's that's the biggest concern I have is like, what? how is John Julio's draw going to be powerful here? Um, you know, ostensibly uh, flyers applying pressure and then your tricks manifesting. 
I don't know. I don't. I, it's it's hard to know really uh, how you're supposed to approach this because we we've seen uh, each player now split uh, a set of games where the game went on for a really long time. Oh, yeah. So it's not clear, you know, the whole. Well, is it a? Are you the beat down or are you the control player? Not super clear. Yeah, and, and the reality is, you know, a lot of the things can get picked off. We see the gavel coming down for John Julio. That's interesting. It, it makes sense. They don't really need the power from lingering influence. The crown watch tactic doesn't do anything. I guess my question is, like, how likely is it going to emerge that shutting off the void for the rest of the game for Avion, now that all their cards are void bound, um, will be useful? But, you know, if a Sinister Rumors showed up, something like that, it would shut off that sort of that dark return mode. So we're now going to see Valkyrie Enforcer turn Akantha into a anemic looking 2-1 vanilla. I don't mind this approach. I think that John Julio's hand probably would have been a, a mulligan from my perspective. I think I would have sent that one back. But I do sort of appreciate the, like, err on the side of being aggressive uh, when you're on the play against an opponent who's playing Tazbu. I think, like, sort of the try to maintain a defensive posture sort of a thing is really hard to pull off. Um, and this is exactly the kind of draw that's specifically very strong against Tazbu. So now we see Akaria Valkyrie Captain coming down, and we are building up a very nice looking Air Force for John Julio. The problem is, is that even for these more grindy Stone Scar decks, it really doesn't take much more than a Champion of Chaos to make it difficult for you to, to maybe win the race. Yeah, no, it's, um, you know, I, th they are multidimensional. That is, that is for sure true, and even the more controlling builds get very aggressive leaning draws and vice versa. So uh, it's, it's just a hard sort of deck to approach with one solution to the problem. Yeah, you really want to try to build up a robust game plan that is not soft to very cheap spot removal like open contract and not and you know doesn't get easily one for one. All right, so now for open contract, it's going to take out the Akaria before she has a chance to ultimate. And for Avion, it's going to be a matter of do you want to get down a second really great Champion of Chaos or maybe something like a Senway Smuggler or even just a Sill. A lot of advantages to each of them and not clear which way they're going to want to go. And it looks like they're going to go for the way that I think plays the best against uh, Pristine Light by getting down this Sill. So now if those units were to get swept away, you get some Vampire Bats. Yeah, just a, again, it, it's it's sort of wow. It, yep, paid off instantly. You know, it's hard. There's a lot of ambiguity, and certainly getting the uh, the adjudicator's gavel there early is like, what is going on with the hand, right? But <laughs> uh, I think all other things being equal, I think an insurance policy against pristine light is the the best way to approach it. It's not even like it that that plays that much worse in the event that pristine light isn't part of the equation. You're down a little bit of efficiency, but it's a really powerful insurance policy if it is. All right. So for the Justice Etchings, Pristine Light would have been really great if it had just been another Champion of Chaos. And to me, this is I, I think it's one of the best plays I've seen all day. Just If you had played Champion of Chaos, Pristine Light is just a ridiculous swing. But now it's going to be good, but it's not necessarily going to be as completely game-breaking as it could have been. Right. And yeah, we even see one of the flyers get left back because you don't want to just let these vampire bats now peck away. The vampire bats, of course, coming out because Sill says when si when a, any of your five strength or more units die, you get a vampire bat. So now we've got Champion of Chaos here. That is going to be another 5-5 five, five Deadly Overwhelm. And we, we could see some action here with Sire's Eyes. Of course, uh, Sire's Eyes, in case you haven't seen this card before, 2 cost, 2-2 two, two Flyer Injustice. Summon, you may discard a card to either play Crown Watch Tactic, Lingering Influence, or Adjudicator's Gavel. And, those, and uh, this time... And Lingering Influence is Draw Justice Sigil and Scout. 
Crown Watch tactic is plus three, plus three on Lifesteal this turn or something. And Adjudicator's Gavel is a relic that gives everything void bound. So this is a card which just gives the player a tremendous amount of flexibility to turn any one card in their hand into something else. I think I would have preferred Lingering Influence there. Mm. Um, I, I just think just the scout even is more important than gaining five there. Yeah, it's tough. You don't have an answer for the Champion of Chaos, but I feel you. It's like, you know, well, I, I, you know, the uh, you're playing against four cards in the hand to zero. Like, it, I think you're generally right. I think it's literally po I think it's possible that John Julio is losing so much. You have to assume the scout is like meaningless and that the top of your deck is sure. already loaded up. Sometimes that is well, the way you need to play it. I agree. John Julio really needed the top deck and they needed five health. It might be that they needed both. Yep. All right, Jotun Hurler off the top. The Snowball could take out the Vampire Bat. The Jotun Hurler itself does a nice job of maybe gang blocking down on the Champion of Chaos or trading with the VAR. So overall, a pretty solid pickup for John Julio. I, I think at some point here, we're going to need to see something like a turn where we get to warp Sididi off the top for them to swing this game back yep. to them. I like keep attacking. I mean, you just got to you got to you got to run this down. You're not going to win this game going long most likely it's got to be short so i like erring on the side of ag aggression here trade off with the vara if it gets offered up race the champion of of chaos unlikely to win but it's i think it's the best thing you can do all right so jotun hurler shows up now could trade with the vara avion you know this is not a good trade you don't want to trade a 3-3 life stealer for a 3-3 vanilla but what they're gaining is like they're cashing it in and they're making the board simpler which when you have more things it's it's pretty nice way to go about it yeah i mean it, all, all you want to do if you're in avion's position here is just leverage your extra cards and gaining three is a great way to to get a potentially a turn or two down the line unfortunate here we sacrificed our second unit and drew a valise but still not that shabby. I mean, if, if at least it's both a powerful draw and something that lines up well against the Vara for combat next turn. That's true. That's, yep. And Aviona still hasn't gotten to that fifth power for the Tazbu. The exploit's not doing anything in. Now, at some point, we're going to see the smuggler cash that exploit in, and I would imagine into something pretty great. Yeah, I mean, any removal spell here would play. Shadow symbol coming off the top in a future turn. Revealing a Tazbu, so it's going to be a lot to work with for Avion. And now for John Julio. Still can't block that champion of chaos, and we see the health total just falling lower and lower and lower. And it, it really, we it, it's really feeling like watching these games that we're so used to watching the Kuru Kuri deck feeling like they're just gassed up with just tons of cards from all their spell synergies. And this weekend, it's felt like they are doing a lot more of scraping to get by. Uh, well, a big thing here is also the Styre's eyes. Both no, typically you see those converted uh, certainly early on in the game into lingering influence, but. Instead, they both got cast in for Judicator's Gavel. Um, and, you know, you're sort of seeing John Julio just feeling like strapped on resources because of the way those got cashed in. Yeah, we've yet to see the Voidbound part come up in the games, though it's possible we would have seen a different card get taken from the Smuggler um, out of the market right. if Voidbound weren't on the table. So we don't know. It may have had an influence that we can't perceive, but as it currently stands, we haven't seen it come into play yet. Now, for Avion, a Silverblade Menace was the card they grabbed, and that's going to sort of add to John Julio's troubles. Just another way to push a little bit more damage through. The Kira has to come down. It doesn't, unless you really need something, you're going to smuggle for something in a future turn. But this this might literally be it here. If if there aren't good enough blocks, the Silverblade Menace is going to deal some damage. And yeah, I, I think. I don't think there's a block that gets you out there's of it. There's no way to block the Champion of Chaos and everything else. Right. So Avion is going to take down John Julio here. A well-fought three-game set again. And we see Hirokira fall beside. And definitely shaping up to be a weekend where we're going to see, you know, somebody in the last couple rounds, it, it feels like it's going to come down to a Stone Scar deck maybe versus somebody else to determine who's going to be the winner this weekend. That's that's the way we're heading. Yeah, really a great 
showing from Zone Scar this weekend and a variety of builds, um, not just not just the one. So um, very flexible, very deep pool of cards, and um, you know one step closer to maybe winning the whole thing. All right, and it sounds like there's still one game outstanding, and we're gonna jump down to almost versus pay to win here. They're in game number three, strangers, and strangers, <laughs> yeah, we got we got almost on strangers. I'm gonna take a quick look here at my over my at my dock here, and pay to win. We got Felm. So Felm's still hanging around. What do you know? Yeah, haven't seen them in a minute. Looking pretty good. You you know what I don't see on almost the side? Fifth power, or fire, fire influence. Fire influence. Well, both. <laughs> Both are important. Both are good. Uh, for pay to win here, uh, they are missing power number five as well for these ambitious band of villas. It's going to be so big. And Kilo cashes in, gets a triumphant stranger. Who needs to pay for your cards? <laughs> and uh, a lot to work through now for pay to win. They're going to need to have a big turn here, I feel like. That ain't it. I mean... If you have a power in the market, maybe like Blight Pass Smuggler, get the fifth power. Annihilate the Linrise Stranger, and then Ambitious Mandevilla gets to work. That six-cost card, Fall to Ruin in hand, is a big game. It kills all enemy units, and if you have ten or more units in your void, it only kills enemy units. The problem is we're still a few power away. <laughs> all right, Form Bend. Like, all Pay to Win has to do is just, like, hold on for until they get to six power, and then they clean it all up. Do they have that time? I mean, four, they're, they're a ways away. And now that that 1-1 that one -one Hurus's Traver could get them almost the fire influence, so they'd be able to rebuild. It's going to take some work here for Felon, but maybe there's a chance. I will never yep, whenever you play a stranger with Linrai Stranger out, you can stun a non-stranger. I know Karendon Merchant doing work. Gonna go in the market and find us. Oh, they do have. They got a token, <laughs> a token of purpose. I mean, that's a, that's so sick here. Triumphant Stranger turned on, and this is just too much coming across. I, I think e even if we draw power now, like the Grenahan, I guess, um, is now unstunned. I think the only chance is Wisdom of Elders into Annihilate. Can't play Wisdom of Elders. Still have the second. Oh, oh. <laughs> no. <laughs> you just assumed at this stage oh. of the game, right? Strangers. Yeah. Strangers, strangers. Strangers in the top four of the throne open. I mean, look, there was no doubt. Everybody in chat on our stream the other day was just telling us. Was strangers. just like, strangers are next round of ne Next round of nerfs is already like, you know, yeah, whatever. <laughs> oh, well, that's fun. All right, so unfortunate for Pay to Win. Um, they, they had a r couple of really good cards in hand that they were pretty close to getting to, but then just not weren't getting there in time. Door shuts pretty fast. I'll tell you that. Definitely. I'll, I'll have an opportunity to miss a beat there, but good for, good showing for Fallon. A couple of people showed up with Fallon Control decks and Pay to Win there. Uh, you know, still, still cash the tournament. That's great, but Strangers now, top four. So, all right, so we're going to be going to break here in a moment. That is it for the round. We'll be back with our top four. As a reminder, in our top four, we're going to get to see both semifinals, so don't worry. We're not going to miss any of these decks. No. But so far, what do we got? We got we got a Sky Craig deck. We got a Stone Scar, like, mid-range on the bigger end, and we've got Strangers. And we'll find out what the fourth one is filling it out. But pretty wild top four cooked up, and uh, we're going to get to see who's going to come out on top in just a bit here. Yeah, nice, fun array of decks and different strategies and – Different faction pairings, or in the stranger case, you know, the soup. <laughs> Been great. Good tournament. <laughs> All right. So we'll be back in just a few minutes here with the top four. Just a few more matches left. Only three more to find out our winner this weekend. Stay tuned, and we're going to see who gets it done. Taking a step back from sort of the competitive side, let's let's have some fun and talk about some of your favorite things in Eternal. So first off, just what's your favorite format? What's the one that you enjoy most when you just want to kind of unwind? Um, probably just uh the Throne or Expedition in constructed format. I'm usually a constructed player. If if I really 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 want to unwind, usually I build a new deck and then uh, and then play that in the. Uh, you know, something, uh, something uh, crazy, or something. What nice. gives you inspiration when you're building a new deck? What, what kinds of things are you, are you looking for? Um, 
I mean, uh, going going to to Return of Warcry and just like, you know, so, some people have some great ideas there, uh, and then like you, you know you. You, you you change some things around so you know deck building is hard right some some people you know have different uh, different ideas about deck building and also that they may not be you know they may not have quite as much experience in deck building but their 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 ideas are are really good and then you can just like conglomerate and then... do you have a favorite all-time deck that you've played in the game um probably haunted highway <laughs> i mean that w- way back in the day the three faction uh fps deck that um uh Ski J originally designed uh, the Ski J, and uh, I I took and uh, modified the power base and added and basically the form that that looks very much close to to the form that was played in high level play um, at, uh, at it, when it was when it was the best deck in my opinion. Nod also to five faction Kilo Kilo Vox, the five faction Kilo Vox that I I designed with Yautabyte in um, in um, the expedition form at that time with uh, with Jack and uh, gentle grazer uh in a five faction deck that, that that was fun and uh that was a fun experience do you have an all-time favorite card in the game um it's like that it kind of, kind of became mainstream now a little <laughs> bit it's uh, uh whispering wind was always like one of my favorite cards way back in the day because it asked you to to build your deck in specific ways right uh, and you could get really creative with it. For example, when I first used it, I was discarding Bloodright Callus to to get a smuggler stash, right? So you'd always have a chance to get uh, get back all your Bloodright Calluses with it. But uh, that, of course, now Whispering Wind is used mostly as a uh, uh, as a way to get crawl, right? Do you see that quite a bit? Do you have a favorite card in the game that you enjoy just for its art? Um. Well, Really, st- I, I think most of the Grenadines have pretty sweet card arts, but one that I uh, really uh, like quite a bit is Oblivion Body. So, so, uh, so chill, leaning back in his chair. Uh, yeah, d- j- just that one. <laughs> well, my next question was going to be, what's your favorite tribe in Eternal? What's your favorite unit type? Is it Grenadine or something else going to edge them out? Uh, I think Grenadine. I really like Sacrifice Synergies. I have played Yetis to a large amount of success. Or, or even elves, but I think Grenadines kind of uh, uh, edges out on all of them right now. Do you have a card in the game that it's maybe not the best card, maybe not the most consistent tournament player, but it's one that you can't quit playing? It's a pet card for you. Um, this is a this is a shout out to uh, my my peeps in a, in a, in Discord. Um, <laughs> I guess a jetpack. <laughs> that, that that's the I. I I, I play I play a lot of bad cards, but like uh, J- Jetpack is the one that uh, that I that I played for quite a bit there for for, for a little while, and uh, it 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 hasn't worked out that well. But you know what? Sometimes sometimes it works. Sometimes it works. You know they can't play spells uh, until your next turn. It's great. It's great. They can't if the, if it never worked, you wouldn't keep coming back to it, right? That's right. <laughs> And uh, is there a card that always has your number? It seem, maybe just seems to line up super well against the kind of decks you like to play. If somebody's trying to beat you, what should they be playing? Um, what's the card? Uh, Grand Suppressor is the <laughs> card that uh, always uh, nukes whatever I'm doing. <laughs> Do you have if uh, so? We got a lot of battle skills in the game. If you could have one of the eternal battle skills in real life, which one would it be? Probably flying. I, I think that soaring through the air would be pretty sweet. I have to deal with the vertigo problem, but uh, uh, I'm sure that, you know, uh, if, if you do it for uh, enough, then uh, you get rid of that problem. But I think it would be really sweet to just, just be able to fly. And if we were to ask sort of your teammates or your friends, which card is the most overmaster of all the cards? Which is, uh, what's the card when people see it, they would think of you maybe more than anyone else? Uh, haunting scream, haunting scream for sure. Uh, you know, the, the I've I've done so much with that card over <laughs> over the years. Uh, um, you know, I, I I I've screamed basically any any anything that I could get my hands on. I've screamed. <laughs> every card in the every unit in the game that costs five or less has been screamed at least once by you. It sounds like all right. <laughs>
All right, it's top four time here at the Throne Open. Andrew Baxter and Patrick Sullivan here. We got three more matches left. Naturally, as we have four players, each one's going to knock out a player. You get the deal. Mm -hmm. But for our two semifinals, we are going to be showing them back to back to see, get to see all of the action. And so first up in that will be Blasteder Man on Sky Craig Agro up against Iron Man on Stone Scar. And we'll see what take on Stone Scar Iron Man's got cooked up for us this weekend, what he's been working on at Stark Industries. But for the Blasteder Man, we've seen Sky Craig a couple times so far. Looked smooth, looked good. I love the way that they're playing the deck. What have you? What's it impressed you about their approach this weekend? Um, just, I mean, I'm a big fan of just leveraging efficiency and resources, and then the tactical play has been really sharp too. Um, so the, just the strategy's been good, and then the the play on the table has also been very solid. And it's a tough one. I mean, you know, we typically associate those with like very precise, like how you draw your cards, how you manage a full grip. What Blasted or Man's been doing in these games so well is doing it with so little mm -hmm. like <laughs> sometimes it means i'm going to auto tread and discard this other good card just so i can finish off and kill this one thing and get an extra depth charge through the attack in so that way i can top deck something to get over the finish line and it's all of these little tiny advantages that ultimately have added up to victory yeah and a lot of decimating too i mean mm, it's been nice. squeezing every little bit out all right so iron man here we got stone scar looks like a a similar take to what we're going to see from Avion in our second semifinal. A bit of a bigger take. They've got that Voprex's Choice there, the recently buffed. Now Fast Spell. The enemy player must sacrifice a unit of their choice. Or you can draw a dragon or weapon from your Void. For the Blaster Room Man, another solid draw as always. We got ones, we got twos. The thing we don't have is we don't have any removal. Iron Man gets things kicked off with a little shadow etchings, and there's the Houndmaster. Always doing a good job, and Oni Ronin. And this is a big moment here. The Vo this is going to be a bit of a punish here. The Voprex's choice is going to kill the Oni Ronin, and what is Blasteder Man? Well, I was going to say they didn't have undepleted power. They just had some banners without a unit, but that Emblem of Shavka. Oh, interesting. They're going to hold... They went with the Snowcrest Yeti first, Sullivan, and instead... That's going to open up the Sha emblem of Shavka for later. Yeah, I think a, a lot of it just had to, you know, swallow up one kind of awkward turn here to just clean it up going going forward. And we're used to seeing this. A space, we're going to see a torch finish off the Champion of Chaos if there is a block. And what does Iron Man want to do about it? Well, they'll take it. Uh, well, yeah. take it in the sense of, like, they probably knew this was coming and they're okay with it. Right. I, I, don't, I, I don't think it's uh, plausible there to just take your lumps. <laughs> You know, you want to take that hit when they've signaled that they have Torch in hand? Uh, doesn't seem great to me. Certainly would be tough. All right, next up is a Champion of Fury. We've got a League Explorer as well. This is a spot where I can see Blaster Man pumping the brakes, or I could see them just going all in with all three. What do we think? I like attacking. It's, this is not, it's not going to get better, you know? And also, if you have D'Angelo as your last card, the value of your third unit's kind of in the toilet anyway, because next, you know, you still have your two, you're, you're likely to tandem attack next turn. So why not get in your points and your, your depth charge and Ooh. set up for next turn? Iron Man's going to make this very hard now for Blaster Man if they play with Vara, because either way, it's going to be really good. If it sacks a unit, it's okay, but it's going to be Tazbu first. And now Blaster Man can go Houndmaster... They can play out their entire hand. Right, yeah. And I think that's what we'll see. But that's a that's a, a dead end. I mean, there's no tandem attack, I suppose. But it's quite bad. It gets a depth charge, and yeah. it gets the 4-1. So one of these units will survive. We'll get a depth charge. We'll push through probably two damage. I don't mean bad like you're not supposed to do it. I mean bad as in, you know, it's, it's a bad situation it's still. Yeah. Yep. And now for Iron Man, we're going to see an Annihilate be picked up. That's going to probably just pick off the Houndmaster. We saw the Invasive Species come out of the market. And now an Oni Patrol. And <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, mandatory, but you know. Yeah, th it's got Reckless. And it's being a little reckless right now. Little, little old Mandrake, what are you doing attacking into that big old Tazboo? 
but it has Entomb put a copy of itself into your market. So in the future, if Blast Order Man hits Iron Man with an empty hand, you can play the invasive species from the market once again. And now Var is here. I guess you could sack or something. I'm not... Blast Order Man, I trust, is making the right play. I just don't know that there is, is any of the plays are good. Yeah. That will lead to victory. And now Champion of Fury... Too many good things have happened this game for Iron Man. I think the key here to this game for them was multiple copies of Champion of Chaos being those 5-5s. Five <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I love the I love the attack. Maybe, again, your, your opponent can always miss click through blocks. Yeah, and it's not like you're giving Iron Man much to think about. You're empty-handed, <laughs> so it's just know, like you just do what the right play is. Yeah, I know. I just, you know. And now we're going to get to watch the Invasive Species jump attack into a 3-3 bar next turn if the game lasts that long. You could just sit back. <laughs> Why even attack? You know the Invasive Species is coming in. Uh, just get your money in case Permafrost is the draw. Yeah, all right. Fair. That makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, again, we got a best of three here. So, we're having a little fun. But uh, Blaster Man's going to get another couple cracks at this, or at least one more crack, um, even if this game has sort of spiraled hopelessly out of reach. Yeah, and they're going to pack it. For your arrogance. Too much, especially on the draw for Blaster in this game. Yeah, I mean, just... Um uh, didn't get off to a particularly fast start. Did not have uh, any clean removal for the large blockers that got played. Everything was like minimum two cards or just throwing attackers away to try to push through some damage. And, um, you know, didn't have enough resources to hang in that game. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like the Sky Craig deck, it's like if it gets just enough traction in the early game, it just becomes just this, this huge nightmare to deal with. Because now it's like any extra attacks that ever get through are getting me so close to in range. Any top deck direct damage like Torches is just so threatening. D'Angelo Houndmaster is adding a ton of charge all at once. Mm -hmm. It's it's when when you're in range, the Sky Craig deck it just is like oh I and I'm so terrified to attack and put pressure on you. But when you stabilize early against Sky Craig the way that Iron Man did there, it's really feeling the fact that the deck is a lot of like two twos. Yeah, I mean yeah, that Stone Scar's got Stone Scar's got way more ability to, to, to punk you out from those kind of spots. There's a lot of cards you can go to. These low to the ground um, Skycrack decks, and you know, it, it's not all downside. Uh, Blaster Advance in the top four, um, but if you hit a wall, often you you don't have very much recourse. And uh, Iron Man was able to set up a wall there pretty quickly in that game. All right, Oni Ronan's going to kick things off here, and now we'll see Iron Man throw out a shadow symbol. Or Blasted or Man. It's going to be a war cry attack with the 2 1 Oni Ronin. Followed up by a Prowling Amaruk. Going to grab Aegis this game. And next up for Iron Man, we could see a very early Sill, or we could see a Sinister Rumors. It's going to be a Sill Cabal Strong Arm. Great unit. You need a very specific draw to get this one out on turn two, but Iron Man had it with that turn one shadow symbol. It's very hard otherwise to have three shadow influence on the second turn of the game. A Milos off the top now for Blaster Order Man. Throwing in a Firebomb, we're going to see the Vampire Bat as the Sill has traded off. And now for Iron Man, a little bit of cleanup here. Open contract. We could see a Sinister Rumors as well. So we've gotten through the worst of the early game for Iron Man as we have the only unit left. Yeah. No, this is, I mean, the, the hand maybe is a little bit low on, uh, you know, just action, but the smuggler should clean that up pretty reliably. Look at that. A double war cried up champion of Fury and a D'Angelo Houndmaster and a Pyro Knight. Playing it all out in case we draw power next turn, we can ultimate that Pyro Knight. And for Iron Man, that Houndmaster is going to add a ton. This was a, an amazing recovery. After getting down to no units, we're back up to three. Right, and Iron Man actually went out of their way there to um, use a, a removal spell when they maybe could have just held the bat back to, for Oni Ronin, in part to dampen the possibility of uh, D'Angelo being problematic. And in spite of that, we've, we've reassembled and then some. All right, so we're going to see the Houndmaster now and maybe Vampire Bat on Pyro Knight or on, oh, the 4-1, sure. And then we'll see a trade with the Champion of Chaos, but another Pyro Knight's coming. 
going to be a need to be a really good smuggle here from the Senway smuggler. It'd be ideal if we had something that could kill the Houndmaster. Do we? You bet we do. Aramot's designs. He's got something cooked up. <laughs> kill all the twos and the ones. In this case, it was really about killing that Houndmaster, especially. But now we got a sill. We've got another smuggler. And for Iron Man, this is an interesting spot. You could just throw out the sill and next turn wait on the smuggler. Or you could just get another 3 2 down. They're going to hold off. Yeah, I guess, I guess it, again, we're in one of those spots where. You know, the, the smuggler left in hand is such insurance against a bad draw step. And Iron Man is going to start applying the pressure, getting this game closed out. I think they've got a firebomb in their deck, so there's a little bit more c along the way. But I, I'm this is, this is pretty impressive. It looks like Iron Man has maybe turned the corner here. And we're going to see now the crawl bring back the sill. And now a Sinister Rumors is going to add to the pain. A power off the top for Blaster Iron Man. They, you know, they they never deviated from their game plan. Things did not go exactly as they wanted to at every turn of this match, for sure. But we never saw them get, like, rattled. It never seemed like they were sort of playing scared, playing intimidated. And sometimes that's going to be where that it goes. And sometimes you can play exactly as well as you can. You just hit the wrong matchup. You get the wrong draws. And... It doesn't yeah. work out. Yeah, that was a really powerful, you know, one-two punch there from Iron Man. The blunting of the initial wave, a sweeper for the second wave. And, you know, your good draws from the Skycrag side can kind of handle the first punch like that. Very hard to hit to, to handle a one-two. And at the end there, uh, Blaster Man just had no action left. So that's going to do it there for our first semifinal. We're going to stick with it here, and we're going to get queued up with Almost versus Avion. And so we're going to expect to see a pretty similar take on Stone Scar from Avion. For almost uh, at this point, if you haven't heard the news, we got a stranger deck in our top four, and the five factor stranger deck will be showing up. And um, I'm pretty interested to see this matchup. I, I I'm pretty optimistic for almost in the sense of it doesn't feel like these stone scar decks are the bigger ones are applying so much pressure that almost won't be able to slow them down. And then just the power of just triumphant stranger after triumphant stranger and building up that wide stranger army, I think is going to be look quite nice against what the stone scar deck is doing the stranger deck is in an interesting maybe even unique position of um can go play a long game against tazbu without having to engage in combat trading off things i i think that's um something that I'm, we're watching a lot with the stone scar side of like once that card's in play if you're slugging out in the middle it's very hard to hang because the card's so large and the card advantage is also big to know as well. But if you can just sort of ignore combat and what the Stranger deck can do is set up a spot where I'm either chump blocking or going way over the top, you're not just letting the, the Stone Scar player kind of like be up three or four cards on those games that go for a long time. And, and uh, you know, typically when we see those sort of mid-range uh, uh, unit brawls, Tazbu's the, the best thing going on. Not so much here. All right, here we go here. Avion has got a n nice looking draw here with Sinister Rumors, Sill, and Senway Smuggler for almost. Got the most important part, I guess, in the sense we got a Triumphant Stranger. And with a uh, Hurus Traver, we, we've got some good development to that five faction power base. Um, the Karenin Merchant to me looks like one of the more important cards to have in this matchup for almost. And fortunately, they do have one. Uh, that 2-2 that two, two Deadly Body seems like it'll do a nice job if they run into things like, you know, a, a Sill or a or a Champion of Chaos, something that requires you to trade consistently. I really like watching almost there on these opening hands of taking so long of just being like, trying to figure out the order in which they want to play their power to, un to unlock their pips and get the most things undepleted as you possibly can. No small challenge. It's a, it's a bit of a maze. So we've had a lot of fun um, joking around about, you know, how kind of small Horus Traver is. 1-1. One, one. Not looking like a terrible body on this no. board. Is it small? Yes. Is it big enough? Yes. <laughs> one point of strength. All we're going to need here to trade with that sill. So good little pickup on the other side. Avion 
got a just you know real smooth curve i mean that that's the thing you got to say about these stone scar decks is like they are making some real nice plays every spot on the curve and you know this turn maybe a smuggler next turn a vara or this turn could be like a sinister rumors plus a treasure trove or it could be sinister rumors replaying the sill a lot of great options a lot of great plays and it's really allowing them to sort of meet the moment wherever they need it mm -hmm. it's gonna keep this going huh yep so I'm going to fire it on back over to almost side. Picking up power number five. That's a big one. But now it's going to be about planning out turns three and four. I imagine we're going to see one of these merchants. And then what's going to be turn four. And then we, we know what turn five is going to be. Good guess. So do they have some kind of sweeper that they can go to that can allow them to catch up against the vampire bats, which are going to sort of spill out here? It's going to be a kilo. So maybe we're not even going to see a trade here. It's possible they have ambitions next turn of turning this Genev merchant into something from the deck, a four coster. For Avion, grabbing Pale Rider's timepiece. A little bit of power away from that, but it's going to be a big deal in terms of interacting with Triumphant Stranger in the future. And it looks to me like we might see Kilo. Turning the Genève Merchant into a Learned Imitator. Learned Imitator is going to turn into a Triumphant <laughs> Stranger. <laughs> Practice the stranger along for the ride. And the fun has begun. And so now, Avion, what is your plan? How are you going to get through these? Oh, Annihilate here, a very nice draw. Multi-faction unit, all factions, no factions. No factions. <laughs> <laughs> and I got bad news about next turn. You yeah. Know. Yeah, it's... Uh, <laughs> going to be another one. All right. So Avion. It kind of feels like Avion, if they had a power, might get it. I mean, not, I don't know. Oh, my. That is that is a real sign of desperation that they felt like they needed to crack Treasure Trove there. I, I think they need I think they need back to back power. I think that yeah. was the right way to do it. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, Challenging moment, though. All right, so now here's here's up what we got queued up next. Triumphant Stranger. Stranger Danger. Fortunate Stranger. That means the Stranger's all draw a card, and then the Steely Stranger draws a card from the Fortunate Stranger. Uh, yeah. <laughs> This is like one of those games where if I'm on Avion's side, it's like, first of all, one, can I win? Like, is there a path here? And they're going to try to find it. But two, I'm also starting to think through. It's like, this seems rough. Um, what's my plan against this happening to me next game? Yeah, it wasn't like there was anything wrong with Avion's draw. No. no. Not at all, you know. So I imagine we'll see a chump block on the Vara. The vampire bats are going to squeak through. There, there's some real possibility here that flying is going to be difficult for almost to deal with, and the Pale Rider's timepiece is going to make all of this stranger nonsense on the ground irrelevant in some way. Now, with Genev Merch and with Kilo, there's reasons to think that they're almost going to find a way out of that being a problem, but it, it's not a sure thing that we're going to be able to handle all the flying action coming our way. Uh, assuming it, it manifests. I mean, that's still a TBD, but yeah, it's the, yeah. that's the out here is... Because it's not like piece, your your bats can just chip out. Avion's built themselves a cushion here. You see that uh, forty underneath their hand. That's mm -hmm. how much it's going to take to end this one. More than they started with. The the, the fortunate stranger, though. Um, you know, it's always fun when we get to play. When we talk about the strangers, it's like a lot of them have names which really well describe the feeling of having them. <laughs> Fortunate, high on that list. Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> we see the freeze out action. Yeah, I, I like this play a lot from almost because we, you're at a spot there where the the timepiece is exactly lethal. 
<laughs> All right. So now we've got Bereaved Stranger. So now we're going to try to pull the health totals out of reach. And uh, a pretty clever play by almost really recognizing all of the ongoing advantages are in my favor. Mm -hmm. The only real aspect that Avion is winning on is that I have no flyers and that my health total is a lot lower. They didn't get Soaring Strange or anything like that, but they got something which will really get them almost permanently out of reach in terms of health totals. Gaining 10 here is just an enormous amount. And, well, actually, it's going to be 13. Like, literally, all you have to do is shore up the next turn. And yeah. If you do that, then the rest of it will take care of itself. Sure is starting to feel that way. Little surprise. I mean, to show you how confident almost is about their long game advantage, they cashed in that fortunate stranger for a really terrible trade just to gain three more points. Yeah. I, they just yeah. don't think it matters. Yeah, and I, I agree. Uh, cards are not going to be the bottleneck here. <laughs> well, you don't want to get mauled. <laughs> not that that's likely to happen. All right, for Avion, they've grabbed a Sill, which it, it, it's nice in that it's going to potentially plunder us into power number six. The problem is we're still just dealing with the uh, the whole Bereaved Stranger situation. It's a lot of situations. Yeah. Situations sometimes, ooh, yeah. Once once we're plundering cards we got from the market just a moment ago, <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's... Bringing your receipt. Yeah. <laughs> like to return this. <laughs> and yeah, that Silver Blade Menace looked a lot more attractive as a way to sort of drain out, but it goes to show you, like, it really does matter that, like, people haven't maybe played against almost playing against this deck yet. Now, I'm not saying that's definitely happened here with Evian, but it's a possibility. They thought that Silverblade Menace was this really likely route to do it, and they didn't recognize how likely it was that Kilo was going to get a Bereaved Stranger and just mean, no, this game ain't coming down to a little bit of drain action. Right, 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 right. Yep. Okay. That's Triumphant Stranger number four. Uh, there is no rule that says a Triumphant Stranger can't hit a triumphant stranger it's a stranger and it's one of the ones you could hit at random there's dozens and dozens of them but that's one of them <laughs> a towering stranger is the overwhelm one and now we're holding up our freeze out anytime i start counting like this it's never close like is it lethal on turn and everything yeah, yeah they're over yeah. by nine or whatever yeah, Triumphant Strangers with full boards, they tend to be in the double digits so because that's just the way the math works. Yeah, 79, um, 46, yeah, it's just not even close. <laughs> and for Avion, they're, I guess, evaluating if they want to go to the Pale Rider's timepiece and what would be the best thing to take out. Um, I think they're doing the math on if, like, using that on Sill keeps them alive another turn, is my guess. Um, you can't let this an, a lifesteal attack happen to the degree that we we're talking about here. Yeah. It would just mean the game's impossible. And so I have to... Okay. What attack, not a killer attack, eh? I think we're going to see a killer attack. Yeah. yeah. So we see Bereaved Stranger bite the dust. We got back up to 42. So now we've gotten to the point where it's like, okay, Sill's very big and it's a flyer. Vara would trade with anything. The Overwhelm is super annoying. It means the Vampire Bats are a lot less useful. Yeah, you're not at lethal anymore by my napkin math. Right. A space bar is not game. The problem is, is it seems like it's almost impossible for next turn to not be lethal now. Right, 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 right. right. And you're not going to win next turn. One funny thing about Triumphant Stranger, there's not a lot of, there's no real silence effects in Stone Scar. Triumphant Stranger is uh, not good against silence. No. No. It's very small. Yeah. Plus one, plus one for each of your strangers. That all goes away with the silence. But for now, they've got that text and it's really doing it for them. <laughs> Steely Stranger is going to pop here. Steely Stranger is a fun one. When you attack with one or more strangers, the top unit of your deck gets a random battle skill. As if the strangers needed any more. <laughs> Bar, I think, rightly is going to just trade off with the Towering Stranger. 
you'd love to trade with a triumphant stranger, but at this point, it's like one, like four is as good as three. You can't turn the faucet off. <laughs> but you have, but by turning off the overwhelm, you raise the possibility that maybe next turn you can jump and survive. Yeah. Um, you might, you probably are dropping too low in reality. You got one more vampire bat, maybe. You're at six. Well, let's see what. what yeah, gets spun Kilo's up here. gonna do something nasty. Oh, it's a hair trigger stranger. All right, quick draw. <laughs> quick draw will shut off the life steal on the blocks. At some point here, the freeze out's gonna get played. Ooh, Valor Stranger. Stranger's a plus one, plus one. Yeah, if the Sinister Rumors try to do anything, the freeze out's gonna be super annoying here. Yeah. Like, you could start the turn with an exploit, but I'm not sure you have enough power for that um, to do everything you'd wanna do. Because I think in reality, you're more likely to wanna get a to draw a unit from your void and then you'd want some more power for that than try to kill anything. Not that you can really kill much. Yeah, I just don't even, I mean, what's the next turn even look like uh, with all these lines? It doesn't look good. <laughs> okay. So we're gonna freeze you out and this locks out Aviona playing any more spells for this turn, so they could play a fast spell like the Annihilate here, but in reality, they could just also do that on Almost's turn, so they're gonna just hold off for now, try to take advantage that Almost doesn't know it's coming. Yeah. Um, and now we'll see Genev Merchant. Picked up a battle skill. It did Reckless. Work, did see? Reckless. Yeah. Reckless is a skill because it means you're, the enemy never knows why you're attacking. <laughs> it could be because it's good, right. but it could be because it's bad. All right, we'll see Hidden Road Smuggler. So it looks like almost has a plan here. We're going to see a last chance, and I imagine this is picking back up that Towering Stranger. Giving everything Overwhelm from a multi-faction Stranger will do the trick here. Is that six cost seven, seven? Gonna get powered up to an eight nine. We're sacking things to make board space, and for Avion, that was a that was a tough one. Um, we, you know, it's never hopeless, never truly, right? Yeah. No. Uh, it can be at the end of the games, but no game ever starts off hopeless. And I don't even think like it's like that they could never win because the reality is is it's like that stranger deck can have some pretty anemic opening draws, right? We've yeah. talked about it. They have a lot of very good cards, a lot of ways to get to Triumphant Stranger, but if they draw none of them, maybe their deck does nothing. Yep. Uh, well, I mean, from the from the Stone Star side, it was just attacking with chunky units and the removal spells not lining up the right way, and you saw both sides of just, like, the stranger deck can chump block, and the stranger deck can just outsize you. You need to have um, something... Uh, with a little bit more, ment more momentum than the draw we saw there, which was not bad, to be clear. I mean, it was a sell on turn two into a recur, into a vara. It's just good stuff, you know. It's just yep. too slow uh, and without enough evasion, either uh, uh, either flying or overwhelm, no real recourse once the uh, game got locked up. Yep, and for almost an Avion, they're going to be joining game two here right now. Let's see what their hands are looking like. So Avion's going to be starting things off. An exploit draw on the play, that's pretty solid. You hopefully can turn it into some pressure in the next few turns. And then for almost, um, it's very hard to evaluate their draws because <laughs> ultimately it just looks like a bunch of nonsense until it does something extremely strong. And it has certainly some pieces to that. Learn Derm, Imitator. One of the great things about this card is it has summon transform into a unit um, that costs five or less. And yeah, and then set its strength down to uh, down to zero. And with Learn Derm, Imitator, you could do that with Triumphant Stranger and you don't even mind. Its base stats are that low. Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, from Almost's perspective, I think a hand that like has a good distribution of sigils to make the pips line up the right way, plus a merchant is probably just an auto keep. Yeah, that makes sense. So next up for almost, we've got Karendan Merchant, solid blocker, gonna grab Kilo. We've seen this pattern before, really enjoying using Kilo to turn these early games sort of 
merchants and power units into more impactful things as the game goes on. An exploit for, for Avion is going to probably just pop the kilo. It's hard to take Learned Imitator when they literally don't have a single primal influence, let alone <laughs> the fifth. And then uh, an Annihilate is going to really open things up for some pressure here. Oh, uh, sorry. I, maybe they lost the Annihilate. I apologize about that. Um, I guess, no, it, we're only on turn three, so it's going to take a moment here. Wait. Yeah, they just they oh. it. I got a little thrown off, I apologize, by the logistics expert. It changes the dynamic about which player gets to which spot on the power curve first. Right. That's, that's right. And now Karenin Merchant coming in. We will see Genève. Merchant next. Imagine we can store away that uh, learned imitator for later. But maybe we hold on to it. I don't know if we value power numbers five. Notably, we don't have um, fire influence. Yep, still in a holding pattern there. So Avion is playing a patient with their Akanthas. Um, they're, they're waiting to get to that six shadow influence, and then I'll turn it into a four three flyer. And then it'll really start doing some good work for them. And we're going to see that here now. Get up into the air. And this elf riding her dragon, she leads the elves to victory. Every time she attacks, she's going to play a 2-1 dark elf. We'll see Tazbu emerge. And thanks to the trade here, draw a card. Take a damage. Yeah, and almost here in just huge trouble. I mean, nothing going on on the table, and um, not even drawing drawing two Triumphant Stranger right now. Yeah, it's it's going to be a problem. Because that's the thing. It's like we've lost Kilo from the market. We don't have Fire Influence. So we're not even – we're two draws yeah, away. Yeah, we're way, we're way far away. We're still three Primal Influence off on this Learned Imitator. We can play Freeze Out, though. <laughs> 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 and that will be the only spell played by the turn by the enemy. All right. There we go. Tazbu getting in there. We're getting very close. So Akanta ascending. Her ultimate form is when you get to eight shadow influence, and it's when she hits the enemy player, they must sacrifice a unit of their choice. And uh, that's going to happen next turn if that Seed of Chaos comes down. And with two Akanta Ascendings, we're going to be on no board really fast here for almost. Yeah. A Traverse Farm is interesting. And interesting is my way of saying I don't think it at can do that much here for almost, though it certainly looks really cool. <laughs> I mean, it gets us a Triumphant Stranger. All right, that's something. But we still are missing fire. And that Diplomatic Seal, if you're wondering about that power in their hand, it only gives you an influence when you play it when you have two influence or less, and we're well past that point. So now for Avion, probably going through the, the check of the market with that Senway Smuggler. Oh, let's... Uh, we're not going to get down the 8th Shadow Influence first. Well, it certainly might not matter here at all, but if everything gets jumped away. But yeah, we, we could have made, I think, almost sack the uh, the Geneva Merchant. Not the biggest deal in the world, but a, a little bit of value given up. I mean, uh, unless you think it's more likely that um, you just have running draws where you want to uh, pitch those sigils instead of playing them. Which is not actually like unreasonable here, given how if, much uh, yes. the Merchant doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I, if you thought you were in a spot where it wouldn't be worth it um, to, to play out one of these depleted powers at the time, they had a Seed of Chaos and a Stone Scar painting, both of which would have come into play depleted. makes a lot of sense. Um, by waiting, they did get up to an undepleted power. They got to play the Smuggler, so now they'd get to play something like a Silver Blade Menace here or have access to a Crawl. So uh, far from me, it's not like things didn't work out here um, for Avion, but yeah, that, that'll do it for for almost in a pretty tough one. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's still a fail rate baked into almost this deck. It's really hard to hit every step of the way. I think that hand was fine. It had a distribution of, of, of pips and a merchant. You know, I can't imagine 
the six card hands for this deck are palatable by and large, but didn't find a payoff card. Uh, couldn't even play one to, if they wanted to, and you know, just uh, the deck obviously just is not particularly competitive unless it actually gets its engines going and was not even close to getting off the ground there. They'll be on the play in game three, mm -hmm. and uh, we've seen them do a very nice job um, all day long in terms of planning out their power, tr doing like, you know, they have some power which gives them options. They've got things like Chorus Traver, Diplomatic Seal, Common Cause, Vows. So they've got ways to sort of manipulate which power they draw into the right colors of influence. They didn't have all the tools they needed that game. Most of the time they will, and we've seen them be consistently successful at actually getting to that point where they can play a Tramp and Stranger when we have in hand. I think that is literally the first time we've seen them today have enough power to play Tramp and Stranger, but not have enough influence. So it's an event yeah. that can happen. It does seem like with the careful play that they've made, their deck construction, it's been a rare event. Yeah, no, I, you know, that's that's the first that's the first draw we've watched uh, that I would describe as just a fail state. Yeah, you know, so it's not the most common thing. All right, here we are in game number three, almost at the bottom of your screen. They've got a very ex potentially explosive draw with multiple plus max power units, but they're going to toss it away. This one, I think, is worse, but do you want to go down to six? And this is going to no. be a tough one here. <laughs> with a logistics expert into a potential turn two Karenin merchant into a turn three Her Ooh, Traver's farm, wow. but they're going to throw it back and... Um, I don't like starting on six cards against Stone Scar because they're really good at trading with you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I certainly not hard to understand what was wrong with that second hand. I just assumed, given how much, you know, it's both the matchup and the fact that you need a lot of cards to make everything function, that going down to six was basically off the table. But uh, almost is going for it. Yes, they are. And so now we'll see. Karendon Merchant, and if history's been any lesson, that's going to be picking up a Kilo Bolt Innovator. And they will be grabbing. Yep. And so that's the plan. Um, and what it means is that Avion sort of has to know that they need to kill the Karendon Merchant right now. Otherwise, Kilo's going to turn it into a Learned Imitator which will turn into a Triumphant Stranger. And so we'll, we'll see if they're comfortable with making that because it's going to take up their entire turn and they'll need to just fire off the open contract. The only question is maybe you want to play a Shadow Etching, something along those lines. None of this is going to be free. Here's the real problem. I don't see a route for them to be able to play open contract this turn and play a three drop next turn definitively. Yeah, and uh, there is a, a definitely a burden on Avion to start like attacking in this kind of matchup. Because it's not like it's going to get better if you don't have, you need to have an answer for the Kilo too. So this is going to be tough for Avion, but they're not going to go for the bolt for the open contract. And by now I think that this might be their best path um, and they might have a plan for this situation. But I would guess that by now Avion knows that this means they've opened themselves up to a Triumphant Stranger this turn. And we will see that as we're going to see Learned Imitator. Now summon Transform into a unit in your deck with five costs or less. Set its strength to zero. And we see a Xenon Stranger is the first Stranger that it's going to make. And they get a second open contract. That's going to be able to deal with the Kilo, but here's the problem. I not going to kill the the stranger this time. Well, with two open contracts, you can kind of get out from under it, but then... It only you know. affects the uh, the unit's costs in the deck, unfortunately. Mm. So that's the thing. If we had yeah. killed Kilo, then future ones, anyone you ever get would be... Right. Would be Eligible. four cost. Yep. But not anymore. do enjoy that they drew that Soaring Stranger. That'll be a fun surprise at some point. I imagine that's a, a fun of in the deck to get with Reunite, to get with Kilo, and uh, could be a big game at some point. Oh, def I mean, uh, you know, I even if uh, Avion is able to uh, kind of fend off the, the wave of the card advantage engines, um, uh, eventually you have to start blocking too. So <laughs> there's, a ch there's a chance that that matters and uh, allows almost to sort of soar over... Uh, 
Champion of Chaos is Inception. Alright, so Soaring Stranger now for almost. <laughs> I gotta say, this is probably the only time today that a Stone Scar player has basically just been loaded up with power and with three Champion of Chaos's, and it has just been like, who cares? <laughs> right, yeah, who cares? <laughs> like, the game is not about that at all. Yeah. Even if you could have played them on time, who cares? Not sure what might be the holdup here. Why would we be holding things back? Oh, I know why. Yeah. Exhausted unit. Yep. Sinister rumors. Yep. So a very careful play by Avion. And I, I think a prudent one because, yeah, a removal on one stranger. Like, the next stranger is going to get the triumphant stranger up to a 4-5. But then if there's two removal, you have the possibility of it being small enough and then it gets sinister rumors. Yeah. It, I mean, if, if the triumphant stranger goes unchecked, Literally does not matter that you gave up three points. It just uh, doesn't. It's not even close. Well, with the soaring stranger, you you, the health totals have to matter some, right? I uh, know you're just gonna uh, uh, the amount of advantage you're gonna accrue just by chilling. Oh is sure so, sure. Yeah, you, you I know. guess I just meant the game could go in a direction where the health totals really do matter here. Uh, yeah, it just seems less likely than incurring any risk on triumphant stranger dying. Like what is the downside I think you're of right. that? I think you're right. It's um, but you always you always want to consider. All the possibilities, of course. So now we've got almost here picking up a Praxis painting, and and I, the, these stranger hits have not been great. No. And now, if Senway Smuggler can get a card, if they have Edict of Makar in their market this weekend, oh my! Yeah, that's gonna be a lot. Woo. Well, and this is like the thing, right? Yeah, it was random that it got literally Shavka Stranger, and Shavka Stranger is so big. But how many times can you let Triumphant Stranger go off in one game before it's like eventually they hit a Stranger that was decent or above? Yeah, Hitting uh, two twos was the bottom end of the range for the first couple, and now they finally hit one good one. What's that expression? Rolling a die is random. Uh, rolling a fistful of dice is not random. Yep. <laughs> Sooner or later, it was going to be a good stranger, and Shavka Stranger sure is. That one gives all strangers the ability, when you play a stranger, deal three damage to an enemy. And when it attacks, you get plus power this turn, equal to the number of units. And the plus power not going to be very much, but each stranger coming in and getting to basically play a torch for free, that, that will be a thing. Yeah. Shavka's Changer certainly does jam out there. We see that uh, that instrument in the art. Now another Champion of Chaos. Great blockers, but man, almost does not need to attack to pull ahead. And now we'll see a Winchest Merchant. I imagine that's going to be getting the freeze out, and that is going to really start to... Uh, Just clamp down the yeah. range of draws. So a familiar recipe for almost is like, let's get ahead with Triumphant Stranger, and then I'm going to get a freeze out, and now you're really going to be feeling the pain. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, I mean, if you block either of the two twos, the Shopka Stranger three damage coming from the Triumphant Stranger playing another one does the deal. Right. Bereave Stranger. You know, I said earlier that the Stranger names do a good job of it. I would not describe almost his state of mind right now as bereaved. No, this is celebratory. Yeah. Sinister Rumors is going to be the pickup here for Avion. Not going to be good enough. And this is starting to feel like one of maybe Avion's last turns of the tournament. We've seen Stone Scar pull through a lot, but going to need to be something pretty special here. Yeah, just the, 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 the relative power of what's going on between these two decks at this point. Are just It's miles apart. It's just not even close. 
Uh, all right, Sinister Rumors. <laughs> Discard all the Searing Strikes from your deck. Got him. I think Avion's having a little fun at this point. Hard to envision this game coming down to a top deck Searing Strike. Yeah. And we'll see Champion of Chaos attack one more time for Avion, maybe. <laughs> one on offense, one on defense. For sure. Yep. Got him. Another Bereaved Stranger is going to throw three at the face. And almost is going to double check, but what are, what's your math telling you there? We, we got a lethal one? It's, it's, so, it's so lethal. Super lethal? It's not even close. All right. Super lethal. Math Super is for blockers. Lethal. <laughs> Super lethal. All right. <laughs> so. It's not even close to close. <laughs> As we all predicted, this tournament was going to come down to Stone Scar versus Strangers. And we got to see it right here. And, um, wow, almost has uh, rolled through this field. <laughs> yeah, and these Stone Scar decks do not seem terribly well equipped to handle this. They're not, they're not particularly fast. Uh, they don't have that much removal for Triumphant Stranger, at least that much reliable removal. And they definitely can't play in the, in the middle of the ring once the Stranger deck is, is doing its thing. So we're going to see one more shot here for, for almost to see if they can win this whole thing with strangers getting another crack at stone scar in the finals. Yeah. And I, I'm going to be really curious to see what Iron Man's been working on because they're basically playing a very close deck and right. you know, it's not, we saw, we saw Avion pick up a game. It's not hopeless. And there are ways that you can try to line up your removal in the right way against Kilo against triumphant stranger and that's going to be the challenge for for Iron Man in our next match because that's our finals. But uh, yeah, we've got a we got a championship match set up here at the Throne Open, and we'll be back in just a few minutes to find out who's going to take it down. Before we go, though, I wanted to give you a chance. Uh, now that you've got me here, you know, as somebody who works on the game and helps make all these cards come to life, is there anything that I can answer, any burning questions about how these cards come to life, where they come from, anything else about the game you might want to know about? Um, so I guess, I, I guess a feature request would be uh, in order, I guess. Uh, the, the challenge mode is a, a little uh, bare bones still, I think. Um, now, I don't know how big of a priority is it for you guys. Being able to challenge in ex a, just the expedition format would be fine. Um, but like things like maybe Popper or Peasant would be would be some some interesting thing as well. So that the random cards that get generated uh, mm. uh, get get generated um, don't get generated outside the format that you're in. Like Speaking Circle, of course, was you know uh, famous for for being being really annoying to play against because you could get uh, you get a wide variety of cards from Throne, whereas uh, you would kind of know uh, about what you'd expect. Uh, in in expedition or something like that and we have for example for peasant tournaments we have to ban uh the the conjurings because of course they get you know ra rares and legendaries right and uh, that's just uh, uh outside of the scope of the format yeah um definitely it's challenge mode is is definitely or um adding to what you can do when you friend challenge somebody is definitely higher up on the list of things that we would like to do and um certainly getting it some of those like getting the random card pool right for the friend challenge um for the like you mentioned the invoke cards the conjurings that's definitely one of those features that we would definitely like to have but it's um you know i this, this is one of those cases where i i'm taking some notes just because uh it's it's helpful to get the perspective of our turn people who are involved in the community tournament organizing scene about what sorts of things would make their life easier. You know, as I always like to say, I'm never going to announce anything new that's coming up, but I could definitely say that uh, those features, some of those features you pointed out are things they're interested in as well. Uh, yeah. Do you have any, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, I mean, a, f a friend of mine, I, I don't really care too, too much, but uh, uh, the, the friend of mine would like the MMR more visible, right? The MMR system <laughs> more visible, I guess, uh, because uh, um, what, what's really annoying about it is that if you're really high up in, in the rank, you don't know how far you are away from the first place ranking. Uh, right uh, or even in between like different levels like you you know you'll, you'll be stuck at rank 10 and so you have no idea why it's like you win 40 games in a row and then you know so all of a sudden you jump up to like rank 
three or something right but you don't really know why why that's happening behind the scenes um that yep i uh, that, i could sympathize with all that we both want to make it so that you know it's uh you feel like when you're playing on ladder like you have the opportunity to move up in ranks but also we if somebody's won a lot yesterday we don't necessarily want to just have their progress go away for nothing and we want you to feel like uh you you playing your games on ladder is going to help you advance if you're trying to get higher up in the ladder the leaderboard and that's something we're always looking at better ways to do and tinker with but um so definitely can appreciate where your friends coming from with that before we go is there any anyone else that you want to make sure you shout out anything else you want to get out there to the people i guess uh you can follow me at uh, twitch.tv slash the overmaster i don't know that's a nothing wrong with a plug <laughs> that's twitch.tv slash the overmaster i occasionally stream i'm sure uh yeah i'm sure many people have caught caught a stream i don't stream very often but uh I intend to do it. I always say that I intend to do it more often than <laughs> it, it doesn't happen quite that uh, that frequently. But yeah, um, well, if you want the Overmaster to stream more Twitch chat, you can uh, make your voices heard right now. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Sean. And uh, we're going to get back to the tournament in just a moment. But want to thank you and wish you luck uh, in the world championships that you'll be competing in, where you'll have a chance to become the world champion of Eternal. That that'd be pretty cool for you, I imagine. And we will we'll be following along and uh, it was great getting to know you and you gave a real great sense of who you are and how you approach the game and i'm sure everyone at home was able to take away a lot in terms of what they can do if they want to be joining you at that world championships so with that we're going to send it back to the booth for the conclusion of the throne open and thanks once again to sean for joining us thank you for having me All right, we're back here. It's time to wrap this tournament up because we got a championship match on our hands. We're going to be checking out Iron Man versus Almost. And, uh, you know, if you're just joining us, uh, we got we got exactly what everyone predicted, We as we've been mentioning, you know, Five Faction Strangers up against Stone Scar. And uh, the Five Faction Stranger deck, you know, people always ask us, like, where's the combo? Like, what does the combo decks look like that you guys are hoping to see in the game? And in the case of this, it's like, this is, you know, it's not really a tribal stranger deck. This is a more of a combo deck built around triumph and stranger. That's yeah. the reality. I mean, yeah, there's a little bit of a sub theme and, and a couple of tutor targets just for, you know, fringe cases that come up. But yeah, largely it's about leveraging um, the market to be able to assemble triumph and stranger pretty quickly or naturally draw it, whatever, or using the farm. There's a, a variety of paths to get there. Um, but once triumph and stranger is, is in play and unchecked, the games have a habit of sort of taking care of themselves. So instead of spending a lot of your equity trying to uh, build up this like synergistic shop of strangers, just let that sort of happen organically uh, off of Triumph and Stranger. Don't be super picky about what you're getting. Just the extra cards and, and presence on the table is going to be enough to carry the day. And it's really mattered what the interaction has looked like. You know, this field was heavy in Stone Scar. And what are the Stone Scar decks playing a lot of removal? Sinister Rumors open contract annihilate and none of those cards consistently kill triumph and stranger yeah uh, i mean annihilate has really stuck out as like wow is that not the card you want um some of the other removal spells even if they're not totally reliable if they they have windows of being good but uh, but annihilate has stuck out like a sore thumb so we'll see what iron man can do um you know once again this is going to be a little bit of a more of a mid-range take on stone scar they've got plenty of great units that can apply pressure it's not like you need that many attacks with champion of chaos the real key is going to be do they have ways to keep that triumphant stranger engine offline long enough in order to get across the finish line because the reality is it's just a matter of time always in these games it feels like if almost doesn't have a triumphant stranger sooner or later they will have one and what are you doing in the interim? It's at most you can really delay that card from sticking. Yeah, and once Triumph and Stranger's going, if it's unchecked, the, really the only things that we've seen as effective there is a combination of flying and overwhelm. There's some spots where you can kind of keep attacking if you have uh, a sufficient saturation of that, but a lot of your units just really, they're, they're just not really even cards anymore. All right, 
Bottom of your screen, Iron Man here in game number one of the finals of the Hour of Glass Throne 5K Open up against almost on the five faction triumphant stranger deck. Iron Man's got a Voprex's choice for turn two queued up, but otherwise, you know, a little bit of easy going here. Not the aggressive take on Stone Scar. Now we'll see Stone Scar Insignia passing, and we're going to get to see probably it matter sort of for the first time in one of our tournament games. Voprex's choice was a fast spell until last week's patch. Now, or sorry, was not a fast spell, now is. And that's going to make a big difference here, is we're going to be able to clean up the smuggler. And consistently, what we've seen almost do is go and get Kilo and sack that smuggler into a learned imitator. This Voprex's choice is going to kind of take that off the line for next turn, ignoring the fact that almost doesn't even have uh, a fourth power queued up. Yeah, an interesting little cat and mouse game there, too, because, you know, Iron Man has, uh, you know, triggered a, a fate or an extra card came from somewhere that's a treasure, and then elected not to play the treasure there on turn number two. So that implies some sort of interaction there. Um, now, it, I, it probably doesn't matter all too much in the scheme of things because almost has so many different merchants here to try to set things up but uh, interesting how much information was revealed to both parties without anyone playing anything all right for almost they picked up a traver's farm but don't have the fourth power they're now going to have to plot things out pretty carefully they could play another merchant or smuggler maybe go and get a token a power from their market or we could see something else but yeah i'm anticipating that token it's been it's probably not a coincidence given the fact that they're a kilo deck and that they're playing with time maximum power units, but it's been consistent that when they have had trouble hitting the fifth faction, it's been fire that's been missing. Yeah. yeah you had to be biased pretty much towards the time cards that are ramping your power first and then your merch is sort of secondarily. Fire is very much there just for Triumphant Stranger, and so that's going to take a backseat to the other considerations. All right, next up we've got Shadow Etchings. Going to go into the market and get an Aramot's Designs. Very interesting. It's going to be able to snatch up a Kilo maybe in the future, but you could see Iron Man has certainly planned things out to some degree because it's not usual you get a card that says kill each unit that costs two or less when there's literal zero of them in play. Yes. <laughs> uh, for almost... They're probably trying to figure out exactly what happened there with that smuggler before they make their play. But this turn seems like it's got a lot of potential to just be a kilo plus sacrifice the flight pass smuggler to get something from the deck. And they can go and get a triumphant stranger now. Thanks to the Blight Pass Smuggler getting reckless, it had two battle skills, so they didn't even need to go through that intermediary step of the learned imitator. Yeah. And now we see the Praxis Stranger um, from Zolta. It's, uh, it's the one that gives, when you play a stranger, it gives the units and weapons in your hand plus one, plus one. The name might come back to me in a moment. <laughs> 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 and then it also has the ability to, uh, to exhaust itself and pay for power to kill a relic. But for now, it looks like it might just be in the business of trading with that Sunway Smuggler. Almost just trying to keep themselves alive. They've got a triumphant stranger rolling now, but they, you know, they still need to actually get the wide army. Just because you get one free stranger doesn't mean you've now suddenly won the game. And uh, Iron Man is continuing to whittle down the health totals. Now going to kill the Kilo with that Sinister Rumors. I think we can see a bar showing up next. And there's just good things happening turn after turn here for Iron Man. Same on the other side for almost. And so not clear who's going to get out of this one. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that all these turns are, are really positive for almost, um, you know, trading off some cards and yeah, Iron Man, you know, killed something and played another good threat, whatever. As long as Triumphant Stranger sticks around, the odds that you either spike something huge and then just kind of win the game from there or just kind of run Iron Man out of resources as they're forced to slog through all of your extra cards and implicit extra resources each turn. Um, is really good. So, yeah, that turn was ostensibly fine for Iron Man, but uh, from Almost's perspective, it's it's really not that rough. 
Yeah, the, the key right now for Iron Man isn't going to be how many big units they have, is how much can they just keep this Champion of Chaos alive. Because that one, by being 5-5 five, five deadly and overwhelm, it just sort of keeps on going turn after turn. And now we're going to see a collapse picked up from almost. So you, 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 you appreciate sort of like how much they just want to deal with key problems. This is not an efficient way to deal with Champion of Chaos, but it's going to get the job done. Right. Almost potentially evaluating, do I want to just block with this deadly unit? I don't have to use the Collapse. You will take a bunch of Overwhelm damage. I kind of want to just block Vara and kill the champion, I think. Keep keep things nice and just, just health total high, board simple. I mean, I, I, Iron Man would have killed Triumphant Stranger last turn if they could, for sure. So you can assume they can't kill it. What should you do if they can't kill it? And it's just keep it, keep the life total high. Just keep trading off cards. Eventually, you know, Iron, Iron Man can only throw these punches for so long. All right, they got back the Champion of Chaos. Now, one thing almost can do here is one of these Shadow Merchants could go into the market maybe and get that last chance and get that Kilo back. That's something to keep in mind. Um, but for right now... Almost isn't the closest to getting a second Triumphant Stranger. And that, that oftentimes has felt like the tipping point in these games. It's you, you sometimes need a bunch of turns with the Triumphant Stranger. But if you get two, it's really hard to undo all that. Right, yeah. The, the odds that something massive gets spiked in that first round. And even if you find a removal spell for one, who really cares? So we will see that last chance. And that'll be probably getting Kilo. I imagine next turn, you're not going to want to expose it until you could use it in the same turn. Mm -hmm. So the next order of business for almost is deciding, is there anything they want to do with the last chance right now? And they're actually going to do this. Um, I'm trying to wonder why. Oh, they are just going to expose it. All right. We'll see how that plays out. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm <laughs> All right. All right. I love a cunning stranger. And so now we've got one that's going to be discarding cards from the deck with each stranger. That's another way to win the game. I mean, I'm guessing the com with the Kilo there, it's a combination of, like, um, your opponent has exploits, so it's not safe to sort of just sit. And also, who cares? We kill your Kilo, so what? <laughs> Well, if they kill the Kilo and they kill the Triumphant Stranger, you're really far away from doing anything. Yeah, but we've established already that Triumphant, if they have an answer for Triumphant Stranger, it's off the top. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Absolutely. But that almost seems like the thing you're playing around to me. But, you know. All right, we see the Empower Stranger now. Plus one, plus one to all your strangers whenever you play a power. You know. Iron Man gained a bunch of health with Vara, so they're not at risk of dying yet, and they're completely out of gas. So all that Iron Man has to do is just kill the Triumphant Stranger, and it, it's kind of, they've got the game back in reach. Yeah, Hardy Stranger ain't the most. Um, Doesn't matter, just, you know. Just out, just out here milling. Tom, is it possible for you to click on the market? Um... For, for Iron Man, I want to see if we could pull that off if we can. Yeah, that'd be great. Look, do they, they are just really empty. Okay, so they could be Dizo's office. W wasn't sure. So it looked, we saw Dizo, Zol, Kroll. They looks like they got Kroll to, uh, to bring back a Champion of Chaos, but very notable. Like a big thing that's been holding back Iron Man this weekend and the Stone Scar decks is like, they literally don't have a cheap card, which some of them anyway, to just kill a Triumphant Stranger. Yeah. Yeah, you would love to have just like uh, one turn, whatever. Edict of Makar does it. Yeah. Edict of Shavka would do it in most spots. Those are combust. There's a good variety of them. It's just if you aren't playing with them, you aren't playing with them. Anyway, um, as to what's literally happening right now, the Akantha Ascending has gotten fully powered up and almost has not found anything that's a way to get Bereave Stranger, a way to get Soaring Stranger. Um, and so... That possibility of just a flyer ending the game is super real right now. Yeah, I mean, th this is sort of like, is there a way to protect myself a little bit from next turn? Uh, if no, what's the best shot of me uh, producing lethal for next turn? 
they're gonna have to throw a ton of stuff in front of this champion of chaos just to survive right because otherwise four is gonna get through and then if three damage from champion of chaos gets through so you have to throw enough is it even possible they just have lethal with an all-out attack i don't think so because you have three you you need three blockers on champion of chaos to survive and you have more than enough to put three in front and then eat up the other two okay so not literally going to be lethal this turn for Iron Man, but they are getting really close to the finish line here just because it, the, the Triumphant Stranger has not delivered in the sense of we haven't gotten lifesteal or double damage or any of these sorts of things. Even that Overwhelm could. would have been a big, a big coup. Yep, with Quick Draw com would combine nicely with that Hair Trigger one. So yeah, we're going to see three Strangers thrown in front. Almost does understand how Deadly works with Overwhelm in the game. And it's going to be a pivotal draw step here coming up for almost. They're going to need something which interacts with that 4-3 flyer. Otherwise, that is going to be game number one. Is the Soaring Stranger still in the deck? But even I imagine I don't so. Think, I, don't think that, I don't think there's lethal coming back. At least, at least it's another turn. The Soaring Stranger? The Soaring Stranger will be good enough, right? For lethal? I will, you're oh, for lose. lethal. Yeah. I just meant to survive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Definitely survive. I was checking to see if lethal was yeah. a possibility. Well, we're also still just close to losing going wide. Jeanette Merchant's not going to do it. You don't got anything to throw back with that. And so Iron Man is going to um, basically have never dealt with the Triumphant Stranger for the entire game and just win anyway. Yeah, flying and overwhelm. I mean, we talked about those are the skills that can still give you some play here. And um uh, might be enough to get across the finish line unless this Triumph and Stranger spikes something big. Oh, that's true. Right. We still have <laughs> – it's not – right. They're not completely out of the woods. But I think it's just Soaring Stranger. I don't know of another one that would do it here. The the nine-coster, the one that – The Shavka Stranger? Yeah. Now that would too. You're right. Yeah, there's – I mean, yeah. Uh, Linrai Stranger. All right. In summation, I forgot what a bunch of the good strangers do. But, yeah, they got a couple outs here. So let's see if they can hit one. I do like this attack. You are trying to get the game over with. It's not likely. Oh, I don't. I don't like. Oh, uh, if you're going to play the Geneva. I, was gonna say, yeah. I don't like that attack if you're not. Because then now you can't even spike the flyer. Mm, ruthless stranger. Assuming we have enough cards. Yeah. There's Tazbu. But mm. the Akanta Ascending is going to just do it. And... So Iron Man uh, did what we haven't really seen much of today, which is how many turns was that? Around five or six of unchecked Triumphant Stranger action. Right, and uh, you know th there weren't any huge spikes there, but um, uh, even still, that's like a very hard spot to get out of. We have not seen Stone Star players be able to do it successfully over the course of the of the tournament. Um, but again, flying in overwhelm, uh, Champion of Chaos, and uh, still being able to apply a lot of pressure even with the card advantage engine rolling. Um, and, and to Albus's credit, to go back to, uh, you know, turns earlier of like what kind of premium were they putting on just trading off and keeping their life total high? It's like, you know, uh, some of those trades weren't maybe the best on the table or whatever or how you would want to draw up in theory, but like it, you just have to keep your, your life total as high as possible because, um, you know, you have to be able to absorb those shots from flying units or overwhelm units that you can't necessarily handle in a clean way and actually kind of came up there at the end. All right. It's going to be checking out game number two here. Almost will be on the play in game number two. Don't imagine this is a key for almost. A lot of redraws with this deck. This one is decent in some respects, but we are pretty shy on the influence department. We have not seen almost be gun shy about going down to six when the when the moment calls for it. This is very close. Um, you do have sort of a great start with logistics expert into maybe Travers Farm, and this is a tough one. As a lot of things to like about it, but let me tell you some things I don't like about it. With diplomatic seal and common cause, we can probably set up any two influence, but we don't have dual power that's giving us two influence and when you're trying to get up to five that's what you need yeah i mean well that that should have merchant there is a pretty significant drop it is yeah that's that's actually like the the problem was that the you had a felon smuggler alongside your your time cards how do you actually make this work and now you just get off the hook get that token of purpose throw away that searing strike 
And next up for Iron Man, they've got an exploit potentially queued up for this turn. I'm a little surprised we didn't see the Voprex's choice this turn, but I think it I think it all works out either way. Just it's always fun all the different choices you have um, when you're playing these Stone Scar decks for how you want to do you want to try to interact with our board first, their hand first. It's going to change game to game, matchup to matchup. Yeah, I think um, my instinct there is probably to exploit. I think. The Voprex's choice, it's worth noting, just kind of gets worse over time. Yeah, definitely. They just get more options for what they want to sacrifice to it. It is also true of the exploit, though. Maybe. If it's something cheap, yes, but if it's something expensive, you're giving them more time to draw it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, if this turn they drew Triumphant Stranger, now you've given them one more turn to. Sometimes what you do with a card like Exploit is you wait till one turn before the card's cost, then you fire it off maximum amount of time to find it. I don't know if Triumphant Stranger is the the major thing to uh, to worry about in that spot just because of the pip distribution. Sure. Almost is off by so much. Like, what's their hand? Oh, yeah. And <laughs> this this is a real, like, let's cheat Triumphant Stranger game. Um, the, the influence has just been, like, a mess. And the fact that, like, almost has sort of been able to basically play cards with their power each turn. This is the first time we're not going to. But up in, even doing it up until now was a real uh, victory for them in terms of getting to the board first because it didn't seem like they were going to have much success at all in that department. Right. But for now, for almost, they're going to sort of be a justice influence away from use, playing Kilo, using it, sacking a merchant, getting learned imitator, getting triumphant stranger. Most, some of the time this deck is just like reunite or traverse farm for triumphant stranger and have five factions of influence. But the whole, like, Kilo learned imitator game plan is a real bit of intricate deck building that has really worked out nicely this weekend. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely been the, the core thing going on here. All right, so Voprex's choice is going to get rid of the initiative of the Sands. And now for Iron Man, Vara is going to really stabilize the board against these anemic beatdowns. And so... We're, the game's going to shift now. We didn't get justice, so we're going to have to pass it back. Bar is going to trade with Corendon Merchant. And Iron Man's a little bit tied up on power, to be clear. But we might see Var number two. This is tough for almost. The thing that's m giving them pause here, the thing that's making them really nervous is if they trade off this Karenin Merchant and then lose the Jeanette Merchant, the Kilo's offline. Right, exactly. You've got to give yourself at least a, uh, a, a shot at it here. You know, another Robrex's choice or just really any removal spell at all. Now you've got nothing. You could play the Shadow Sigil and amplify the Logistics Expert. One thing that's rough for almost is, like, their common causes is one of the ways they have flexibility in getting the right influence. That's super shut off with, like, basically no units in hand. Right. It, yeah, it's, you're not even drawing too that much. Not, there's not even that much power that does it. Yeah, we're going to need something fortunate here for almost Sinister Rumors bringing it back. And Ooh. there's Justice Influence. Combray Painting going to get that Kilo into play. We are going off here now. Let's get that Genev Merchant sacrificed. Let's find a Learned Imitator. It costs one more. Now, it's going to turn transform itself into a five-cost unit in the deck and set itself down to zero. Whew. All right. The first one was a Hurst Trap. <laughs> not, not ideal, but, you know. And we're going to prioritize getting this Champion of Chaos off the board. Yeah, you want to address the Overwhelm unit because you can start just locking up the ground kind of arbitrarily against non-Overwhelm, non-Flying units. So. Not the that, that block doesn't look great, but I think it's putting uh, an emphasis on the right spot. Yep. And now power number five is big because it gets us one closer to that Pale Rider's timepiece, which will be huge. We didn't draw anything to use the Kilo with here. I, I don't. We're not sacrificing Triumphant Stranger, right? We got Ruthless Stranger. Okay. That's another Chumper. We're not. Oh, this, is, this is a very challenging moment now because now the Pale Rider's timepiece is coming next turn. Tazbu is going to be coming down. We're going to see a chump here, and then there is going to be so much pressure on almost his next turn in their draw. An Argent Port banner. It's all going to come down to what does Triumphant Stranger deliver? 
Can it give them the goods to stay in this game for one more turn? It's going to need to be a real big one, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't, can't recite the entire Stranger list, but. Bereaved Stranger, it was so good for almost every turn in this entire tournament. Every time they got Bereaved Stranger, it was so often the thing that pulled it back in. But not this time, as Pale Rider's timepiece is going on Tazbu, and Iron Man has done it, knocking down almost, defeating the Strangers, and winning the throne open, and advancing to the World Championships this year. I mean, a really impressive match victory there for Iron Man. You can't overstate how strong that Stranger deck looked all tournament long. We saw it just thrash Stonescar decks whenever we saw, got it in action. But Iron Man got it done. Yeah, and I, I think there's so much heads-up play there. I mean, just leaving up Oprex's choice instead of playing the treasure there to, to set the engine back a couple turns. Because if you're able to actually answer this, the, the first merchant, it's like several now turns removed for them to be able to set up the initial wave. Uh, putting a ton of emphasis on flying and overwhelm in those games, which were, to the you know, those are the two biggest holes what it looked like from the stranger deck once triumphant stranger is, is in play like where do they have exposure um just really uh had the right removal spells very sharp play prioritized the right stuff and congratulations we have another player locked in for our world championships later on and that is iron man and for almost obviously uh, a big congratulations and condolences on an amazing run this weekend with a really cool take on the stranger deck and you know for them they did pick up a top four finish one more of those this year um assuming they don't already have one we don't have all the results in front of us does mean they will be in the world championships as well um for now though that is going to do it for this weekend's event our next open will be an expedition open next month and we'll be excited to check back in and we'll see what other updates might be in store before that event over the next couple of weeks for that format um but it's going to be a fun chance to sort of check back in as we're getting sort definitely towards the tail end of the revelations set cycle um and we'll be seeing sort of this will be our last sort of chance to do have a major tournament with that expedition format and seeing sort of how it's evolved since the last time we checked in on it a month or so ago yeah and a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity for players to be diving into the format in between now and then if there's still a lot to be uh scratch underneath the surface so we'll be checking back into that in just a couple of weeks and um you know i'm excited for that one as well and as far as what we got to see from sort of the new, thro new throne format after one of our biggest balance patches of all time, um, certainly Stone Scar looks like it's going to be a major contender um, in a variety of forms, whether it's aggro and mid range. But we saw a lot, a lot of close games, a lot of spots where we saw some cards line up well against it. So we'll see sort of where the meta goes, and you know what, what, what how the format will go next. Obviously, the Stranger deck looks like it's something players are going to have to start taking in mind. You and I, you know, we're not going to give anything away. We were discussing some of the cards we think might line up well against that, and we'll be excited to see uh, how players can figure out how to battle back against that sort of a combo deck. But certainly, a uh, uh, plenty to dive into. Yeah, no, I mean there's. Uh... The terms of engagement are clearly very different. And now uh, we've had a, a tournament for very high stakes. Players have gotten to watch the tournament. They're going to get to see these deck lists populated. And that's that's like step one. Now, knowing what you know now, would you play different removal spells? Would you play different threats? Would you play an entirely different deck? Um, it, we're we're going to be paying attention to that evolution over the next couple weeks and months. All right. So we'll be around. And uh, if you missed it, you could, we had a fun Q&A the other day. Um, should be up on our social media channels. I know we've got that uh, VOD from that stream up on YouTube where we took mm -hmm. questions about the most recent balance patch, about things going on in the game. Uh, he and I are going to be out there a little bit more mixing it up, uh, doing more things out in the community. So it's going to be a fun uh, next couple months for Eternal. we got some fun stuff in the works. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate we don't get to spend more time out there in the community interacting because we do actually have to do our day jobs of making cards and coming up with more cool ideas for the game. But well, that's what's great about these tournaments. I was able to hop on a Discord, run my mouth about how I've just been detonating people in draft, letting people know that we're going to go live in an hour, and then you know, so yeah, you, it, that's uh, it, it's good to fill out the Sundays a little bit that way. All right, so thanks to uh, our producer Tom for joining us, Patrick for once again being a great partner in the booth, all of our competitors for joining us this weekend, whether you played in the qualifying rounds, made it to the top 64, uh, this tournament wouldn't be possible without you, and congratulations once again to Iron Man for getting it done and advancing to the World Championships, and that'll be fun to see how they follow up this great performance. But that's going to do it for this weekend here at Direwolf Digital. 
and we'll be seeing you in the queues real soon. Uh, thanks again for watching and joining us and for making this another great weekend of eternal action.